This is Audible. Brilliance Audio presents From Blood and Ash by Jennifer L. Armentrout. Performed by Stina Nielsen. Chapter 1 They found Finley this eve, just outside the blood forest, dead. I looked up from my cards and across the crimson-painted surface to the three men sitting at the table. I'd chosen this spot for a reason. I'd felt nothing from them as I drifted between the crowded tables earlier. No pain, physical or emotional. Normally I didn't prod to see if someone was in pain. Doing so without reason felt incredibly invasive. But in crowds, it was difficult to control just how much I allowed myself to feel. There was always someone whose pain cut so deeply, was so raw, that their anguish became a palpable entity I didn't even have to open my senses to feel. That I couldn't ignore and walk away from. They projected their agony onto the world around them. I was forbidden to do anything but ignore. To never speak of the gift bestowed upon me by the gods, and to never, ever go beyond sensing to actually doing something about it. Not that I always did what I was supposed to do. Obviously. But these men were fine when I reached out with my senses to avoid those in great pain. Which was surprising given what they did for a living. They were guards from the rise, the mountainous wall constructed from the limestone and iron mined from the Elysium peaks. Ever since the War of Two Kings ended four centuries ago, the rise had enclosed all of Macedonia, and every city in the kingdom of Solus was protected by a rise. Smaller versions surrounded villages and training posts, the farming communities, and other sparsely populated towns. What the guards saw on a regular basis, what they had to do, often left them in anguish. Rather it be from injuries or from what went deeper than torn skin and bruised bones. Tonight, they weren't just absent of anguish, but also their armor and uniforms. Instead, they donned loose shirts and buckskin breeches. Still, I knew, even off-duty, they were watchful for signs of the dreaded mist and the horror that came with it, and for those who worked against the future of the kingdom. They were still armed to the teeth, as was I. Hidden beneath the folds of the cloak and the thin gown I wore underneath, the cool hilt of a dagger that never quite warmed to my skin was sheathed against my thigh. Gifted to me on my 16th birthday, it wasn't the only weapon I'd acquired, or the deadliest, but it was my favorite. The handle was fashioned from the bones of a long-extinct wolven, a creature that had been neither man nor beast, but both. And the blade made of bloodstone honed to a fatal sharpness. I may yet again be in the process of doing something incredibly reckless, inappropriate, and wholly forbidden. But I wasn't foolish enough to enter a place like the Red Pearl without protection, the skill to employ it, and the wherewithal to take that weapon and skill and use them without hesitation. Dead, another guard said, a younger one, with brown hair and a soft face. I thought his name might be Eric and he couldn't be much older than my 18 years. He wasn't just dead. Finley was drained of blood, his flesh chewed up like wild dogs had to go at him, and then torn to pieces. My cards blurred as tiny balls of ice formed in the pit of my stomach. Wild dogs didn't do that. Not to mention, there weren't any wild dogs near the blood forest, the only place in the world where the trees bled staining the bark and the leaves a deep crimson. There were rumors of other animals, overly large rodents and scavengers that preyed upon the corpses of those who lingered too long in the forests. And you know what that means? Eric went on. They must be near. An attack will- Not sure this is the right conversation to be having. An older guard cut in. I knew of him. Phillips Rothy. He'd been on the rise for years, which was nearly unheard of. 
Guards didn't have long lifespans. He nodded in my direction. You're in the presence of a lady. A lady? Only the ascended were called ladies. But I also wasn't someone anyone, especially those in this building, would expect to be inside the Red Pearl. If I was discovered, I would be in, well, more trouble than I'd ever been in before, and would face severe reprimand. The kind of punishment that Dorian Tierman, the Duke of Macedonia, would just love to deliver. And which, of course, his close confidant, Lord Brandol Mazine, would love to be in attendance for. Anxiety surfaced as I looked at the dark-skinned guard. There was no way Phillips could know who I was. The top half of my face was covered by the white domino mask I'd found discarded in the Queen's Gardens ages ago. And I wore a plain robin's egg blue cloak I'd, uh, borrowed from Britta, one of the many castle servants who I'd overheard speaking about the Red Pearl. Hopefully Britta wouldn't discover her missing overcoat before I returned it in the morn. Even without the mask, though, I could count on one hand how many people in Macedonia had seen my face, and none of them would be here tonight. As the maiden, the chosen, a veil usually covered my face and hair at all times, all except for my lips and jaw. I doubted Phillips could recognize me solely on those features, and if he had, none of them would still be sitting here. I would be in the process of being dragged back, albeit gently, to my guardians, the Duke and Duchess of Macedonia. There was no reason to panic. Forcing the muscles along my shoulders and neck to ease, I smiled. I'm no lady. You're more than welcome to talk about whatever you wish. Be that as it may, a little less morbid topic would be welcomed, Phillips replied, sending a pointed look in the direction of the other two guards. Eric lifted his gaze to mine. My apologies. Apologies not needed, but accepted. The third guard ducked his chin, studiously staring at his cards as he repeated the same. His cheeks had pinkened, something I found rather adorable. The guards who worked at the Rise went through vicious training, becoming skilled in all manner of weaponry and hand-to-hand -hand combat. None who survived their first venture outside the Rise came back without shedding blood and seeing death. And yet, this man blushed. I cleared my throat, wanting to ask more about who Finley was, whether he was a guard from the Rise or a huntsman a division of the army that ferried communication between the cities and escorted travelers and goods. They spent half the year outside the protection of the Rise. It was by far one of the most dangerous of all occupations, so they never traveled alone. Some never returned. Unfortunately, a few who did, didn't come back the same. They returned with rampantly spreading death snapping at their heels. Cursed. Sensing that Phillips would silence any further conversation, I didn't voice any of the questions dancing on the tip of my tongue. If others had been with him and had been wounded by what most likely had killed Finley, I would find out one way or another. I just hoped it wasn't through screams of terror. The people of Macedonia had no real idea exactly how many returned from outside the Rise, cursed. They only saw a handful here and there, and not the reality. If they did, panic and fear were sure to ignite a populace who truly had no concept of the horror outside the Rise. Not like my brother Ian and I did. Which was why, when the topic at the table switched to more mundane things, I struggled to will the ice coating my insides, to thaw. Countless lives were given and taken by the endeavor to keep those inside the rise safe. But it was failing, had been failing, not just here, but throughout the kingdom of Solus. Death. Death always found a way in. Stop, I ordered myself 
as the general sense of unease threatened to swell. Tonight wasn't about all the things I was aware of that I probably shouldn't be. Tonight was about living, about not being up all night, unable to sleep, alone, and feeling like, like I had no control, no, no idea of who I was other than what I was. Another poor hand was dealt, and I'd played enough cards with Ian to know there was no recovering from the ones I held. When I announced that I was out, the guards nodded as I rose, each bidding me a good evening. Moving between the tables, I took the flute of champagne offered by a server with a gloved hand and tried to recapture the feelings of excitement that had buzzed through my veins as I'd hurried through the streets earlier that evening. I minded my business as I scanned the room, keeping my senses to myself. Even outside of those who managed to project their anguish into the air around them, I didn't need to touch someone to know if they were hurting. I just needed to see someone and focus. What they looked like didn't change if they were experiencing some sort of pain, and their appearance didn't change when I concentrated on them. I simply felt their anguish. Physical pain was almost always hot, but the kind that couldn't be seen, it was almost always cold. Body shouts and whistles snapped me out of my own mind. A woman in red sat on the edge of the table next to the one I'd left. She wore a gown made of scraps of red satin and gauze that barely covered her thighs. One of the men grabbed a fistful of the diaphanous little skirt. Smacking his hand away with a saucy grin, she lay back, her body forming a sensual curve. Her thick, blonde curls spilled across forgotten coins and chips. Who wants to win me tonight? Her voice was deep and smoky as she slid her hands along the waist of the frilly corset. I can assure you boys I will last longer than any pot of gold will. And what if it's a tie? One of the men asked, the fine cut of his coat suggesting he was a well-to-do merchant or businessman of some sort. Then it will be a far more entertaining night for me, she said, drawing one hand down her stomach, slipping even lower to between her cheeks heating. I quickly looked away as I took a sip of the bubbly champagne. My gaze found its way to the dazzling glow of a rose gold chandelier. The red pearl must be doing well, and the owners well connected. Electricity was expensive and heavily controlled by the royal court. It made me wonder who some of their clientele was for the luxury to be available. Under the chandelier, another card game was in progress. There were women there, too. Their hair twisted in elaborate updos adorned with crystals, and their clothing far less daring than the women who worked here. Their gowns were vibrant shades of purple and yellow, and pastel hues of blue and lilac. I was only allowed to wear white, whether I was in my room or in public, which wasn't often. So I was fascinated with how the different colors complemented the wearer's skin or hair. I imagined I looked like a ghost most days, roaming the halls of Castle Tierman in white. These women also wore domino masks that covered half their faces, protecting their identities. I wondered who some of them were. Daring wives left alone one too many times? Young women who hadn't married, or were perhaps widowed? Servants or women who worked in the city out for the evening? Were ladies and lords in wait among the masked females at the table and among the crowd? Did they come here for the same reasons I did? Boredom? Curiosity? Loneliness? If so, then we were more alike than I realized, even though they were second daughters and sons given to the royal court upon their thirteenth birthday during the annual rite. And I? I was Penelope of Castle Tierman, kin of the Balfour, and the queen's favorite. I was the maiden. Chosen. 
and in a little under a year, upon my nineteenth birthday, I would ascend, as would all ladies and lords in wait. Our ascensions would be different, but it would be the largest one since the first God's blessing that occurred after the end of the War of Two Kings. Very little would happen to them if they were caught. But I? I would face the Duke's displeasure. My lips thinned as a kernel of anger took root, mingling with a sticky residue of disgust and shame. The Duke was a pestilence of overly familiar hands and had an unnatural thirst for punishment. But I wouldn't think about him either, or worry about being disciplined. I might as well go back to my chambers if I was going to do that. Dragging my gaze from the table, I noted that there were smiling and laughing women in the Pearl who wore no masks, hid no identities. They sat at tables with guards and businessmen, stood in shadowy alcoves, and spoke with masked women, men, and also those who worked for the Red Pearl. They weren't ashamed or afraid to be seen. Whoever they were, they had freedom I deeply coveted. An independence I chased tonight, because masked and unknown, no one but the gods would know I was here. And as far as the gods were concerned, I had long ago decided they had far better things to do than spend their time watching me. After all, if they had been paying attention, they would have already taken me to task over numerous things I'd already done that were forbidden to me. So, I could be anyone tonight. The freedom in that was a far headier sensation than I imagined, even more so than the unripe poppy seeds provided by those who smoked them. Tonight, I wasn't the maiden. I wasn't Penelope. I was simply Poppy, a nickname I remembered my mother using, something only my brother Ian and very few others ever called me. As Poppy, there were no strict rules to follow or expectations to fulfill, no future ascension that was coming quicker than I was prepared for. There was no fear, no past or future. Tonight, I could live a little, even for a few hours, and rack up as much experience as I could before I was returned to the capital, to the queen, before I was given to the gods. A shiver tiptoed down my spine, uncertainty along with a bite of desolation. I tamped it down, refusing to give life to it. Dwelling on what was to come and could not be changed served no purpose. Besides, Ian had ascended two years ago, and based on the monthly letters I received from him, he was the same. The only difference was that instead of spinning tales with his voice, he did so with words in each letter. Just last month, he wrote about two children, a brother and a sister who swam to the bottom of the Stroud Sea, befriending the water folk. I smiled as I lifted the champagne flute, having no idea where he came up with those things. As far as I knew, it was impossible to swim to the bottom of the Stroud Sea, and there was no such thing as water folk. Shortly after his ascension, on the orders of the queen and king, he'd married Lady Claudia. Ian never spoke of his wife. Was he happy at all in his marriage? The curve of my lips faded as my gaze dropped to the fizzing pinkish drink. I wasn't sure. But they'd barely known each other before marrying. How was that long enough when you'd presumably spend the rest of your life with a person? And the Ascended lived for a very, very long time. It was still odd for me to think of Ian as an Ascended. He wasn't a second son. But because I was the maiden, the queen had petitioned the gods for a rare exception to the natural order, and they had allowed him to ascend. I wouldn't face what Ian had. Marriage to a stranger, to another ascended, to one who was sure to covet beauty above all else, because attractiveness was seen as godlike. And even though I was the maiden, the chosen, I would never be viewed as godlike. According to the duke, I wasn't beautiful. I was a tragedy. Without realizing it, my fingers brushed the scratchy lace of the left side of the mask, 
I jerked my hand away. A man I recognized as a guard rose from a table, turning to a woman wearing a white mask like I was. He extended a hand to her, speaking words too low for me to hear, but she answered with a nod and a smile before placing her hand in his. She rose, the skirt of her lilac-hued gown falling like liquid around her legs as he led her from the room toward the only two doors accessible by guests, one at either end of interconnecting chambers. The right went outside. The left door led upstairs to more private rooms, where Britta had said all manner of things occurred. The guard took the masked woman to the left. He'd asked, she'd said yes. Whatever it was they did upstairs, it would be welcomed and chosen by both, regardless of whether it lasted a few hours or a lifetime. My attention lingered on the door long after it had closed. Was that another reason I had come here tonight? To, to experience pleasure with someone of my choosing? I could if I wanted to. I'd overheard conversations between the ladies in wait who weren't expected to remain untouched. According to them, there were many things a woman could do that brought pleasure while retaining their purity. Purity? I hated that word. The meaning behind it. As if my virginity determined my goodness, my innocence, and its presence or lack thereof was somehow more important than the hundred choices I made every day. There was even a part of me that wondered what the gods would do if I went to them no longer an actual maiden. Would they overlook everything else I did or didn't do simply because I was no longer a virgin? I wasn't sure, but I hoped that wasn't the case. Not because I planned to have sex now or next week or ever, but because I wanted to be able to make that choice though I wasn't quite sure how I'd find myself in a situation where that option would even arise. But I imagine there'd be willing participants who'd want to do the things I'd heard the ladies in wait speaking about here at the Red Pearl. A nervous flutter beat in my chest as I forced myself to take another sip of the champagne. The sweet bubbles tickled the back of my throat, easing some of the sudden dryness in my mouth. Truth be told, Tonight had been a spur-of-the-moment decision. Most nights, I couldn't fall asleep until it was nearly dawn. When I did, I almost wished I hadn't. Three times this week alone, I woke from a nightmare with my screams ringing in my ears. And when they came like this, in clusters, they felt like a harbinger. An instinct, much like the ability to sense pain, screaming out a warning. Drawing in a shallow breath, I glanced back to where I'd been looking before. The woman in red was no longer on the table. Instead, she was in the lap of the merchant who'd asked what would happen if two men won. He was inspecting his cards, but his hand was where hers had been heading earlier, delved deep between her thighs. Oh, my. Biting down on my lip, I pulled away from where I stood before my entire face caught on fire. I drifted into the next space that was separated by a partial wall, where another round of games was being played. There were more guards here, some I even recognized as belonging to the Royal Guard, soldiers just like those who worked the rise, but who protected the Ascended instead. This was why the Ascended also had personal guards. People had tried to kidnap members of the court before for ransom. No one was usually hurt too seriously in those situations, but there had been other attempts that stemmed from far different, more violent reasons. Standing near a leafy potted plant that sported tiny red buds, I was unsure of what to do from there. I could join another card game or strike up a conversation with any of the numerous people who lingered around the tables. But I wasn't all that good at making small talk with strangers. And there was no doubt in my mind 
that I'd blurt out something bizarre or ask a random question that would make little sense to the conversation. So that was off the table. Maybe I should head back to my chambers. The hour had to be growing late, and a strange awareness swept over me, starting as a tingling sensation along the back of my neck and intensifying with every passing second. It felt like, like I was being watched. Scanning the room, I didn't see anyone paying much attention to me, but I expected to find someone standing near. That was how potent the feeling was. Unease blossomed in the pit of my stomach. I started to turn toward the entrance when the soft, drawn-out notes of some sort of string instrument drew my attention to the left, my gaze landing on the gauzy, blood-red curtains that swayed gently from the movement of others in the establishment. I stilled listening to the rise and fall of the tempo that was soon joined by the heavy thump of a drum. I forgot about the feeling of being watched. I forgot about a lot of things. The music was, it was like nothing I'd heard before. It was deeper, thicker, slowing, and then speeding up. It was sensual. What had Britta, the servant, said about the kind of dancing that took place at the Red Pearl? She'd lowered her voice when she spoke of it, and the other maid Britta had been speaking to had looked scandalized. Making my way along the outskirts of the room, I neared the curtains, reaching out to pat them. I don't think you want to go in there. Startled, I turned at the sound of the voice. A woman stood behind me, one of the ladies who worked for the Red Pearl. I recognized her, not because she'd been on the arm of a merchant or businessman when I first came in, but because she was utterly beautiful. Her hair was a deep black, thickly curled, and her skin was a deep, rich brown. The red gown she wore was sleeveless, cut low across her chest, and the fabric clung to her body like liquid. I'm sorry, I said, unsure what else to say as I lowered my hand. Why wouldn't I? They're just dancing. Just dancing? Her gaze drifted over my shoulder to the curtain. Some say that to dance is to make love. I, I hadn't heard that. Slowly, I looked behind me. Through the curtains, I could make out the shapes of bodies churning in time with the music, their movements full of mesmerizing and fluid grace. Some danced alone, their curves and forms clearly outlined. While others, I sucked in a sharp breath, my eyes swinging back to the woman before me. Her red-painted lips curved into a smile. This is your first time here, isn't it? I opened my mouth to deny that statement, but could feel the heat spreading across every visible part of my body. That alone was telling. Is it that obvious? She laughed, and the sound was throaty. Not to most, but to me, yes. I've never seen you here before. How would you know if you had? I touched my mask, just to make sure it hadn't slipped. Your mask is fine. There was a strange knowing glint to her eyes, which were a mix of gold and brown, not exactly hazel. The gold was far too bright and warm for that. They reminded me of another who had eyes the color of deep citrine. I know a face, whether it's half hidden or not, and yours is one I haven't seen here before. This is your first time. Truly, I had no idea how to respond to that. And it's the Red Pearl's first time also. She leaned in, her voice lowering, as we've never had the maiden walk through the doors. A wave of shock rolled through me as my grip tightened on the slippery champagne glass. I don't know what you mean. I'm a second daughter. You're like a second daughter but not in the way you intend.
she cut in, lightly touching my cloaked arm. It's okay. There's nothing to fear. Your secret is safe with me. I stared at her for what felt like an entire minute before I recovered the use of my tongue. If that were true, why would that kind of secret be safe? Why would it not be? She returned. What would I have to gain by telling anyone? You'd earn the favor of the Duke and Duchess? My heart thumped. Her smile faded as her stare hardened. I have no need of a favor from an ascended. The way she said that, it was as if I'd suggested that she was courting favor with a pile of mud. I almost believed her, but no one who lived within the kingdom would waste the chance to earn an ascended's esteem unless they, unless they didn't recognize Queen Ileana and King Jalara as the true rightful rulers unless they supported he who called himself Prince Castile, the true heir to the kingdom. Except he was no prince or heir. He was nothing more than a remnant of Atlantia, the corrupt and twisted kingdom that had fallen at the end of the War of Two Kings, a monster who had wreaked havoc and caused bloodshed and the embodiment of pure evil. He was the Dark One. And yet, there were those who supported him and his claim. Dissenters, who had been part of riots and the disappearances of many ascended. In the past, the dissenters only caused discord through small rallies and protests. And even then, they had been few and far between due to the punishment that was meted out to those who were suspected to be dissenters. The trials couldn't even be called that. No second chances, no long-term imprisonment. Death was swift and final. But things had changed of late. Many believed the dissenters had been responsible for the mysterious deaths of high-ranking royal guards. Several in Carcedonia, the capital, had inexplicably fallen from the rise. Two had been killed with arrows through the back of their heads in Pensdurth, a smaller city on the coast of the Stroud Sea near the capital. Others had simply vanished while in the smaller villages, never to be seen or heard from again. Only a few months ago, a violent uprising had ended in bloodshed in Three Rivers, a teeming trade city beyond the Blood Forest. Goldcrest Manor, the royal seat in Three Rivers, had been burned, razed to the ground, along with the temples. Duke Everton had died in the fire, along with many servants and guards. It was only by some miracle that the Duchess of Three Rivers had escaped. The dissenters weren't just Atlanteans who were hidden among the people of Solus. Some of the Dark One's followers didn't even have a drop of Atlantean blood in them. My gaze sharpened and zeroed in on the beautiful woman. Could she be a dissenter? I couldn't fathom how anyone could support the fallen kingdom, no matter how hard their lives were or how unhappy they may be. Not when the Atlanteans and the Dark One were responsible for the mist, for what festered inside of it, for what most likely had ended Finley's life had taken countless more lives, including my mother's and father's, and had left my body riddled with the reminder of the horror that thrived inside the mist. Pushing aside my suspicions for the moment, I opened myself up to sense if there were some great pain inside her, something that went beyond the physical and stemmed from either grief or bitterness the kind of pain that made people do horrible things to try and alleviate the anguish. There was no hint of that radiating from her. But that didn't mean she wasn't a dissenter. The woman's head tilted. As I said, you have nothing to worry about when it comes to me. Him? That's another story. Him? I repeated. She moved to the side as the main door opened, and a sudden gust of cool air announced the arrival of more patrons. A man walked in, and behind him was an older gentleman with sandy blonde hair and a weathered face, colored by the sun.
My eyes widened as disbelief thundered through me. It was Victor Wardwell. What was he doing at the Red Pearl? An image of the woman with the short gowns and partially exposed breasts came to mind, and I thought about why I was here. My eyes widened. Oh, gods. I didn't want to think about the purpose for his visit any longer. Victor was a seasoned member of the Royal Guard, a man well into his fourth decade of life. But he was more than that to me. The dagger strapped to my thigh had been a gift from him. And it was he who broke with custom and made sure I not only knew how to use it, but also how to wield a sword, strike a target unseen with an arrow, and, even when weaponless, how to take down a man twice my size. Victor was like a father to me. He was also my personal guard, and had been since I'd first arrived in Macedonia. He wasn't my only guard, though. He shared duties with Rylan Keel, who'd replaced Hannes after he'd passed in his sleep a little less than a year ago. It had been an unexpected loss as Hannes had been in his early thirties and in prime health. The healers believed it to have been some unknown ailment of the heart. Still, it was hard to imagine how one could go to sleep healthy and whole and never wake up again. Rylan didn't know I was as well-trained as I was, but he knew I could handle a dagger. He wasn't aware of where Victor and I all too often disappeared to outside of the castle. He was kind and often relaxed, but we weren't nearly as close as Victor and I were. If it had been Rylan here, I could have easily slipped away. Damn it, I swore, turning sideways as I reached back and pulled the hood of my cloak up over my head. My hair was a rather noticeable shade of burnt copper, but even with it hidden now and my entire face obscured, Victor would recognize me. He had a sixth sense that only belonged to parents and made itself known when their child was up to no good. Glancing back toward the entrance, my stomach dropped as I saw him sit at one of the tables facing the door, the only exit. The gods hated me. Truly, they did, because there was no doubt in my mind that Victor would see me. He wouldn't report me, but I'd rather crawl into a hole full of roaches and spiders than attempt to explain to him, of all people, why I was at the Red Pearl. And there would be lectures, not the speeches and punishments the Duke loved to deliver, but the kind that crawled under your skin and made you feel terrible for days mainly because you had been caught doing something you deserved reprimand for. And frankly, I didn't want to see Victor's face when he discovered that I realized he was here. I stole another peek and, oh gods, a woman knelt beside him, a hand on his leg. I needed to scrub my eyes. That's Soraya, the woman explained. As soon as he arrives, she's at his side. I do believe she carries a torch for him. Slowly, I looked at the woman beside me. He comes here often? One side of her lips curved up. Often enough to know what happens beyond the red curtain, and that's enough. I cut her off. I now needed to scrub my brain. I don't need to hear any more. Her laugh was soft. You have the look of one who is in need of a hiding place. And yes, in the red pearl, that is an easily recognizable look. She deftly took my champagne glass. Upstairs, there are currently unoccupied rooms. Try the sixth door on the left. You will find sanctuary there. I'll come up for you when it's safe. Suspicion rose as I met her gaze but I let her take my arm and lead me toward the left. Why would you help me? She opened the door. Because everyone should be able to live a little, even for a few hours. My mouth dropped open as she parroted what I'd thought to myself minutes ago. Stunned, I stood there. Giving me a wink, she closed the door. Her figuring out who I was couldn't be a coincidence. 
repeating back to me what I'd been thinking earlier? There was no way. A rough laugh escaped my lips. The woman may be a dissenter, or at the very least, she wasn't a fan of the ascended. But she might also be a seer. I didn't think there were any of them left. And I still couldn't believe that Victor was here. That he came here often enough that one of the ladies in red liked him. I wasn't sure why I was so surprised. It wasn't like royal guards were forbidden from seeking pleasure or even marrying. Many were quite promiscuous, since their lives were rife with danger and often far too short. It was just that Victor had a wife who'd passed long before I even met him, dying in childbirth along with the babe. He still loved his Camellia as much as he had when she'd lived and breathed. But what could be found here had nothing to do with love, did it? And everyone got lonely no matter if their heart belonged to somebody they could no longer have or not. A little saddened by that, I turned around in the narrow stairwell lit by oil wall sconces. I exhaled heavily. What have I gotten myself into? Only the gods knew, and there was no turning back now. I slipped my hand inside the cloak keeping it close to the hilt of the dagger as I climbed the steps to the second floor. The hallway was wider and surprisingly quiet. I didn't know what I expected, but I thought I would hear sounds. Shaking my head, I counted until I reached the sixth door on the left. I tried the handle and found it unlocked. I started to open the door, but stopped. What was I doing? Anyone or anything could be waiting beyond this door. That woman downstairs. The sound of a male chuckle filled the hallway as the door beside me opened. Panicked, I quickly backed into the room in front of me, closing the door behind me. Heart pounding, I looked around. There were no lamps, just a tree of candles on a mantle. A settee sat in front of an empty fireplace. Without even looking behind me, I knew the only other piece of furniture had to be a bed. I drew in a deep breath, catching the scent of the candles. Cinnamon? But there was something else. Something that reminded me of dark spices and pine. I started to turn. An arm curled around my waist, pulling me back against a very hard, very male body. This? A deep voice whispered, is unexpected. Chapter Two Caught off guard, I looked up, a mistake that Victor had taught me never to make. I should have gone for my dagger, but instead I stood there as the arm around my waist tightened and his hand settled at my hip. But it's a welcome surprise, he continued sliding his arm away. Snapping out of my stupor, I whirled to face him, the hood of the cloak remaining in place as my hand went for the dagger. I looked up, and then some more. Oh, my gods. I froze, utter shock rippling through me, shorting out all common sense when I saw his face in the soft glow of the candlelight. I knew who he was, even though I'd never spoken with him. Hawk, Flynn, everyone in Castle Tierman knew when the Rise Guard arrived from Carcedonia, the capital, a few months ago. I'd been no different. I wanted to lie to myself and say that it was due to his striking height, placing him nearly a foot taller than me. Or it was because he moved with the same inherent predatory grace and fluidity that belonged to the large gray cave cats that normally roamed the wastelands, but that I had seen once in the queen's palace as a child. The fearsome wild animal had been caged, and the way it continuously prowled back and forth in the too small enclosure had equally fascinated and horrified me. I'd seen Hawk pacing in the same manner on more than one occasion, as if he too were caged. 
It could have been the sense of authority that seemed to bleed from his pores, even though he couldn't be much older than I was, maybe the same age as my brother or a year or two older. Or perhaps it was his skill with the sword. One morning, while I stood beside the Duchess on one of the many balconies at Castle Tierman, overlooking the training yard below, she told me Hawk had come from the capital with glowing recommendations and was well on his way to becoming one of the youngest royal guards. Her gaze had been fixed on Hawk's sweat-slick arms. So had mine. Since his arrival, I'd found myself hidden in the shadowy alcoves more than a few times, watching him train with the other guards. Other than the weekly city council sessions held in the great hall, it was the only time I saw him. My interest could simply be because Hawk was, well, he was beautiful. It wasn't often that could be said about a male, but I could think of no better word to describe him. He had dark, thick hair that curled at the nape of his neck and often fell forward, brushing equally dark brows. The planes and angles of his face made me yearn for some talent with a brush or a pen. His cheekbones were high and wide, nose surprisingly straight for a guard. Many of them had suffered at least one broken nose. His square jaw was firm and his mouth well-formed. The few times I'd seen him smile, the right side of his lip curved up and a deep dimple appeared. If he had a matching one on his left cheek, I didn't know. But his eyes were by far his most captivating feature. They reminded me of cool honey, a striking color I'd never seen before. And he had this way of looking at you that left you feeling stripped bare. I knew this because I felt his stare during the councils held in the great hall, even though he'd never seen my face or even my eyes before. I was sure his regard was due to the fact that I was the first maiden in centuries. People always stared when I was in public, whether they were guards, lords and ladies in wait, or commoners. His stare could also just be a product of my imagination, driven by my small, hidden desire that he was as curious about me as I was of him. Perhaps it was all those reasons why he caught my interest, but there was another one that I was a little embarrassed to even acknowledge. I'd purposely reached out with my senses when I saw him. I knew it was wrong to do when there was no good reason, nothing to justify the invasion, and I had no excuse other than wondering what often made him pace like a caged cave cat. Hawk was always in pain. Not the physical kind. It was deeper than that, feeling like chips of sharp ice against my skin. It was raw, and it felt never-ending. But the anguish that seemed to follow him like a shadow never overwhelmed him. If I hadn't prodded, I never would have felt it. Somehow, he kept that kind of agony in check, and I knew of no one else who could do that, not even the Ascended, only because I never felt anything from them, although I knew they felt physical pain. The fact that I never had to worry about picking up residual pain from them should make me seek out their presence, but instead, it gave me the creeps. I wasn't expecting you tonight. Hawk spoke. He was giving me that half smile of his now, the one that showed no teeth, made the dimple in his right cheek appear, but never quite reached his eyes. It's only been a few days, sweetling. Sweetling? I opened my mouth and then clamped it shut as realization rose. I blinked. He thought I was someone else, someone he'd obviously met here before. I glanced down at my cloak, the borrowed garment. It was rather distinctive, a pale blue with an edging of white fur. Britta. Did he think I was Britta? She and I were about the same height, a little under average, and the cloak hid the shape of my body, which was not nearly as thin as hers. No matter how active I was, I could not achieve the willowy frame of Duchess Tierman or some of the other ladies. Inexplicably, 
there was a little part of me, the same bit that was hidden, that was disappointed, and maybe even a little envious of the pretty maid. My gaze swept over Hawk. He wore the black tunic and breeches that all guards wore under their armor. Had he come straight here after his shift? I gave the room a quick once over. There was a small table beside the settee where two glasses sat. Hawk hadn't been alone in here before I arrived. Could he have been with another? Behind Hawk, the bed was made and didn't appear as if anyone had slept in it. What should I do? Turn and run? That would be odd. He'd be sure to ask Britta about it. But as long as I returned the cloak and mask without her knowing, I would be in the clear. Except Victor was most likely still downstairs, and the woman was too. My gods, she had to be a seer. Instinct told me she had known this room was occupied. She'd sent me here on purpose. Had she known that Hawk was here and likely to mistake me for Britta? It seemed too unreal to believe. Did Pence tell you I was here? He asked. My breath caught as my heart started pounding like a hammer against my ribs. I thought Pence was a guard on the rise, one around Hawk's age. A blonde, if I remembered correctly, but I hadn't seen him downstairs. I shook my head. Have you been watching for me then, following me? He asked, tisking softly under his breath. We'll have to talk about that, won't we? There was an odd threat to his voice, one that gave me the impression that he was not all that pleased by the idea of Britta following him. But not tonight, it seems. You're strangely quiet, he observed. From what I knew of Britta, she was rarely ever demure. But the moment I spoke, he'd know I wasn't the maid, and I, I wasn't ready for him to discover that. I wasn't sure what I was ready for. My hand was no longer on the dagger, and I didn't know what that meant. All I knew was that my heart was still racing. We don't have to talk. He reached for the hem of his tunic, and before I could take another breath, he pulled it over his head, tossing it aside. My lips parted and my eyes widened. I'd seen a man's chest before, but I'd never seen his. The muscles that flexed and bunched under the thinner shirts the guards trained in were now on display. He was broad of shoulder and chest all lean muscles defined by years of intense training. There was a fine dusting of hair under his navel that disappeared behind his breeches. My gaze dipped even lower, and heat returned, a different kind that didn't just flush my skin, but also invaded my blood. Even in the candlelight, I could see how tight his breeches were, how they gloved his body, leaving very little to the imagination. And I had a vast imagination, thanks to the lady's frequent tendency to overshare and my frequent tendency to listen in on conversations. A strange curling sensation hit my lower stomach. It wasn't unpleasant, not at all. It was warm and tingling, reminding me of my first sip of bubbly champagne. Hawk stepped toward me, and my muscles tensed to run, but I held myself still by sheer will. I knew I should have stepped away. I should have spoken and revealed that I wasn't Britta. I should have left immediately. The way he prowled toward me, his long legs eating up the distance between us, told me his intent, even if he hadn't removed his tunic. And while I had little, all right, absolutely no experience, I inherently knew that if he reached me, he would touch me. He may even do more. He might kiss me, and that was forbidden. I was the maiden, the chosen. Not to mention he thought I was another woman, and he'd obviously been in this room with someone else before I got here. That didn't mean he'd been with someone, but he could have. I still didn't move or speak. I waited, my heart beating so fast I felt faint, 
Tiny tremors racked my hands and legs, and I never trembled. What are you doing? whispered the reasonable, sane voice in my head. Living, I whispered back. And being incredibly stupid, the voice countered. I was, but again, I stood there. Senses hyper aware, I watched as Hawk stopped in front of me and lifted his hands, gripping the back of the hood with one. For a moment, I thought he might pull it back and the charade would be over. But that wasn't what he did. The hood only slipped back a couple of inches. I don't know what kind of game you're about tonight. His deep voice was husky, but I'm willing to find out. His other arm came around my waist. A gasp left me, and he hauled me to his chest. This was nothing like the brief embraces I'd received from Victor. I'd never been held by a man like this. There wasn't an inch between his chest and mine. The contact was a jolt to my senses. He lifted me up onto the tips of my toes, then clear off my feet. His strength was staggering since I wasn't exactly light. Stunned, my hands landed on his shoulders. The heat of his hard skin seemed to burn through my gloves and the cloak and thin white gown I usually slept in. His head slanted, and I felt the warmth of his breath on my lips. A tight tremor of anticipation coiled its way down my spine. At the same moment, my stomach dipped with uncertainty. There was no time for the two warring emotions to battle. He pivoted and strode forward with the same kind of feline grace I'd seen from him before. In a matter of a few stuttering heartbeats, he was guiding us down. His grip strong but careful, as if he were aware of his strength. He came down over me, his hand still behind my head, his weight a shock as he pressed me into the bed, and then his mouth was on mine. Hawk kissed me. There was nothing sweet or soft like I'd imagined a kiss to be. It was hard and overwhelming, claiming, and when I sucked in a sharp breath, he took advantage, deepening the kiss. His tongue touched mine, startling me. Panic flared in the pit of my stomach, but so did something else, something far more powerful, a pleasure I hadn't experienced before. He tasted of the golden liquor I'd once snuck, and I felt that stroke of his tongue in every part of me. It was in the shivers that erupted all over my skin, in the inexplicable heaviness in my chest, in that curling, tightening sensation below my navel, and even lower still, where there was a sudden throbbing pulse between my legs. I shuddered, my fingers digging into his flesh, and I suddenly wished I hadn't worn gloves because I wanted to feel his skin, and I doubted I'd be in any shape to concentrate on what he was feeling. His head tilted, and I felt the brush of his oddly sharp. Without warning, he broke his kiss and lifted his head. Who are you? Thoughts oddly slow and skin humming, I blinked open my eyes. Dark hair fell forward onto his forehead. His features were shadowed in the soft, flickering light, but I thought his lips looked as swollen as mine felt. Hawk acted too fast for me to track the movement, tugging my hood back, exposing my masked face. His brows lifted as the haze cleared from my thoughts. My heart jumped around in my chest for a whole different reason, even though my lips still tingled from the kiss. My first kiss. Hawk's golden-eyed gaze rose to my head, and he shifted his hand out from behind my neck. I tensed as he picked up a strand of my hair, drawing it out so it shone a deep auburn in the candlelight. His head tilted to the left. You are most definitely not who I thought you were, he murmured. How did you know? I blurted out. Because the last time I kissed the owner of this cloak, she damn near sucked my tongue down her throat. Oh, I whispered. Was I supposed to have done that? It didn't sound like it would be something enjoyable. He stared down at me, 
gaze assessing as he remained with half his body atop mine. One of his legs was thrust between mine, and I had no idea exactly when that had happened. Have you been kissed before? My face caught fire. Oh, gods, was it that obvious? I have. One side of his lips kicked up. Do you always lie? No, I immediately lied. Liar, he murmured, his tone almost teasing. Embarrassment flooded my system, suffocating the shivery pleasure as if I'd been doused in cold winter sleet. I pushed at his bare chest. You should get off. I was planning to. The way he said it made my eyes narrow. Hawk laughed, and it was, it was the first time I'd heard him do so. When I'd seen him in the hall, he was quiet and stoic like most guards, and I'd only seen that half grin of his while he trained, but never a laugh. And with the anguish I knew lingered below the surface, I wasn't quite sure that he ever laughed. But he had now, and it sounded real, deep, and nice. And it rumbled through me, all the way to the tips of my toes. I was slow to realize that this was the most I'd heard him speak. He had a slight accent, an almost musical lilt to his tone. I couldn't quite place it, but I'd only ever been to the capital and here, and it was not often that many people spoke to me or around me if they knew I was present. The accent could be quite common for all I knew. You really should move, I told him, even though I liked the weight of him. I'm quite comfortable where I am, he added. Well, I'm not. Will you tell me who you are, princess? Princess, I repeated. There were no princesses or princes in the entire kingdom beyond the Dark One who called himself such. Not since Atlantia had ruled. You are quite demanding. He lifted one shoulder in a shrug. I imagine a princess to be demanding. I am not demanding, I stated. Get off me. He arched a brow. Really? Telling you to move is not being demanding. We'll have to disagree on that. He paused. Princess? My lips twitched in wry humor, but I managed to stifle the smile. You shouldn't call me that. Then what should I call you? A name, perhaps? I'm, I'm no one, I told him. No one? That's a strange name. Do girls with a name like that often make a habit of wearing other people's clothing? I'm not a girl, I snapped. I would sure hope not. He paused lips curling down at the corners. How old are you? Old enough to be in here, if that's what you're worried about. In other words, old enough to be masquerading as someone else, allowing others to believe you are another person, and then allowing them to kiss. I get what you're saying. I cut him off. Yes, I'm old enough for all those things. One eyebrow rose. I'll tell you who I am although I have a feeling you already know. I'm Hawk Flynn. Hi, I said, feeling foolish for doing so. The dimple in his right cheek deepened. This is the part where you tell me your name. My lips, nor my tongue, moved. Then I'll have to keep calling you Princess. His eyes were much warmer now, and I wanted to see if the pain had eased, but managed to resist. I thought that perhaps his pain had gone away. If so, the least you can do is tell me why you didn't stop me, he said, before I could give in to the curiosity and reach out with my senses. I had no idea how I could answer that when I didn't fully understand it myself. One side of his lips quirked up. I'm sure it's more than my disarming good looks. I wrinkled my nose. Of course. Another short, surprised-sounding laugh left him. I think you just insulted me. She grinned, I winced. That's not what I meant. You've wounded me, princess. I highly doubt that. You have to be more than well aware of your appearance. 
I am. It has led to quite a few people making questionable life choices. Then why did you say you were insulted? Realizing he was teasing me and feeling foolish for not seeing that right away, I pushed at his chest once more. You're still lying on me. I know. I took a breath. It's quite rude of you to continue doing so when I've made it clear that I would like for you to move. It's quite rude of you to barge into my room dressed as your lover. He raised a brow. I wouldn't call her that. What would you call her? Hawk appeared to mull over that while still sprawled halfway across me. A good friend. Part of me was relieved that he hadn't referred to her as something derogatory, like I'd overheard other men do before when speaking of women they'd been intimate with. But a good friend? I didn't know friends behaved this way. I'm willing to wager you don't know much about these sorts of things. The truth in his statement was hard to ignore. And you wager all of this on just one kiss? Just one kiss, princess. You can learn a wealth of things from just one kiss. Staring at him, I couldn't help but feel very inexperienced. The only thing I could tell from his kiss was what it had made me feel, like he was seeking to possess me. Why didn't you stop me? His gaze swept over the mask and then lower, to where I realized the cloak had parted, exposing the too thin gown and its rather daring neckline. Honestly, I didn't know what I'd been thinking when I'd slipped on the garment. It was almost like I'd subconsciously been preparing myself for... something. My stomach tumbled. More likely the gown was false bravado. Hawk's gaze found mine. I think I'm beginning to understand. Does that mean you're going to get up so I can move? Why haven't you made him get up? Whispered that stupid, very reasonable and very logical voice. That was a great question. I knew how to use a man's weight against them. More importantly, I had my dagger and access to it. But I hadn't gone for it nor had I truly made an attempt to put space between us. What did that mean? I, I supposed I felt safe, at least at the moment. I may know very little about Hawk, but he wasn't a stranger. At least he didn't feel that way to me, and I wasn't afraid of him. Hawk shook his head. I have a theory. I'm waiting with bated breath for this. That dimple in his right cheek appeared once more. I think you came to this very room with a purpose in mind. He was right about that, but I doubted he would be right about the actual reason. It's why you didn't speak or attempt to correct my assumption of who you were. Perhaps the cloak you borrowed was also a very calculated decision, he continued. You came here because you want something from me. I started to deny what he suggested, but no words rose to the tip of my tongue. Silence wasn't a denial or agreement, but my stomach dipped again. He shifted ever so slightly, his hand coming to rest against my right cheek, his fingers splayed out. I'm right, aren't I, princess? My heart, skipping all over the place, I tried to swallow, but my throat had dried. Maybe, maybe I came here for, for conversation. To talk? His brows rose. About what? Lots of things, I said. His expression smoothed out. Like? My mind was uselessly empty for several seconds, and then I blurted out the first thing that came to mind. Why did you choose to work on the rise? You came here tonight to ask that. Not a single thing about his tone or his look said he believed me, but I nodded, 
while I added that this was yet another example of how I was really bad at making conversation with people. He was quiet, and then said, I joined the rise for the same reason most do. And what's that? I asked, even though I knew most of the reasons. My father was a farmer, and that was not the life for me. There aren't many other opportunities offered than joining the royal army and protecting the rise, princess. You're right. His eyes narrowed as surprise flickered across his features. What do you mean by that? I mean, there aren't many chances for children to become something other than what their parents were. You mean there aren't many chances for children to improve their stations in life, to do better than those who came before them? I nodded as best I could. The, the natural order of things doesn't exactly allow that. A farmer's son is a farmer, or they, they choose to become a god, where they risk their lives for stable pay that they most likely won't live long enough to enjoy. He finished. Doesn't sound much like an option, does it? No, I admitted. But I had already thought that. There were jobs Hawk could have strived for. Trader and hunter. But they too were hazardous, as they required going outside the rise frequently. It just wasn't as dangerous as joining the royal army and going to the rise. Was the source of his anguish due to what he'd seen as a guard? There may not be many choices, but I still think, no, I know, that joining the guard requires a certain level of innate strength and courage. You think that of all the guards, that they are courageous? I do. Not all guards are good men, princess. My eyes narrowed. I know that. Bravery and strength do not equal goodness. We can agree on that. His gaze dropped to my mouth, and my chest felt inexplicably tight. You said your father was a farmer. Is he... Has he gone to the gods? Something crept across his face, gone too quickly for me to decipher. No, he is alive and well. Yours? I gave a small shake of my head. My father, both of my parents, are gone. I'm sorry to hear that, he said, and it sounded genuine. The loss of a parent or a family member lingers long after they're gone, the pain lessening but never fading. Years later, you'll still find yourself thinking that you'd do anything to get them back. He was right, and I thought that this was perhaps the source of the pain he felt. You sound like you know firsthand. I do. I thought of Finley. Had Hawk known him well? Most of the guards were close, developing a bond thicker than blood. But even if he hadn't known Finley, there were surely others he knew that had been lost. I'm sorry, I said. I'm sorry for whoever it was that you've lost. Death is... Death was constant, and I saw a lot of it. I wasn't supposed to, as sheltered as I was, but I saw death all too frequently. His head tilted, sending a tumble of dark locks over his forehead. Death is like an old friend who pays a visit, sometimes when it's least expected, and other times when you're waiting for her. It's neither the first nor the last time she'll pay a visit, but that doesn't make any death less harsh or unforgiving. Sadness threatened to take up residence in my chest, crowding out the warmth. That it is. He dipped his head suddenly, his lips nearing mine. I doubt the need for conversation led you to this room. You didn't come here to talk about sad things that cannot be changed, princess. I knew why I came here tonight, and Hawk was right yet again. It wasn't to talk. I came here to live, to experience, to choose, 
to be anyone other than who I was. None of those things included talking. But I'd had my first kiss tonight. I could stop there, or tonight could be a night of many firsts, all of my choosing. Was I... Was I really considering this, whatever this was? God's, I truly was. Tiny tremors rocked me. Could he feel them? They piled in my stomach, forming little knots of anticipation and fear. I was the maiden, the chosen. My earlier convictions about what the gods concerned themselves with weakened. Would they find me unworthy? Panic didn't seize me like it should. Instead, a spark of hope did. And that unsettled me more than anything. The tiny glimmer of hope felt traitorous and wholly concerning, given that being deemed unworthy resulted in one of the most serious consequences. If I were to be found unworthy, I'd face certain death. I'd be exiled from the kingdom. Chapter 3 As far as I knew, there'd only been one person who'd been found unworthy upon ascension. Their name had been erased from our histories, as well as any piece of information about who they were and whatever deeds had caused his or her exile. They'd been forbidden to live among mortals, and without family, support, or protection, faced certain death. Even the villages and farmers, with their small rises and guards, suffered staggering mortality rates. While my ascension was different from the others, I could still be found unworthy, and I imagined my punishment would be just as grave. But I didn't have the mental capacity to deal with that. No, that was a lie. I didn't want to deal with that. I should, but I wasn't leaving the room. I wasn't stopping Hawk. I'd already made up my mind, even if I didn't understand why he was still here, with me. Dampening my lower lip with my tongue, I felt dizzy and even a little faint. And I never felt faint. Those impossibly thick lashes lowered, and his gaze was so intent on my mouth that it was like a caress. I shivered. Those eyes of his seemed even brighter than before as his finger traced the outline of my mask, all the way to where the satin ribbon disappeared under the fall of my hair. May I remove this? Unable to speak, I shook my head no. Hawk halted for a moment. Then the half-smile appeared. No dimple this time, though. He trailed his finger away from the mask, then ran it along the line of my jaw and down my throat to where the cloak was fastened. How about this? I nodded. His fingers were deft, and he brushed the cloak aside and then trailed just one fingertip along the neckline, following the rapid rise and fall of the swell of my breasts. A riot of sensations followed his finger, so many I couldn't make sense of them all. What do you want from me? He asked, toying with the small bow between my breasts. Tell me, and I'll make it so. Why? I blurted out. Why would you do this? You don't know me, and you thought I was someone else. A flicker of amusement crossed his striking features. I have nowhere to be at the moment, and I'm intrigued. My brows lifted. Because you have nowhere to be at the moment? Would you rather I wax poetic about how I'm charmed by your beauty, even though I can only see half your face, which, by the way, from what I can see, is pleasing? Would you rather I tell you I'm captivated by your eyes? They are a pretty shade of green from what I can tell. I started to frown. Well, no, I don't want you to lie. None of those things were a lie. He tugged on the bow as he dipped his head, brushing his lips over mine. The soft contact sent a wave of awareness through me. I told you the truth, princess. I'm intrigued by you. And it's fairly rare anyone intrigues me. So, so, 
he repeated with a chuckle as his lips glided along my jaw. You've changed my evening. I'd planned to return to my quarters, maybe get a good, albeit boring, night of sleep. But I have a suspicion that tonight will be anything but boring if I spend it with you. I drew in a shallow breath, weirdly flattered, and yet still confused by his motivations. I wished someone was here to ask, but even if they were, that would be weird and awkward. The two glasses by the settee appeared in my mind. Were you, were you with someone before me? His head lifted and stared down at me. That's a random question. There are two glasses by the settee, I pointed out. It's also a random personal question, asked by someone whose name I don't even know. My cheeks warmed. He had a point. He was quiet for so long that doubt crept in. Maybe I shouldn't care if he had been with someone else this evening. But I did. And if that told me anything, it screamed that this was a mistake. I was in over my head. I knew nothing about him, of what was... I was with someone, he answered. And disappointment swelled. A friend, who is not like the owner of the cloak. One I hadn't seen in a while. We were catching up in private. The dismay eased, and I decided that he must be telling the truth. He didn't have to lie to have me when he could have any number of others who would be eager to intrigue him. So, princess, will you tell me what you want from me? I took another uneven breath. Anything? Anything. He moved his hand then, cupping my breast as he ran his thumb across the center. It was such a light touch, but I gasped as bolts of pleasure darted through me. My body reacted on its own, arching into his touch. I'm waiting, he said, swiping his thumb once more and scattering my already disjointed thoughts. Tell me what you enjoy so I can make you love it. I... I bit down on my lip. I don't know. Hawk's gaze flew to mine, and such a long moment passed that I began to wonder if I'd said the wrong thing. I'll tell you what I want. His thumb moved in slow, tight circles across a most sensitive part. I want you to remove your mask. I... A sharp, pulsing thrill rippled through my body, quickly followed by my heady wonder. What I felt, I'd never felt anything like it before. Sharp and sweet, a different type of anguish. Why? Because I want to see you. You can see me now. No, princess, he said, lowering his head until his lips brushed the neckline of my gown. I want to really see you when I do this, without your gown between you and my mouth. Before I could ask what he meant, I felt the wet, warm glide of his tongue through the thin silken gown. I gasped, shocked by the act and by the rush of liquid heat it brought forth. But then his gaze lifted to mine as his mouth closed over the tip of my breast. He sucked deep and long, and the gasp turned to a cry that would surely embarrass me later. Remove your mask. His head lifted as he slid a hand over my hip. Please? He wouldn't recognize me if I did. Hawk would never know who I was with or without the mask, but if I removed the facial covering, would he say what the Duke often did? that I was both a masterpiece and a tragedy? And when he felt the uneven slices of skin scattering along my stomach and thighs, would he jerk his hand away in horror? My skin chilled. I hadn't thought this through, at all. The wonderful exhilarating heat dimmed. Hawk wasn't an ascended, but he was like them in appearance, nearly flawless. I hadn't ever been ashamed of the scars before, not when they were proof of the horror I'd survived. But if he, 
Hawk's hand slid down the outer right thigh to where the dress parted and stopped, right over the hilt of the dagger. What the? Before I could even take another breath, he'd unsheathed the blade, his fingers coming precariously close to one of the scars. I sat up, but he was faster, rocking backward. The candlelight glinted off the red blade. Bloodstone and woven bone. Give that back, I demanded, scrambling to my knees. His gaze shifted from the dagger to me. This is a unique weapon. I know. My hair fell forward over my shoulders. The kind that's not inexpensive, he continued. Why are you in possession of this, princess? It was a gift, which was true. And I'm not foolish enough to come to a place like this unarmed. He stared at me for a moment, then focused on the dagger again. Carrying a weapon and having no idea how to use it does not make one wise. Irritation flared to life, just as hotly as the desire he'd elicited from me mere moments ago. What makes you think I don't know how to use it? Because I'm female? You can't be surprised that I would be shocked. Learning how to use a dagger isn't exactly common for females in Solis. You're right, and he was. It wasn't socially appropriate for females to know how to wield a weapon or be able to defend themselves, something that always bothered me. If my mother had known how to defend herself, she might still be here. But I do know how to use it. The right side of his lips curved up. Now I'm truly intrigued. He moved unbelievably fast, thrusting the dagger blade down into the bed. I gasped, wondering what the owners of the red pearl would think of that. But then he pounced. He took me back down to the mattress, his weight covering me once more, and he pressed into me in a way that caused all the interesting parts to meet. His mouth lined up with mine. A fist pounded on the door, silencing whatever he was about to ask. Hawk! A male voice rang out. You in there? He stiffened above me, his warm breath against my lips as he closed his eyes. It's Kieran. The man called out a name I didn't recognize. As if I didn't know that already. Hawk muttered under his breath, and a small giggle left me. His eyes opened and a half grin appeared. Hawk! Kieran pounded some more. I think you should answer him. I whispered, damn it, he cursed. Looking over his shoulder, he called out, I'm thoroughly happily busy at the moment. Sorry to hear that, Kieran replied as Hawk refocused on me. Kieran knocked again, but the interruption is unavoidable. The only unavoidable thing I see is your soon to be broken hand if you pound on that door one more time, Hawk warned, and my eyes widened. What, princess? His voice lowered. I told you I was really intrigued. Then I must risk a broken hand, Kieran answered. A growl of frustration rumbled from deep within Hawk's throat, the sound strangely animalistic. Goosebumps pimpled my skin. The envoy has arrived, Kieran added through the door. Shadows crept across Hawk's face. His lips moved as if he murmured something but the sound was too low for me to hear. A chill chased away some of the heat. An envoy? He nodded. The supplies we've been waiting for, he explained. I need to go. I nodded in return, understanding that he had to leave, as I reached between us, grasping the edge of the cloak. For a long moment, Hawk didn't move, but then he shifted off me, standing. He called out to Kieran as he grabbed his tunic off the floor. I yanked the forgotten dagger out of the mattress, quickly sheathing it as he pulled the tunic over his head and shrugged a baldric over his shoulders, securing the belt at his waist. There were two sheaths at his sides for weapons, weapons I hadn't been aware of until now. He picked up two short swords from the chest near the door, and I thought that maybe I needed to be better aware of my surroundings the next time I barged into a room. His blades were honed to a wicked, deadly point, intended for close contact fighting, 
and each side was serrated, designed to cut through flesh and muscle. I knew how to use them too, but I kept that to myself. I'll come back as soon as I can. He sheathed the swords flat to his sides. I swear. I nodded once more. Hawk stared at me. Tell me that you'll wait for me, princess. My heart skipped over itself. I will. Turning, he walked to the door and then stopped. He faced me. I look forward to returning. I said nothing as he left the room, opening the door only wide enough for him to slip through. When the door clicked into place behind him, I let go of the breath I'd been holding and looked down at the front of my gown. The area of my breast was still damp, the white material nearly transparent. My cheeks flushed hotly as I scooted off the bed and stood on surprisingly weak knees. My gaze lifted to the door and I closed my eyes, unsure if I was disappointed or relieved by the interruption. Truthfully, it was a mixture of both, because I'd lied to Hawk. I wouldn't be here when he returned. What did you do last night? The question snapped my attention from the biscuit I was currently devouring to the lady in wait who sat across from me. Tawny Lyon was the second daughter of a successful merchant, given to the royal court at the age of 13 during the rite. Tall and lithe, with rich brown skin and beautiful brown eyes, she was absolutely enviable. Some of the ladies and lords in wait were assigned tasks outside of preparation to join the court after ascension. And since we were the same age, she had been assigned as my companion shortly after her rite. Her duty ranged from keeping me company to assisting me with my bath or to dress if I required it. Tawny was one of the few people who could make me laugh over the silliest things. Actually, she was one of the few people who were even allowed to speak to me. She was the closest thing I had to a friend, and I cared for her deeply. I believed she cared for me too, or at the very least, liked me. But she was required to be with me unless I dismissed her for the day. If she hadn't been given the task of being my companion, we never would have spoken. That fact was not a reflection upon her as a person, but because she would be like all the rest, either forbidden to socialize with me or wary of my presence. The knowledge often sat heavy in my chest, another chunk of ice. But even though I knew our friendship was rooted in duty, I trusted her. At least to a certain degree. She knew I was trained, but she didn't know the things I sometimes assisted Victor with, and she had no knowledge of my gifts. I kept those things to myself because sharing that information would either put others or her in harm's way. I was here. Wiping buttery crumbs from my fingers, I gestured to the rather sparse chamber. We were in the small anteroom that opened up to the bedroom. There were only two chairs by the fireplace, a wardrobe and a chest, a bed, one nightstand, and a heavy fur rug under our feet. Others had more creature comforts. Tawny had a beautiful chaise in her room and a pile of plush floor coverings. And I knew some of the other ladies and lords in wait had vanities or desks, walls lined with bookshelves, and even electricity. Over the years, those items had been stripped from my chamber for one infraction or another. You were not in your room, Tawny said. A simple top knot was trying and failing to keep the mass of brown and gold curls swept back from her face. More than a few had snuck free to rest against her cheeks. I checked on you shortly after midnight, and you weren't here. My heart skipped a beat. Had something occurred where the Duke or Duchess had sent Tawny for me? If so, Tawny wouldn't be able to lie. But I imagined if that had happened, I would already know. I would already have been summoned to the Duke's private office. Why were you checking on me? I asked. I thought I heard your door opening and closing, so I decided to investigate, but no one was here. She paused. No one, including you. There was no way she'd heard me return. 
I'd used the old servant's access, and while that door was as creaky as a bag of bones, her room was on the other side of where my bed sat. That door was one of the reasons I'd never asked to be moved to the newer, renovated parts of the stronghold. Through there, I could access nearly any part of the castle and could come and go without being seen. It more than compensated for the lack of electricity and the constant chilly draft that seemed to always make its way around the windows, no matter how sunny the day was. My palms dampened as I glanced at the closed hallway door. Had someone been looking for me? Again, I would know by now. So it was likely Tawny thought she heard something. Knowing Tawny as I did, I knew she wouldn't let this go if I didn't give her something. I couldn't sleep last night. Nightmares? I nodded, feeling a little guilty for the sympathy that crept into her eyes. You've been having a lot of them lately. She leaned back in the chair. Are you sure you don't want to try one of the sleeping drafts the healer made for you? Yes, I don't like the idea of being knocked out senseless. She finished for me. It's really not that bad, Poppy. You rest very deeply, and honestly, with as little sleep as you manage, I think it would be good to at least try. The mere idea of taking something that would put me in such a deep sleep that it would take an army marching through my bedchamber to wake me made me sweat. I would be rendered completely helpless, and that was something I would never allow to happen. So what did you do? A pause. Or should I ask, where did you go? Her eyes narrowed as I became enraptured in the fine trim of the napkin. You snuck out, didn't you? In that moment, Tawny proved that she knew me just as well as I knew her. I don't know why you'd think that. Because you have a history of doing that. She laughed when I glanced up at her. Come on, tell me what you did. I'm sure it's more exciting than what I was doing, which was listening to Mistress Cambria prattle on about how inappropriate this lady or lord in wait is. I bled a viciously upset stomach just to be able to excuse myself. I giggled, knowing that Tawny would have done just that. The mistresses are a lot to handle. That's being too kind, she remarked. Grinning, I picked up the cup of creamed coffee. The mistresses were servants of the Duchess, who helped her run the household, but also kept track of the ladies in wait. Mistress Cambria was a dragon of a woman that scared even me. I did sneak out, I admitted. Where did you go without me? I think you might be upset when you hear where. Most likely, I peeked up at her. The Red Pearl? Her eyes widened to the size of the saucers scattered across the trolley between us. Are you serious? I nodded. I can't. She appeared to take a deep breath. How? I borrowed one of the maid's cloaks, and I used that mask I found. You, you devious little thief. I returned the cloak this morning, so I don't think you can call me a thief. Who cares if you returned it? She tipped forward. What was it like? Interesting, I said. And when she begged for more details, I told her what I'd seen. She was enthralled, hanging on every word I said, as if I were sharing with her the actual ritual that completed the ascension. I can't believe you didn't take me with you. She fell back in her chair with a pout, but then sprang forward once more. Did you see anyone there you recognized? Lauren claims she goes there nearly every other evening. Lauren, another lady in wait, claimed many things. I didn't see her, but I trailed off, unsure if I should tell her about Hawk. I'd left no more than ten minutes after Hawk had, relieved to find that Victor was also nowhere to be seen. Neither was the strange woman who knew more than she should. I'd done everything in my power not to think about what had happened in that room with him, which meant I failed the moment I returned to my bed. I'd lain there until exhaustion claimed me, replaying everything he'd said, everything he'd done. I'd woken with the strangest frustration, an ache in my chest and lower belly. But what? she asked. 
I wanted to tell her. Gods, did I ever want to share what had happened with Hawk with someone. I had a hundred questions bursting to be let out, but last night was different. I'd crossed a big line. And while I didn't feel like I had debased myself or done anything truly wrong, I knew that my guardians wouldn't agree. Neither would the priests and priestesses. Going to the Red Pearl was one thing. Sharing myself in any form with another was a totally different matter. That knowledge could be a weapon. I trusted Tawny, but as I acknowledged before, only to a certain degree. And even though the mere thought of Hawk made my stomach tighten into dozens of little coils, it wasn't something that would ever happen again. When I saw him during the city council sessions, he wouldn't know that it had been me he'd called princess. He'd have no idea that he'd been my first kiss. What we'd done? It belonged to just me. It had to stay that way. I exhaled slowly, ignoring the sudden scratchy lump in my throat. But many were wearing masks. She could have been there, and I wouldn't have known. Anyone could have been. If you ever go to the Red Pearl without me again, I will cut holes in the bottoms of your shoes, she warned, toying with the white beads dotting the neckline of her rose-colored gown. A shocked laugh left me. Wow, she giggled. Honestly, I'm glad you didn't go with me. When she frowned, I quickly added, I really shouldn't have gone there myself. Yes. Going to the Red Pearl is forbidden, and I'm sure it's as forbidden as you being trained to use a dagger or a sword as a guard on the rise. That was something I hadn't been able to hide from Tawny, and she had never shared, which was one of the reasons I knew I could trust her with most things. Yes, but just like that one time you snuck out to view a fighting ring, or when you convinced me to bathe in the lake, that was your idea, I corrected. And her willingness to aid me in doing forbidden things was the other reason she held almost all of my trust. And it was also your idea to do it without clothing. Who bathes in their clothes? She asked, widening her eyes innocently. And that was a mutual idea, thank you very much. I think we should do that again, and soon before it gets too cold to even walk outside but I could spend all morning listing things that you've done that are either forbidden by the Duke and Duchess or prohibited for the maiden to do. And up until now, nothing has happened. The gods haven't appeared and deemed you unworthy. That's true, I acknowledged, as I smoothed a crease from the skirt of my gown. Of course it is. She plucked up a small, round, powdery pastry and popped it into her mouth. Somehow, she didn't get a single dusting of sugar on her. Meanwhile, if I so much as breathed in the direction of those pastries, I ended up with a fine coating of white powder in places that made no sense. So, when do we go back? I, I don't think I should. You don't want to? I opened my mouth, then closed it, and tried not to fall down that rabbit hole. The problem was that I wanted to go back. When I was lying in bed and hadn't been obsessively rewinding the time spent with Hawk, reliving the razor-edged yearning and thrill his kiss had dragged out of me, I'd wondered if he had come back like he promised, and if I had done the right thing by leaving. Of course, in the eyes of my guardians and the gods, it had been the right thing. But had it been so for me? Should I have stayed and experienced infinitely more before there might not be any more chances? My gaze lifted to the windows that faced the west portion of the rise. The dark shapes of the guards patrolling the ledge were the only movement. Was Hawk out there? Why was I even wondering that? Because there was more than just a small part of me that wished I'd stayed and I knew it would be a long time before I stopped wondering about what would have happened if I'd waited. Would he have carried out whatever I'd wanted? I didn't even know what that would have entailed. I had ideas. I had my imagination. 
I had other people's stories of their experiences, but they were not mine. They were just thin, transparent copies of the real thing. And I knew if I returned, I would go back in hopes that he'd be there. That was why I shouldn't go back. Looking at the open wardrobe, I first saw the white veil with its delicate gold chains, and a heaviness settled over me. I could already feel its substantial weight, even though the material was made out of the finest, lightest silk. When it first slipped over my head at age eight, I'd panicked. But after ten years, I should have grown used to it by now. While I no longer felt like I couldn't breathe or see while wearing it, it still felt heavy. Hanging beside it was the only color in my wardrobe, a splash of red among a sea of white. It was a ceremonial gown tailored for the upcoming rite. The dress had arrived the morning before, and I hadn't tried it on yet. It would be the first time I was allowed to attend, allowed to wear anything other than white and be seen without the veil. Of course, I would be masked, like everyone else. The only reason I was allowed to attend this rite when all the others had been forbidden was because it would be the last rite before my ascension. Whatever excitement I felt about the rite was tempered by the fact that it would be the last. Tawny rose and drifted to one of the windows. The mist hasn't come in a while. Tawny had a habit of jumping from topic to topic, but this switch was jarring. What made you think of that? I don't know. She tucked back a loose curl. Actually, I do. I overheard Daphina and Lauren talking last night, she said. They claimed they heard from one of the huntsmen that the mist has been gathering beyond the blood forest. I hadn't heard that. My stomach nodded as I remembered Finley, and I wished I hadn't eaten so many slices of bacon. I probably shouldn't have brought it up. She turned from the window. It's just that it has been decades since the mist even neared the capital. It's not something we have to worry about there. No matter where we were, the mist was something to worry about. Just because it hadn't gotten close in decades didn't mean it wouldn't. But I didn't say that. She pushed away from the window, coming back to the table to kneel next to where I sat. Can I be honest with you for a moment? My brows rose. Aren't you always? Well, yes, but this is different. More than curious to know what she was thinking about, I nodded for her to go on. Tawny drew in a deep breath. I know our lives are different, as were our pasts, and as our futures will be. But you treat the ascension as if it may very well be your death, when it is the exact opposite. It's life. It's a new beginning. It is a blessing. You're starting to sound like the Duchess, I teased. But it's the truth. She reached over and clasped my hand. In a few months, you won't be dead, Poppy. You'll be alive and no longer bound by these rules. You'll be in the capital. I'll have been given to the gods, I corrected her. And how amazing is that? You will experience something very few people do. I know, I know you fear that you won't return from them. But you're the queen's favorite maiden. I'm her only maiden. Her eyes rolled. You know that's not why. I did. The queen had done more for me than was ever required of her. But that didn't change that my ascension would be nothing like hers. And when you come back, ascended, I will be right by your side. Just think of the mischief we can make. Tawny squeezed my hand, and I saw that she truly believed that would happen. It could, but it wasn't a certainty. I had no idea what it truly meant to be given to the gods. Although every small detail seemed to be documented about the history of the kingdom, there were a few things that weren't written about. I'd never been able to find anything about previous maidens, 
and I'd asked Priestess Analia over a hundred times what it meant to be given to the gods, and the answer was always the same. A maiden doesn't question the gods' plans. She has faith in them without knowledge of them. Maybe I truly wasn't worthy of being a maiden, because I found it hard to have faith in anything without knowledge of it. But Tawny did, as did Victor and Rylan, and literally everyone else I knew, even Ian. None of them had been given to the gods, though. I searched Tawny's eyes, looking for just the slightest hint of fear. You're not afraid at all, are you? Of the ascension, she rose, locking her fingers together in front of her. Nervous, yes. Afraid, no. I'm excited to begin a new chapter, to begin a life that was her own, where she could wake up and eat whenever she pleased spend her days however she wanted and with whomever she desired instead of being my perpetual shadow. Of course she wasn't afraid. And while I didn't feel the same, I had not once taken into consideration what it meant for her. For the most part, Tawny was always more than willing to take part in whatever adventure I conjured up and even suggested some herself. But if the gods were watching, especially this close to the ascension, they could find her unworthy for taking part. That wasn't something I'd just now thought about. But it hadn't struck me with such clarity before that my attitude toward the ascension could ruin her eagerness. Guilt surfaced, the taste of it sour in the back of my throat. I'm so selfish. Tawny blinked, bewildered. What makes you say that? I've most likely tarnished your excitement with all my doom and gloom, I told her. I haven't really thought about how excited you must be. Well, when you put it that way, she said, and then laughed, the sound soft and warm. Honestly, Poppy, you haven't. How you feel about the ascension hasn't affected how I feel. I'm relieved to hear that. But still, I should be more excited for you. That's what, I took a thin breath. That's what friends do. Have you been excited for me? Happy, she asked, even though you're worried for yourself? I nodded, of course. Then you have done what a friend does. Maybe that was true. But I promised myself I would be better, starting with no longer risking her ascension by involving her in my escapades. I could live with the dire consequences of being found unworthy because it would be my life and my own actions that led to it. But I wouldn't do that to Tawny. I couldn't live with that. After I took supper in my room later that day, Victor knocked on my door. When I looked up at his face, golden and weathered by life on the rise and years in the sun, I didn't think about knowing where he was the night before and the subsequent awkwardness. I saw his expression and knew something had occurred. What's happened? I whispered. We've been summoned, he said, and my heart lurched in my chest. There were only two reasons why we'd be summoned. One would be the Duke, and the other was equally terrible, but for far different reasons. There's a curse. Chapter Four Without wasting one unnecessary second, we left my room and the castle through the old servant's access. Then we moved like ghosts through the city until we found ourselves standing before an old battered door. The white handkerchief tacked just below the handle was the only reason the home in the lower ward of Macedonia was distinguishable from the other squat, narrow houses stacked on top of one another. Glancing over his shoulder to where two city guards chatted under the yellow glow of a street lamp, Victor quickly pulled the handkerchief off the door and slipped it into a pocket inside his dark cloak. The small white cloth was a symbol of the network of people who believed death 
no matter how violent or destructive, deserved dignity. It was also evidence of high treason and disloyalty to the crown. I had accidentally discovered what Victor took part in when I was 15. He'd left one of our training sessions in a hurry one morning, and sensing that something was going on, based on the mental pain the messenger had been throwing off, I'd followed. Obviously, Victor hadn't been pleased. What he was doing was considered treasonous, and being caught wasn't the only danger. However, I'd always been disturbed by how these things were typically handled. I demanded he allow me to help. He had said no, repeated it probably a hundred times. But I had been relentless, and besides, I was uniquely suited to assist in such matters. Victor knew what I could do, and his empathy for others had aided my desire to help. We'd been doing this for about three years now. We weren't the only ones. There were others. Some were guards. A few were citizens. I never met any. For all I knew, Hawk could be one. My stomach dipped and then rolled before I shoved any thoughts of Hawk out of my mind. Victor quietly wrapped his knuckles on the door and then returned his gloved hand to the hilt of his broadsword. A couple of seconds later, hinges creaked as the old battered door shuddered open, revealing the pale round face and red puffy eyes of a woman. She might have been in her mid to late twenties, but the tense pinch to her brow and the lines bracketing her mouth made her appear decades older. The cause of her worn appearance had everything to do with the kind of pain that cut deeper than the physical and was caused by the smell wafting out of the building from behind her. Under the thick, cloying smoke of earthy incense was the unmistakable sour and sickeningly sweet scent of rot and decay, of a curse. You're in need of aid? Victor spoke low. The woman fiddled with the button on her wrinkled blouse, her weary gaze darting from Victor to me. I opened my senses to her. Soul-deep pain radiated from her in waves I couldn't see, but it was so heavy. It was almost a tangible entity surrounding her. I could feel it slicing through my cloak and clothing and scraping against my skin like rusty, icy nails. She felt like someone who was dying but hadn't suffered a single injury or disease. That was how raw and potent her pain was. Fighting the urge to take a step back, I shuddered inside my heavy cloak. Every instinct in me demanded that I put distance between us, get as far away as possible. Her grief formed iron shackles around my ankles, weighing me down as it tightened around my neck. Emotion clogged my throat, tasting like, like bitter desperation and sour hopelessness. I pulled back my senses, but I had opened myself up for too long. I was tuned into her anguish now. Who's that? She rasped. Her voice was hoarse with the tears I knew had swelled her eyes. Someone who can help you. Victor answered in a way I was all too familiar with. He used that calm tone whenever I was seconds away from acting out in anger and doing something entirely reckless, which, according to Victor, was way too often. Please, allow us to enter. Fingers stilling around the button below her throat, she gave a curt nod and then stepped back. I followed Victor inside scanning the dimly lit room, which turned out to be a combined kitchen and living space. There was no electricity in the home, only oil lamps and fat, waxy candles. That wasn't exactly surprising to see, even though electricity had been provided to the area of the lower ward to light the streets and some of the businesses. Only the wealthy had it inside their homes, and they would not be found in the lower ward. They'd be closer to the center of Macedonia, near Castle Tierman, and as far from the rise as possible. But here, the rise loomed. Drawing in a shallow breath, I tried not to focus on how the woman's grief painted the walls and floors an oily black. 
Her pain had gathered here, among the knickknacks and clay plates, quilted blankets with frayed edges, and tired furniture. Clasping my hands together under the cloak, I took another breath, this one deeper, and looked around. A lantern sat on a wooden table next to several sticks of burning incense. Surrounding the brick hearth were several chairs. I zeroed in on the closed door on the other side of the fireplace. My hooded head tilted as I squinted. On the mantel, closest to the door, was a narrow spike of a blade the color of burgundy in the low light. Bloodstone. This woman had been prepared to handle this herself. And with the way she felt, that would be disastrous. What is your name? Victor asked, as he reached up to lower the hood of his cloak. He always did this, showed his face to comfort family or friends, to put them at ease. A lock of blonde hair fell across his forehead as he turned to the woman. I did not reveal myself. Ah, Agnes, she answered, her throat working on a swallow. I, I heard about the white handkerchief, but I, I wasn't sure if anyone would come. I wondered if it was some kind of myth or a trick. It's no trick. Victor may be one of the deadliest guards in the entire city, if not the kingdom. But I knew when Agnes looked up into his blue eyes, all she saw was kindness. Who is ill? Agnes swallowed once more, the skin around her eyes puckering as she briefly squeezed them shut. My husband, Marlo, he's a huntsman for the rise, and, and he returned home two days ago. Her breath caught, and she exhaled heavily. He'd been gone for months. I was so happy to see him. I'd missed him terribly, and with each day, I feared he'd perished on the road. But he came back. My heart squeezed as if it had been caught in a fist. I thought of Finley. Had he been a huntsman, a part of this group that involved Marlowe? He seemed a little under the weather at first, but that's not uncommon. His work is exhausting, she continued. But he started, he started to show signs that night. That night. Only a small note of alarm had crept into Victor's tone, and my eyes widened with a whole cartload more dismay. And you waited until now. We hoped it was something else. A cold, or the flu. Her hand fluttered back to the buttons. Threads were beginning to show along the wooden discs. I, I didn't know until last night that it was something more. He didn't want me to know. Marlowe is a good man, you understand? He wasn't trying to hide it. He, he planned to take care of himself, but. But the curse would not allow it. Victor finished for her, and she nodded. I glanced back at the door. The curse progressed differently for everyone. It took hold for some in a matter of hours, while for others, it could take a day or two. But I knew of no cases that went beyond three. It had to be only a matter of time before he succumbed, possibly hours or minutes. It's okay, Victor assured her, but it truly wasn't. Where is he now? Pressing her other hand to her mouth, she jerked her chin toward the closed door. The sleeve of her blouse was stained with some dark substance. It's still him. Her words were a little muffled. He's, he's still in there. That's how he wants to go to the gods, as himself. Is there anyone else here? She shook her head, letting out another ragged breath. Have you said your goodbyes? I asked. The woman jerked around at the sound of my voice, her eyes widening. My cloak was rather shapeless, so I imagined she was surprised to hear that I was female. A female would be the last thing anyone would expect in situations like these. It's you, she whispered. I stilled. Victor didn't. 
Out of the corner of my eye, I saw his hand return to the hilt of the sword. Agnes moved suddenly, and Victor went to unsheathe his weapon, but before he or I could react, she collapsed to her knees before me. Bowing her head, she folded her hands under her chin. My eyes widened under the hood as I slowly looked at Victor. He arched a brow. They spoke of you, she whispered, rocking in short, jerky movements. My heart might have stopped. They say you're the child of the gods. I blinked once and then twice as tiny goose pumps pimpled my skin. My parents were flesh and blood. I was definitely not a child of the gods, but I knew many people of Solus saw the maiden as such. Who has said this? Victor asked, shooting me a look that said this was something we'd be talking about later. Agnes lifted tear-stained cheeks, shaking her head. I don't want to get anyone in trouble, please. They didn't speak to spread rumors or ill will. It's just that... She trailed off, her gaze drifting toward me. Her voice dropped to barely a whisper. They say you have the gift. Someone had definitely been talking. A subtle shiver curled its way down my spine, but I ignored it as the woman's pain pulsed and flared. I'm no one of importance. Victor inhaled noisily. Agnes, please. Under the cloak, I tugged off my gloves, placing them into a pocket. I slipped my hand through the opening of the heavy folds, offering it to her as I stole a quick glance at Victor. His eyes narrowed on me. I was so gonna hear about this later, but whatever lecture I was bound to receive would be worth it. Agnes's gaze dropped to my hand, and then slowly, she lifted her arm and placed her palm against mine. As she rose, I curled my fingers around her cool hand, and I thought of the golden sparkling sand surrounding the Stroud Sea, of warmth and laughter. I saw my parents, their features no longer clear but lost to time, fuzzy and undefined. I felt the warm, damp breeze in my hair, the sand under my feet. It was the last happy memory I had of my parents. Agnes's arm trembled as she took a sudden heavy breath. What? She trailed off, her mouth going lax as her shoulders lowered. The suffocating anguish retracted, collapsing into itself like a matchstick house in a windstorm. Her dampened lashes blinked rapidly and rosy color infused her cheeks. I let go of her hand the moment the room felt more open and light, fresher. There was still a sharp edge of pain lingering in the shadows, but it was now manageable for her, for me. I don't. Agnes placed a hand to her breast, giving a little shake of her head. Her brow pinched as she stared at her right hand. Almost tentatively, she returned her gaze to me. I feel like I can breathe again. Understanding crept across her face, quickly followed by the gleam of awe in her eyes. The gift. I slipped my hand back under my cloak, conscious of the ball of tension brewing inside me. Agnes trembled. For a moment, I was afraid she would drop to the floor again, but she didn't. Thank you. Thank you so much. My gods, thank. There is nothing you need to thank me for. I cut her off. Have you said your goodbyes? I asked once more. Time was getting away from us. Time we didn't have. Tears glimmered as she nodded. But the grief didn't seize as it did before. What I'd done wouldn't last. The pain would resurface. Hopefully by then she would be able to process it. If not, the grief would always linger, a ghost that would haunt every happy moment in her life until it became all she knew. We will see him now, Victor announced. It would be best if you remained out here. Closing her eyes, Agnes nodded, 
Victor touched my arm as he turned, and I followed. My gaze landed on the settee closest to the hearth as Victor reached the door. A floppy-headed stuffed doll with yellow hair made of yarn lay partially hidden behind the thin cushion. Tiny goosebumps broke out across my skin as unease bawled in the pit of my stomach. Will you? Agnes called out. Will you ease his passing? Of course, I said, turning back to Victor. I placed a hand on his back and waited for him to dip his head. I kept my voice low as I said, there is a child here. Victor halted with his hand on the door, and I tilted my head toward the settee. His gaze followed. I couldn't sense people, only their pain once I saw them. If a child was here, he or she must be hidden away, and possibly completely unaware of what was happening. But then, why hadn't Agnes admitted to the child being here? The unease expanded, and the worst-case scenario played out in my mind. I will handle this. You handle that. Victor hesitated, his blue eyes wary as they lifted to the door. I can take care of myself. I reminded him of what he already knew. The fact that I could defend myself rested solely on his shoulders. A heavy sigh rattled from him as he muttered, That doesn't mean you always have to. He stepped back, though, facing Agnes. Would it be too much trouble to ask for something warm to drink? Oh, no, of course not, Agnes answered. I could make up some tea or coffee. Do you perhaps have hot cocoa? Victor asked, and I smirked. While that was something a parent may have on hand and could be seen as him searching for additional evidence of a child, it was also Victor's greatest weakness. I do, Agnes cleared her throat, and I heard the sound of a cupboard opening. Victor nodded at me, and I stepped forward, placing my hand on the door and pushing it open. If I hadn't been prepared for the too sweet and the bitter sour stench, it would have knocked me over. My gag reflex threatened to be triggered as my gaze adapted to the candlelit bedroom. I would just have to not breathe as often. Sounded like a solid plan. I swept the room with a quick glance. Except for the bed, a tall wardrobe, and two rickety-looking end tables, the room was bare. More incense burned in here, but it couldn't beat back the smell. My attention returned to the bed, to the form lying impossibly still in the center of it. Stepping inside, I closed the door behind me and started forward, slipping my right hand back into the cloak, to my right thigh. My fingers curled over the always cold hilt of my dagger as I focused on the man, or what was left of him. He was young, that much I could tell, with light brown hair and broad shoulders that trembled. His skin had taken on a gray pallor, and his cheeks were sunken as if his stomach hadn't been full in weeks. Dark shadows blossomed under eyelids that spasmed every couple of seconds. The color of his lips was more blue than pink. Taking a deep breath, I opened myself up once more. He was in great pain, both physical and emotional. It wasn't the same as Agnes's, but no less potent or heavy. In here, the anguish left no room for light, and it went beyond suffocating. It choked and clawed in the knowledge that there was no way out of this. A tremor coursed through me as I forced myself to sit beside him. Unsheathing the dagger, I kept it hidden under my cloak as I lifted my left hand and carefully pulled the sheet down. His chest was bare, and the shivers increased as the cooler air of the room reached his waxy skin. My gaze traveled down the length of his concave stomach. I saw the wound he'd hidden from his wife. It was above his right hip, four ragged tears in his skin, two side by side, an inch or so above two identical wounds. He'd been bitten. 
one who didn't know better would think some sort of wild animal had gotten a hold of him. But this wasn't the wound of an animal. It seeped blood and something darker, oilier. Faint, reddish-blue lines radiated out from the bite, spreading across his lower stomach and disappearing under the sheet. A ravaged moan drew my gaze upward, his lips peeled back, revealing just how close he was to a fate worse than death. His gums bled, streaking his teeth, teeth that were already changing. Two on top, two on the bottom. His canines had already elongated. I looked to where his hand rested next to my leg. His nails had also lengthened, becoming more animalistic than mortal. Within an hour, both his teeth and nails would harden and sharpen. They'd be able to cut and chew through skin and muscle. He would become one of them, a craven. Driven by an insatiable hunger for blood, he would slaughter everyone in sight. And if anyone were to survive his attack, they would eventually become just like him. Well, not everyone. I hadn't. But he was becoming what existed outside the rise, what lived inside the thick, unnatural mist. The foulness that the fallen kingdom of Atlantia had cursed these lands with. Some four hundred years after the War of Two Kings had ended, they were still a plague. The craven were creations of the Atlanteans, the product of their poisonous kiss, which acted like an infection, turning innocent men, women, and children into starved creatures whose body and mind became twisted and decayed by ceaseless hunger. Even though the majority of Atlanteans had been hunted into extinction, many still existed, and there only needed to be one Atlantean alive for there to be a dozen craven if not more. They weren't completely mindless. They could be controlled, but only by the Dark One. And this poor man had fought back and escaped, but he must have known what the bite meant. From birth, we all knew. It was part of the kingdom's blood-soaked history. He was cursed, and there was nothing that could be done. Had he come back to say goodbye to his wife, to a child? Had he thought he would be different, blessed by the gods, chosen? It didn't matter. Sighing, I replaced the sheet, leaving his upper chest bare. Trying not to breathe too deeply, I set my palm on his skin. His flesh, it felt all wrong, like cold leather. I concentrated on the beaches of Carcedonia, the capital, and the dazzling blue waters of the Stroud. I remembered the clouds, how fat and fluffy they were, how they looked like peace must feel. And I thought of the Queen's Gardens outside of Castle Tierman, where I could simply be and not think or feel anything, where everything, including my own mind, was quiet. I thought of the warmth those two brief moments with Hawk had brought forth. Marlowe's shivers subsided, and the twitching behind his eyes slowed. The puckered skin at the corners of his eyes smoothed out. Marlowe, I said, ignoring the dull pain that started to blossom behind my eyes. A headache would eventually come. One always did when I repeatedly opened myself or used my gift. The chest under my hand rose deeply, and clumped lashes fluttered. His eyes opened, and I tensed. They were blue, mostly. Bolts of red shot through the irises. Soon there would be no blue left, only the color of blood. His dry lips parted. Are you, are you rain? Have you come to take me at my end? He thought I was the god of the common man and endings, a god of death. No, I'm not. Knowing that his pain would be eased long enough for this to be completed, I lifted my left hand and did the one thing I was expressly forbidden to do, not just by the Duke and Duchess of Macedonia or by the Queen, but also by the gods. 
I did what Hawk had asked in regards to the mask, but I'd refused. I pulled down my hood and then removed the white domino mask I wore just in case my cloak slipped, revealing my face. I figured or hoped that the gods would make an exception in cases like this. His crimson-laced gaze drifted over my features, starting where wisps of burnt copper hair curled against my forehead, then the right side of my face, followed by my left. His stare lingered there, over the evidence of what a craven's claws could do. I wondered if he thought the same thing the Duke always did. Such a shame. Those three words seemed to be the Duke's favorite. That and, you have disappointed me. Who are you? He rasped out. My name is Penelope, but my brother and a few others call me Poppy. Poppy, he whispered. I nodded. It's a strange nickname, but my mother used to call me that. It sort of stuck. Marlowe blinked slowly. Why are... The corners of his mouth cracked, the new wounds seeping blood and darkness. Why are you here? Forcing a smile, I tightened my grip on the hilt of the dagger and did another thing that should end with me being hauled to the temple, but hadn't yet, because this wasn't the first time I'd revealed myself to the dying. I am the maiden. His chest rose with a sharp inhale, and he closed his eyes. A tremor coursed through him. You're the chosen, born in the shroud of the gods, protected even inside the womb, veiled from birth. That was me. You, you are here for me. His eyes opened, and I noticed the red had spread until only a hint of blue remained. You will give me dignity. I nodded. Anyone cursed by a craven's bite did not die in their beds quietly and as peacefully as possible. They were not afforded that kindness or sympathy. Instead, they were generally dragged to the town square to be burned alive in front of a mass of citizens. It didn't matter that most became cursed either protecting those who cheered their horrific demise or working to better the kingdom. Marlowe's gaze shifted to the closed door behind me. She's, she's a good woman. She said, you're a good man. Those eerie eyes tracked back to me. I won't be a, his upper lip curled, revealing one deadly sharp tooth. I won't be a good man much longer. No, you won't be. I, I tried to do it myself, but it's okay. Slowly, I pulled the dagger out from under my cloak. The glow of the nearby candle glittered off the deep red blade. Marlowe eyed the dagger. Bloodstone. Before any signs of the curse, a mortal could be killed in any number of ways. But once there were signs, only fire and bloodstone could kill the cursed. Only bloodstone or wood sharpened into a stake from the blood forest could kill a fully turned craven. I just... I just wanted to say goodbye, he shuddered. That was all. I understand, I told him, even though I wished he hadn't returned here. But I didn't have to agree with his actions to understand them. His pain was starting to return, rising in sharp pulses, and then ebbing. Are you ready, Marlo? His gaze shifted to the closed door once more, and then his eyes closed. He nodded, chest heavy, and unsure if it was my grief or his that weighed me down. I shifted ever so slightly. There were two ways to kill a craven, or someone cursed, as long as you had a bloodstone blade or wood from a blood forest tree. Penetrate the heart or destroy the brain. The former wasn't immediate. It could take minutes to bleed out, and it was painful and messy. Placing my left hand against his too cold cheek, I leaned over him. I wasn't, I wasn't the only one, he whispered. My heart stopped. What? Ridley, he was, he was bitten too. 
a wheezing breath left him. He wanted to say goodbye to his father. I don't know if he took care of himself or not. If this Ridley had waited until the curse began to show signs, there was no way he would have been able to do it. Whatever was in the blood of the craven, of an Atlantean, triggered some sort of primal survival instinct. Gods, where does his father live? Two blocks over, third home, blue, I think blue shutters, but Ridley, he lives in the dorms with the others. Good gods, this could be bad. You've done the right thing, I told him wishing he'd done it sooner. Thank you. Marlowe grimaced, and his eyes opened once more. There was no more blue. He was close. Seconds. I don't have- I struck, as fast as the black vipers that hid in the valleys that led to the temples. The tip of the dagger sank into the soft spot at the base of his skull. Angled frontward and between the vertebrae, the blade piercing deep, severing the brainstem. Marlowe jerked. That was all. He'd taken his last breath before he even knew it. Death was as instantaneous as it could be. I eased the blade out as I rose from the bed. Marlowe's eyes were closed. That, that was one small blessing. Agnes could not see how close he'd come to turning into a nightmare. May rain escort you to paradise. I whispered, wiping the blood from my dagger on a small towel that had been draped over the end table. And may you find eternal peace with those who have passed before you. Turning from the bed, I sheathed the dagger and then replaced my mask and lifted my hood, tugging it over my head. Ridley. I started for the door. If Ridley were still alive, he had to be within minutes of turning. It was nighttime, and if he was in that dorm where others who were off duty slept, I shuddered. No matter how well trained they were, they were as vulnerable as anyone else while asleep. Concern for a certain guard from the rise surfaced, and fear pierced my chest and stomach. A massacre could be minutes away from happening. Worse yet, the curse would spread, and I, more than anyone, knew how quickly it could ravage a city until nothing but blood pooled in the streets. Chapter 5 We left Agnes in the bedroom, her husband's limp hand pressed to her chest, as she carefully brushed his hair back from his face. It was an image I wouldn't forget for a very long time. But I couldn't dwell on it then. I'd learned from Victor that there was a daughter, but luckily she was staying with friends, having been told that her father was ill. Victor saw no reason not to believe Agnes. I was relieved to know that my worst fear hadn't come true, that the child hadn't also been cursed. Once someone had been cursed, a bite from them would pass on the curse. And even though Marlowe hadn't fully turned, he would have been prone to uncontrollable rages and thirst from the moment he'd been bitten. But now, I stood outside another tiny home, in the shadows of the narrow, dirt-packed alley, listening to another tragedy. The moment I'd shared with Victor what Marlowe had told me, we'd gone straight for the father's house, since it was closer than the dorms. I was beyond glad I couldn't see the man because I could hear the heartbreak in his voice as he told Victor what had happened, and the ache in my head was now throbbing. If I saw the poor father, I would have wanted to somehow ease his pain. The man knew precisely why Victor was there when he asked if he'd seen his son. Ridley hadn't been able to take care of himself. However, his father had. He'd shown Victor where he'd buried Ridley in the backyard, under a pear tree. He'd ended his son's life the day before. I was still thinking about that, as Victor and I left the lower ward, using the heavily wooded area outside the citadel to avoid any city guards. Many years ago, animals such as deer and wild boar had been plentiful in Wisher's Grove. 
But only the smallest critters and large predatory birds remained after years of hunting. The grove now served more or less as a border between the haves and have-nots. The thick tree line, all but erasing the cramped living arrangements for the vast majority of Macedonia, from those who lived in homes triple the size of the one Agnes now mourned in. A part of the grove, closer to the center of the city, had been cleared, creating a park, where fairs and celebrations were held. People often rode their horses, sold goods, and picnicked on warmer days. The grove ran right into the inner walls of Castle Tierman, literally. Very few traveled the grove, believing it to be haunted by any who died there. Or were they haunted by the spirits of guards? Or was it the spirits of haunted animals that roamed between the trees? I wasn't sure. There were so many different versions. Either way, it worked for us because we could easily slip out of the Queen's Gardens and into the grove without being seen, as long as we kept an eye on the patrolling guards. From the grove, one could go anywhere. We need to discuss what happened in that house, Victor announced, as we navigated the forest floor with only a sliver of moonlight to guide us. People have been talking about you. I knew this was coming. And you using your gift back there didn't help matters, he added, keeping his voice low, even though it was unlikely we'd be overheard by anything other than a raccoon or an opossum. You all but confirmed who you were. If people are talking, they haven't said anything, I replied. And I had to do something. That woman's pain was, it was unbearable for her. She needed a break. And it became unbearable for you, too? He surmised. When I didn't say anything, he added, Your head hurts now. It's nothing, I dismissed. Nothing? He growled. I understand why you want to help. I respect that. But it's a risk, Poppy. No one has said anything yet. Maybe they feel indebted to you. But that could change and you need to be more careful. I am careful, I said, even though I couldn't see his expression as he too had lifted his hood to cover his face. I knew he sent me a look of disbelief. I grinned, but it quickly faded. I know what the risks are, and you're prepared to face the consequences if the Duke ever discovers what you're doing, he challenged. My stomach dipped as I toyed with a loose thread from my cloak. I am. Victor cursed under his breath. In any other situation, I would have giggled. You're as brave as any guard on the rise. Taking that as a huge compliment, I smiled. Well, thank you. And just as foolish as any new recruit. My smile turned upside down. I take my thank you back. I never should have allowed you to begin doing this. He caught a low-hanging branch, moving it aside. You going out among the people poses too much of a risk of discovery. Dipping under the branch, I looked back at him. You didn't allow me, I reminded him. You just couldn't stop me. He stopped, catching my arm and turning me so I faced him. I understand why you want to help. You couldn't when your mother and father lay dying. I flinched. It has nothing to do with them. That's not true and you know it. You're trying to make up for what you were unable to do as a child. His voice dropped so low, I could barely hear him over the breeze stirring the leaves above us. But it's more than that. And what is it? I think you want to be caught. What? You really think that? I took a step back, pulling free of his hold. You know what the Duke would do if he ever found out? Trust me, I know. It's not likely I'll forget any of those times I had to help you walk back to your room. His voice hardened, and heat blasted my cheeks. I hated that. Hated the way I felt for something someone had done to me absolutely hated 
the heavy shame that threatened to choke me. You take too many risks, Poppy. Even knowing it's not just the Duke or even the Queen you'd have to answer to, he continued. Sometimes I wonder if you want to be found unworthy. Irritation flared to life, and there was a part of me that recognized it was because Victor was scraping at old wounds and getting too close to a hidden truth I didn't want to delve into and uncover. Whether I'm caught or not, wouldn't the gods already know what I do? There would be no reason for me to take additional risks when nothing is hidden from them. There's no reason for you to take any risks at all. Then why have you spent the last five or so years training me? I demanded, because I know why you need to feel like you can defend yourself. He shot back. After what you suffered, what you have to live with, I can understand the need to take your protection into your own hands. But if I had known that it would lead to you putting yourself in situations where you risked exposure, I never would have trained you. Well, it's too late for that change of heart. That it is, he sighed, and way to avoid what I just said. Avoid what? I asked, pretending ignorance. You know exactly what I'm talking about. Shaking my head, I turned and started walking. I don't help those people because I want the gods to find me unworthy. I didn't help Agnes because I hoped she would tell someone and it would get out. I help them because it's already a tragedy that doesn't need to be compounded upon by being forced to watch their loved ones be burned to death. I stepped over a fallen tree limb my headache worsening. However, it had nothing to do with my gift and everything to do with the conversation. Sorry to ruin your theory, but I'm not a sadist. No, he said from behind me. You're not. You're just afraid. Whipping around, I gaped at him. Afraid? Of your ascension. Yes, you're afraid. There's no shame in admitting that. He came forward, stopping in front of me. At least not to me. But to others, like my guardians or the priests, it wouldn't be something I could ever admit. They would see that fear as being sacrilegious, as if the only reason I'd have to be afraid would be due to something horrible and not the fact that I had no idea what would happen to me upon my ascension if I were to live or die. I closed my eyes. I understand, Victor repeated. You have no idea what will happen. I get it, I do. But Poppy, whether you take these unnecessary risks on purpose or not, regardless of if you're afraid or not, the end result will not change. All you will do is incur the Duke's wrath, that is all. I opened my eyes and saw nothing but darkness. Because no matter what you do, you are not going to be found unworthy, Victor said. You will ascend. Victor's words kept me up for most of the night, and I ended up skipping our normal morning training session held in one of the old rooms in the all but abandoned part of the castle. Unsurprisingly, Victor hadn't knocked on the old servant's door. If that wasn't evidence enough of how well he knew me, I don't know what would be. I wasn't mad at him. Honestly, I could be annoyed and irritated with him every other day, but I was never mad at him. I didn't think he felt that I was. He just, he'd hit a raw nerve last night, and he was aware of that. I was afraid of my ascension. I knew that. Victor knew that. Who wouldn't be? Although Tawny believed that I would return as an ascended, no one could be sure. Ian wasn't like me. There'd been no rules imposed on him when we'd been in the capital or while we grew up here. He'd ascended because he was the brother of the maiden, the chosen, and because the queen had petitioned for the exception. So, Yes, 
I was afraid. But was I purposely pushing the envelope and happy dancing over the line in hopes of being found unworthy and stripped of my status? That was, that would be incredibly irrational. I could be quite irrational. Like when I saw a spider. I behaved as if it were the size of a horse with the cold calculation of an assassin. That was irrational. But being found unworthy meant exile, and that was also a death sentence. If I were afraid of dying upon ascension, then getting myself exiled didn't exactly improve the situation. And I was afraid of dying, but my wariness of the ascension was more than that. It wasn't my choice. I had been born into this in the same way that all the second sons and daughters were, even though none of them seemed to dread their future. It wasn't their choice either. I hadn't been lying or trying to cover up a hidden agenda when I helped Agnes or exposed myself to Marlowe. I did that because I could, because it was my choice. I trained to use a sword and bow because it was my choice. Was there another motive behind sneaking off to watch fights or swimming naked, visiting gambling dens or lurking in parts of the castle forbidden to me and listening in on conversations that I wasn't supposed to hear? Or when I had left my chambers without Victor or Rylan just so I could spy on the balls held in the great hall and people watch in Wisher's Grove? What about the Red Pearl? Letting Hawk kiss me, touch me, All of those things that I'd done, I did because they were my choice. But but could it also be what Victor had suggested? What if, deep down, I wasn't just trying to live and experience everything I could before my ascension? What if I was, on some kind of unconscious level, trying to ensure that the ascension never happened? These thoughts troubled me throughout the day, and for once, I wasn't all that restless in my confinement, at least not until the sun began to set. Having dismissed Tawny hours before supper, since there was no reason for her to sit around while I did nothing but morosely stare out the windows, I finally got annoyed with myself and yanked open the door, only to find Rylan lounging across the hall. I drew up short. Going somewhere, Pen? He asked. Pen. Rylan was the only one who called me that. I liked it. I let go of the door, and it slowly inched back, bumping my shoulder. I don't know. He grinned at me as he ran a hand over his light brown hair. It's time, isn't it? Glancing behind me to the windows, I saw that it was dusk. Surprise flickered through me. I'd wasted an entire day in self-reflection. Priestess Anna Leah would be thrilled to hear that, but not the reasons. Either way, I wanted to punch myself in the face. But it was time. I nodded and started to step out. I think you're forgetting something, he said, tapping a finger to his bearded cheek. My veil. Good gods, I'd almost walked out into the hall without it or a hood. Other than my guardians, the Duke and Duchess, And Tawny, only Victor and Rylan were allowed to see me without my veil. Well, the king and queen could, and Ian was permitted, but obviously they weren't here. If anyone else had been in the hall, they would have possibly fallen over in a dead faint. I'll be right back. His grin increased as I whipped around and hurried back into the room, slipping the veil over my head. It took a little more than a couple of minutes to clasp all the little chains so it was secured in place. Tawny was so much faster at it than I was. I started back out. Shoes, Pen. You should put some shoes on. Looking down at myself, I let out a very unladylike groan. Gods. One moment. Rylan chuckled. Totally scatterbrained, I towed on my well-worn shoes, which were nothing more than satin and a thin leather sole, then reopened the door. Having a bad day, Rylan mused as he joined me in my room. Having a weird day, I countered, heading for the old servant's access. A forgetful one, it must be for you to not realize the time. 
Ryland was right. Unless something was going on, both he and Victor were always ready for me just before dusk. Our pace was quick as we hurried down the narrow, dusty staircase. It emptied out into an area beside the kitchen, and while we took the old access to avoid being seen as much as possible, it wasn't completely avoidable. Kitchen servants stopped mid-step as Rylan and I passed them, their brown garb and white caps making them nearly indistinguishable from one another. I heard a basket of potatoes hit the floor and the harsh, biting reprimand. Out of the corner of my eye, I saw blurred faces bow their heads as if they were praying. I swallowed a groan while Rylan did what he always did and pretended that there was nothing off about their behavior. You're the child of the gods. Agnes's words came back to me. The only reason they thought that was because of the veil and the paintings and various artworks representing the maiden. That, and how often it was that they didn't see me. We started toward the banquet hall. From there, we could enter the foyer and be able to access the queen's garden. There'd be more servants, but there really wasn't any other way to access it from within the castle that didn't require scaling a wall. We made it halfway past the long table when one of the many doors on either side opened behind us. Maiden! A wave of goosebumps spread over my skin in revulsion. I recognized that voice, and I wanted to keep walking, to pretend I'd suddenly lost my hearing. But Rylan had stopped. If I kept walking, it wouldn't end well for me. Inhaling deeply, I turned to face Lord Brandol Mazine. I didn't see what I was sure most saw. A dark-haired man who appeared to be in his mid-twenties, handsome and tall. I saw a bully. I saw a cruel man who had long ago forgotten what it was like to be mortal. Unlike with the Duke, who seemed to despise me without cause, I knew precisely why Lord Mazine found such glee in harassing me. Ian. And it all stemmed from the vainest, most inconsequential thing possible. A year before my brother ascended, he'd bested Lord Mazine at a game of cards to which the Lord had ungraciously accused Ian of cheating. I, who probably shouldn't have even been present for the game, had laughed, mainly because the Lord was utterly terrible at poker. From that moment on, the Lord had sought to irritate both Ian and me whenever he got the chance. It only got worse once Ian ascended, and the Lord began to assist the Duke with his lessons. Clasping my hands together, I said nothing as he strode toward me, his long legs encased in black breeches. He wore a black dress shirt, and the darkness of his clothing created a striking contrast against his pale skin and lips the color of ripe berries. His eyes, I didn't like to look into them. They seemed fathomless and empty. Like all ascended, they were such a dark black that the pupils weren't visible. I wondered what his eye color had been before he ascended, or if he even remembered. The Lord may only appear to be in his second decade of life, but I knew he'd ascended after the War of Two Kings, along with the Duke and Duchess. He was hundreds of years old. Lord Mazine gave a tight, close-lipped smile when I didn't respond. I'm surprised to see you here. She's taking her evening walk. Rylan replied, tone flat, as she is allowed. Eyes like shards of obsidian narrowed on the guard. I didn't ask the question of you. I'm taking my walk, I stepped in, answering before Rylan said another word. That unnerving, fathomless gaze shifted to me. You're going to walk in the garden. One side of his lips quirked when surprise flickered through me. Isn't that where you always go at this time of day? I did. And it was more than a little disconcerting that the Lord was aware of that. I nodded. She must be on her way now, Rylan interjected. As you know, the maiden must not linger. In other words, I wasn't allowed to interact, not even with the ascended. The Lord knew that. 
but he disregarded it. The maiden also must be respectful. I wish to speak with her, and I'm sure the duke would be most disappointed to learn that she was unwilling to do so. My spine straightened as a wave of anger swept through me so swiftly, I almost reached for the dagger strapped to my thigh. The reaction shocked me in a way. What would I have done with it if I hadn't stopped? Stabbed him? I almost laughed. But none of this was funny. His thinly veiled threat of speaking to the Duke had been effective. The Lord had backed both Rylan and me into a corner, because even though I was not supposed to interact, the Duke didn't hold Lord Mazine to the same rules as others. If I walked away, I would be punished. So would Rylan. And while my punishment wasn't something to take lightly, it would be nothing compared to what Rylan would face. He could be removed from the royal guard, and the duke would ensure that it was known that he had fallen out of the duke's favor. Rylan would soon be unemployed and therefore dishonored. It wouldn't be the same as being exiled, but his life would become measurably more difficult. I squared my shoulders. I would love nothing more than to speak with you. A look of smugness settled on his handsome features, and I wanted nothing more than to kick him in the face. Come. He reached out, curling his arm over my shoulders. I wish to speak in private. Rylan stepped forward. It's okay, I told him, although it really wasn't. Looking over at him, I willed him to listen. Truly, it's fine. Ryland's jaw hardened as he stared at the Lord, and I could tell he wasn't remotely happy about this, but he nodded curtly. I'll be right here. Yes, you will, the Lord replied. Gods. Not all ascended were like the Lord, who wielded his power and station like a poison-tipped sword, but Lord Mazine wasn't even the worst example. He steered me to the left nearly causing a servant to drop the basket she carried. He seemed completely unaware of her as he strode forward. Whatever hope I had that he'd planned to speak to me a few steps away ended quickly as he took us into one of the shadowy alcoves between the doors. I should have known. He swept aside thick white curtains and all but pulled me into the narrow space where the only source of light was a small sconce above a thickly cushioned chaise. I had no idea what the purpose of these half-hidden rooms was, but on more than one occasion, I'd found myself trapped in them. I stepped back, a little surprised that the Lord allowed it. He watched me the smirk returning as I positioned myself so I was close to one of the curtains. He sat on the chaise, stretching out his legs as he folded his arms across his chest. Heart thumping, I chose my words carefully. I really cannot linger. If someone were to see me, I would be in trouble with Priestess Analia. And what would happen if the good priestess of the temples were to hear you were lingering? he asked, his body appearing loose and relaxed. But I knew better. Appearances could be deceiving. The ascended were fast when they wanted to be. I'd seen them move in a manner that made them nothing more than a blur. Would she report such misbehavior to the Duke? He continued. I do so enjoy his lessons. Disgust was a weed taking root inside me. Of course he enjoyed the Duke's lessons. I'm not sure what she would do. It might be worth discovering, he mused idly, at least for me. My fingers curled inward. I don't wish to displease the Duke or the priestess. His lashes lowered. I'm sure you would not. A sharp, stinging pain radiated out from where my nails dug into my palms. What is it that you wish to speak to me about? You didn't ask your question appropriately. Searching for restraint and calm, I was grateful for the veil. If he could see my face in its entirety, he'd know exactly what I was feeling.
which was red, hot, burning hatred. I didn't know why the Lord found such great entertainment in harassing me, why he found such enjoyment in making me uncomfortable. But he had been this way the last several years. He was worse toward the servants, though. I'd heard the whispered warnings to new staff. Avoid gaining his attention or his displeasure. No matter what, there was a limit to how far he could go with me. With the servants, I didn't believe he felt there was even a line to cross. I lifted my chin. What would you like to discuss with me, Lord Mazine? A hint of a cold smile appeared. I realized it had been a while since I last saw you. It had been 16 days since he'd last cornered me, so not long enough. I've missed you, he added. Doubtful. My lord, I must be on my way. I sucked in a sharp breath as he rose. One second he was stretched out on the chaise, the next he was directly in front of me. I'm insulted, he said. I told you I missed you. And your only response was to say you must leave? You wound me. The fact that he'd said nearly the same words Hawk had uttered no more than two nights ago didn't go unnoticed. Neither did the vastly different reactions I had to them. While Hawk had come across teasing, Lord Mazine spoke the words as a warning. I wasn't charmed. I was revolted. It wasn't my intention, I forced out. You sure? He asked, and I felt his finger against my jaw before I even saw him move his hand. I have the distinct impression that was exactly your intent. It wasn't, I leaned back. He curled his fingers around my chin, holding my head in place. When I took my next breath, I thought his fingers smelled like a flower. Musky and sweet. You should try to be more convincing if you wish me to believe that. I'm sorry if I was not as convincing as I should be. It took great effort to keep my voice steady. You shouldn't be touching me. He smirked as he trailed his cool thumb along my lower lip. The sensation of thousands of tiny insects skittering over my skin followed. And why is that? The Lord knew exactly why. I'm the maiden, I said, nonetheless. That you are. He trailed his fingers down my chin over the scratchy lace that covered my throat. His hand continued, brushing over my collarbone. My palm practically burned with the need to feel the hilt of the dagger against it and my muscles tensed with the knowledge and skill to react, to make him stop. A tremor coursed through me as I fought the desire to fight back. It wouldn't be worth what would happen. I kept telling myself that as his fingers slid down the center of my gown. It wasn't just the fear of punishment. If I showed what I was capable of, the duke would learn that I had been trained, and I doubted it would take any large leap of logic to determine that Victor was responsible. Yet again, whatever I faced would be nothing compared to what Victor would. But I could only tolerate so much. I took a step back, putting distance between us. Lord Mazine tilted his head and then chuckled softly. Instinct sparked and I moved to step out from the curtain. But I hadn't been fast enough. He caught me by the hip and turned me. There wasn't even a second to react as his arm clamped around my waist, and he hauled me back against him. His other hand remained where it was, between my breasts. The contact of his body against mine, the feel of it, sent a wave of revulsion through me. Do you remember your last lesson? His breath was icy against my skin, just below the veil. I can't imagine you've forgotten. I hadn't forgotten a single one. You didn't make a sound, and I know it had to hurt. His grip tightened on my waist, 
and even in my all too limited knowledge of things, I knew what I felt against me. Admittedly, you've impressed. Thrilled to hear that, I gritted out. Ah, there it is, he murmured. There's that tone, unbecoming of the maiden, the very same one that has gotten you into trouble a time or two, or a dozen. I was wondering when it would make an appearance. I'm sure you also remember what happened the last time it came out. Of course I remembered that too. My temper had gotten the best of me. I'd snapped back at the Duke, and he'd struck me hard enough that I'd lost consciousness. I came to only to feel like I'd been run over by a horse, and finding the Duke and the Lord sprawled out on the settee, both appearing to have drunk a bottle's worth of whiskey while I lay on the floor. For days I'd felt like I'd come down with the flu. I imagine I had a bit of a concussion. Still, seeing the shock widen the Duke's otherwise emotionless gaze had been worth it. Perhaps I will go to the Duke myself, he mused. Tell him how disrespectful you've been. Fury boiled my blood as I stared at the gray stones of the wall. Let me go, Lord Messine. You didn't ask nicely enough. His hips pressed against me, and my skin flushed with rage. You didn't say please. There would be no way I'd say please. Consequences be damned, I'd had enough. I was not his toy. I was the maiden. And while he was incredibly faster and stronger, I knew I could hurt him. I had the element of surprise on my side, and my legs were free. I widened my stance as I felt something damp and wet against my jaw. A scream tore through the alcove, startling the Lord enough that he loosened his hold. I tore free and spun to face him, my chest heaving as I slipped my hand through the slit in my gown to the hilt of the dagger. The Lord muttered something under his breath as the screams came again, high-pitched and full of terror. Taking advantage of the distraction, I darted out from behind the curtain, instead of unsheathing the dagger and slicing off what I was sure was the Lord's most prized possession. The Lord threw aside the curtains as he stormed out. But the screams were bringing others rushing into the banquet hall. Servants, royal guards. There was nothing more Lord Mazine could do now. Through the veil, my gaze met his. I knew it. His nostrils flared. He knew it. The screams came again, ringing out from one of the nearby rooms, drawing my attention. Two doors down, the door was open. Rylan was at my side. Pen. I skirted his reach and headed toward the sound. What happened in the alcove with the Lord fell to the wayside as my fingers curled around the handle of my dagger. Screams were never a good sign. A woman rushed out, the servant who'd been carrying the basket. Her face leached of all color as her hand opened and closed against her throat. She backed away, shaking her head. I reached the room at the same time Ryland did and looked inside. I saw her immediately. She was lying on an ivory-colored settee. Her pale blue gown wrinkled and bunched around her waist. One arm dangled limply off the side, her skin the shade of chalk. I didn't have to open my senses to know she felt no pain. That she'd never feel anything again. I lifted my gaze. Her neck rested against a pillow, neck twisted at an unnatural angle, and you shouldn't see this. Rylan grabbed me, and this time I didn't move out of his reach. I didn't stop him as he turned me away. But I already saw. I saw the deep puncture wounds. Chapter Six Rylan promptly escorted me back to my room while Lord Mazine stood in the doorway, flanked by several others. 
his gaze fixed on the dead girl. I wanted to push him aside and close the door. Even if it weren't for the state of her undress, with so much flesh exposed, it was a lack of dignity tossed aside for morbid curiosity. She was a person. And while what was left behind was nothing more than a shell, she was someone's daughter, sister, friend. More than anything else, people would talk about how she was found, with the skirt of her gown shoved up and the bodice gathered at the waist. No one else needed to bear witness. I hadn't been given a chance, though. And now Castle Tierman was on virtual lockdown as each and every space in the hundred plus rooms was searched for either the culprit or more victims. Pacing in front of the fireplace, Tawny worried the tiny pearl buttons of her bodice. It was a craven, she said, the deep violet gown swishing about her legs. It had to be a craven. I glanced over at Rylan, who leaned against the wall, arms crossed. Normally, he didn't stay inside my room, but tonight was different. Victor was assisting with the search, but I imagine he'd be back soon. With my veil removed, Ryland's gaze met mine. He'd seen that girl. Do you think it was a craven? Ryland said nothing. What else could it have been? Tawny turned to where I sat in the chair. You said yourself she was bit. I said it looked like a bite, but it, it didn't look like a craven bite, I told her. I know you've seen what a craven can do. She sat across from me, her fingers still twisting the pearl, just as Agnes had done to the button on her blouse. But how can you be sure? The craven have four elongated canines, I explained, and she nodded. This was common knowledge. But she only had two marks, as if, as if two sharp fangs had penetrated her throat. Rylan finished. Tawny's head whipped in his direction. What if it was accursed? Someone who hadn't fully turned yet, she asked. Then it would look like either normal teeth marks or a bite from a craven. Rylan answered, shaking his head as he stared out the window toward the rise. I've never seen anything like that. I had to agree with him. She, she was pale, and it wasn't just the shroud of death. It was like she had no blood in her, and even if it were a two-fanged craven, my nose scrunched. It would have been messier, not so precise. She looked like, looked like what? My gaze dropped to my hands as the image of the woman reappeared. She'd been with someone, willing or not, and as far as I knew, Craven weren't interested in anything but blood. It just looked like someone had been in that room with her. Tawny sat back. If it wasn't a Craven, then who would do something like that? There were many people in and out of the castle. Servants, guards, visitors, the ascended. But that didn't make sense either. That wound appeared to be right over her jugular. There should have been blood everywhere. And I didn't even see a drop of it. That, that is more than just a little strange. I nodded, and her neck was clearly broken. I know of no craven that would do that. Tawny folded her arms around herself. And I don't want to know of any person capable of that. Neither did I. But we all knew that people were capable of all manner of atrocities. And so were the ascended. After all, they too had been mortal at one time. And the capacity for cruelty seemed to be one of the few traits some carried over. My thoughts wandered to Lord Mazine. He was cruel a bully, and based on our latest interaction, I suspected that he could be much worse. But was he capable of what was done? I shuddered. Even if he were, why would he do it, and how? I didn't have an answer for that. There was only one thing I could think of, 
that could do that. But it seemed too unreal to believe. Did you, did you recognize her? Tawny asked softly. I didn't, but I have to think she was a lady in wait, or perhaps a visitor based on her gown, I told her. Tawny nodded silently, returning to twisting the pearl on her bodice. Silence crept into the space, and Victor arrived not long after, stepping into the room to speak quietly to Rylan. I scooted to the edge of my seat when he stepped away from Rylan, sighing as he sat on the edge of the chest that rested at the foot of my bed. Every inch of this castle was searched, and we found no other victims or craven, he said, leaning forward. Commander Jansen believes the grounds are safe. He paused, squinting as he lifted his gaze. Relatively speaking, that is. Did you, did you see her? I asked, and he nodded. Do you think it was a craven attack? I've never seen anything like that, he replied, repeating what Rylan had said. What would that even mean? I don't know he stated, rubbing his hand against his forehead. My attention zeroed in on him, noting how he massaged the skin above his brow and how he'd squinted when he looked to where we sat near the oil lamps. Sometimes Victor got headaches, not like the ones I got after opening up my senses or using my gifts too much, but far more severe, where light and sound made him nauseous and his head pulse. I opened up my senses and immediately felt the sharp, pounding ache behind my eyes. I quickly severed the connection, and it was like visualizing a cord connecting me to him being snipped in two. The last thing I wanted was to end up with another throbbing headache keeping me up. If it wasn't a craven, then are there any suspects? Tawny asked. The Duke believes it was the work of a dissenter. What? I demanded as I rose. Here? In the castle? Tawny cried. That is what he believes. Victor lifted his head as I walked over to him, his gaze wary. And what do you believe? Rylan asked from where he still stood by the door. Because I'm unsure how a dissenter could have managed to inflict wounds like that without leaving blood. Agreed, Victor murmured, watching me. There would be no way to clean something like that up, especially not when the victim had been seen less than an hour before. So why would the Duke insist it was a dissenter? Tawny queried. He's not unintelligent. He would have to realize that, too. I casually placed my hand on the back of Victor's neck as I reached for a small fur quilt. His skin was warm and dry as I thought of the beaches and my mother's laugh. I knew his pain was eased the moment he took a deep, shuddering breath. I'm unsure why the Duke believes this, but he must have his reasons. Victor's gaze was grateful as I slipped my hand away and walked back to the chair, placing the throw in my lap. Tawny looked over at me and then took a deep breath before she refocused on Victor. Do you know who she was? Sitting straight, he was definitely more clear-eyed when he spoke again. She was identified by one of the servants. The victim's name was Malessa Axton. The name was unfamiliar to me, but Tawny whispered, Oh. I twisted toward her. Did you know her? Not well. I know of her. She gave a small shake of her head, sending several curls free from her twist. I think she came to court around the same time as I did, but she was often with one of the ladies who lives on Radiant Row. I think it's Lady Isherwood, she added. Radiant Row was the nickname given to the row of homes closest to the castle and to Wishers Grove Park. Many of the opulent homes were owned by the Ascended. She was so young, Tawny lowered her hand to her lap, and she had so much to look forward to. 
I reached out with my senses and found that her sadness echoed my own. It wasn't the deep pain of loss that came when it was someone you knew, but the sorrow that accompanied any death, especially such a senseless one. Rylan asked Victor to step outside. After a few moments, Tawny excused herself to return to her room. I managed to stop myself from touching her. I knew if I did, I would take her pain, even though I'd done it before without her realizing. I ended up at the window, staring at the steady glow of the torches beyond the rise, when Victor re-entered. Thank you, he said, as he joined me by the window. The ache in my head was starting to get the best of me. Glad I could help. You didn't have to. I have the powder the healer made for me. I know. But I'm sure my gift brought you much faster relief without the dizziness and sleepiness, I said. Those were only two of the many side effects that brownish-white powder often caused. That's true. Victor fell silent for several moments, and I knew his thoughts were as troubled as mine. I had a hard time believing that it had been a dissenter, even though I imagined something like an ice pick could have made those wounds. However, the possibility of stabbing someone in the jugular and not getting blood everywhere seemed very unlikely. But even more baffling was the motive. What did creating those types of wounds indicate that was of any benefit to their cause? Because the only thing I knew that could make those kinds of wounds went against everything the dissenters believed in. Ryland spoke to me. I looked over at Victor with raised brows. Yes? His sea-colored gaze flickered over my face. Ryland told me about Lord Mazine. My stomach sank as I looked away. It wasn't as if I had forgotten my run-in with the Lord, but it simply wasn't the most concerning or traumatic thing to have happened in the last couple of hours. Did he do anything, Poppy? He asked. A suffocating, stinging heat crept into my face, and I pressed my cheek to the window pane. I didn't want to talk about this. I never did. Nausea churned, and there was this weird embarrassment that made my skin feel sticky and dirty. I didn't understand why I felt that way. I knew I'd done nothing to gain the Lord's attention, and even if I had, he was still in the wrong. But when I thought about how he felt entitled to touch me, I wanted to scratch at my own skin. And I didn't want to think about how I'd been grateful for the servant's screams, having no idea what the cause had been. I pushed all of that aside so it could later come to the forefront, most likely when I was trying to sleep. He did nothing other than be an annoyance. Truthfully? I nodded, although that seemed a little too far from the truth. But I was okay with lying. What could Victor do with the truth? Nothing. He was smart enough to know that. A muscle throbbed in his jaw. He needs to leave you alone. Agreed. But I'm able to handle him. Kind of. I didn't really want to think about how close I came to doing something utterly unforgivable. If I had unsheathed my dagger and used it, there would have been no hope for me. But gods, I wouldn't have felt a drop of guilt over it. You shouldn't have to, Victor replied, and he should know better. He should, and I think he does, but I don't believe he cares, I admitted, turning so I rested against the ledge of the window. You know, I saw her in that room. I saw how she was left. It made me think that she was with someone, either willingly or not. He nodded. The healer who looked at her body believed there had been some level of physical relations before her death, but he didn't find any signs that she'd been fighting. No dried blood or skin under her nails. But no one can be sure. I pressed my lips together. 
I was thinking that it wouldn't make sense for a dissenter to leave wounds like that, even if they were able to do it without being messy. What kind of message does that even send? Because the only thing that can do what was done to her, Victor's gaze met mine, an Atlantean. Relieved that he said it and not me, I nodded. The Duke has to know that. Anyone who saw those wounds would have to think that and question why a dissenter would mimic something that could easily be attributed to an Atlantean. That's why I don't think it was a dissenter, he said, and pressure clamped down on my chest. I think it was an Atlantean. A dissenter moving freely through Castle Tierman was concerning, but the possibility of an Atlantean being able to gain access without anyone being the wiser was something truly terrifying. I wanted to find something that would provide some sort of evidence that Victor and I were being paranoid. So at the crack of dawn, when the castle was at its quietest and Ryland guarded the room outside, I snuck down to the main floor and passed the eerily quiet kitchen. Once the sun rose, I didn't have to worry about running into Lord Mazine or any ascended. Entering the banquet hall, I headed to the left, to the second door, where I often meet with Priestess Analia for my weekly lessons. As I stepped inside, I glanced across the dimly lit hall to the room where Malessa had been found. The door was closed. Tearing my gaze from it, I quietly shut the door and hurried over to the bare wooden chair, spying the book I never foresaw myself reading on my own volition mainly because it seemed as if I'd read The History of the War of Two Kings and the Kingdom of Solus about a million times. I carried it over to the lone window and quickly cracked it open, holding it in the faint beam of sunlight. I carefully thumbed through the thin pages, knowing if I were to tear one, Priestess Analia would be most displeased. I found the section I was looking for, it was only a handful of paragraphs that described what Atlanteans looked like, their traits, and what they were capable of. Unfortunately, all it did was confirm what I already knew. I'd never actually seen an Atlantean. At least, I didn't think I had. And that was the problem. Atlanteans looked like mortals. Even the extinct Wolven, who had once lived alongside the Atlanteans in Atlantia, could easily be mistaken for mortals, even though they had never been. The Atlanteans' ability to blend in with the populace they were known to subjugate and hunt made them deadly, expert predators. One could walk right past me, and I wouldn't know. Neither would the Ascended. For some reason, the gods hadn't taken any of that into consideration when they initiated the blessing. Scanning the paragraphs, one word stood out, causing my stomach to dip. Fangs. Although I knew what it would say, I read the sentences anyway. Between year 19 and 21, those of blooded Atlantean descent leave the vulnerable state of immaturity, wherein the ill spirits in their blood become active. Noted during this period is a disturbing increase in strength and the ability to recover from most mortal wounds as they continue to mature. It is also to be noted that before the War of Two Kings and the extinction of the Wolven, a bonding ritual was performed between an Atlantean of a certain class and a Wolven. Not much is known about this bond, but it is believed that the Wolven in question was duty-bound to protect the Atlantean. For a true Atlantean, two upper canines will form fangs, becoming elongated and sharpened, but they will not be overly noticeable to the untrained eye. I thought of the two puncture wounds on Melissa's neck. An Atlantean's fangs may not be as overgrown and noticeable as a craven's, but the Duke could order the mouths of everyone in the castle to be checked. Admittedly, that would be invasive. I kept reading. 
Upon the appearance of fangs, the next phase of their maturity begins, wherein they begin to thirst. As long as their unnatural demands are met, their aging slows dramatically. It is believed that a year to mortals is equivalent to three decades to an Atlantean. The oldest known Atlantean was Cillian de Lohan, who saw 2,702 calendar years before his death. Meaning that an Atlantean could appear to be in their twenties, but in reality, they would be over a hundred years old, possibly even closer to two hundred or more. But they still aged, unlike the ascended, those blessed by the gods, who stopped at whatever age they were when they received the blessing. Only the oldest of the ascended appeared older than someone in their thirties, and they could live for an eternity. However, both the Atlanteans and Ascended still lived an unfathomable amount of time, the closest thing to immortality, to the gods. I couldn't even fathom living that long. I gave a little shake of my head and kept reading. At this time, the Atlanteans are capable of passing on the ill spirits in their blood to mortals, creating a violent and destructive creature known as a craven who share some of the physical traits of their creators. This curse is passed through a poisonous kiss. A poisonous kiss wasn't referencing two lips coming into contact with one another. The Atlanteans did what the craven did, albeit not as messily. Atlanteans bit and drank the blood of mortals, something they had to do to survive. Their enormous lifespans, strength, and healing abilities all stemmed from feeding off mortals, their primary food source. I shuddered. It had to be an Atlantean that had bit and fed from Melissa, which explained how there was no apparent bloodshed and why she had looked so incredibly pale. What it didn't explain was why the Atlantean had then snapped her neck effectively killing her before the curse could spread. Why wouldn't the Atlantean allow her to turn? Then again, the bite wasn't exactly in a place that could easily be hidden. The bite itself was the warning to all who saw it. An Atlantean was deep within our midst. Closing the book, I carefully placed it back on the stool, thinking about how my ascension would occur on my 19th birthday and how the Atlanteans reached a certain majority around that age. It wasn't exactly surprising. After all, our gods had been their gods at one time. But the gods no longer supported the Atlanteans. Making my way out of the room, I started for the kitchens, when my gaze landed on the room Melissa had been found in. I needed to go back to my chambers before the staff became active. But that wasn't what I did. I crossed the space and went to the door, finding it unlocked when I turned the handle. Before I could really think about what I was doing and where I was, I slipped inside, grateful that the wall sconces cast a soft glow throughout the room. The settee was gone, the space bare. Accent chairs remained, as did the round coffee table, with some sort of floral arrangement neatly placed in the center. I crept forward, unsure of what I was even looking for, and wondering if I'd even know if I found it. Other than the missing furniture, nothing seemed out of place. But the room felt oddly cold, as if a window had been open. But there were no windows on this side of the banquet hall. What had Melissa been doing in here? Reading a book? Or waiting for one of the other ladies in wait? Or perhaps Lady Isherwood? Or had she snuck in here to meet with someone she trusted? Had she been blindsided by the attack? A shiver danced down my spine. I wasn't sure what was worse, being betrayed or blindsided. Actually, I did know. Being betrayed would be worse. I stepped forward, stopping short as I glanced down 
Something was behind the leg of one of the chairs. Bending down, I reached under the chair and picked up the object. My head tilted as I ran a thumb over the smooth, soft white surface. It was a petal. My brows knitted as the scent reached me. Jasmine. For some reason, my stomach roiled, which was odd. I normally liked the smell. Rising, I looked at the vase and found the source. Several white lilies were spaced throughout the arrangement. No jasmine. Frowning, I looked down at the petal. Where did this come from? I shook my head as I walked over to the bouquet, placing the petal in with the rest of the flowers, as I gave the room one last look. There was no blood on the cream carpet, something that would have definitely stained if it had spilled. I had no idea what I was doing. If evidence had been found, it had been removed. And even if it hadn't been, I didn't have experience in this. I just wanted to be able to do something or to find anything that would put our worst fears to rest. But there was nothing to be done or found here other than what was most likely reality. And what did I believe about the truth? That it often could be terrifying, yes, but with truth came power, and I was never one to hide from the truth. I'd made my way back to my room that morning without any issues, and ended up remaining in it the entire day, which wasn't exactly all that different from any other day. Tawny had stopped by briefly until one of the mistresses summoned her. No one was sequestered, but I thought that the attack would at least slow down the preparations for the right. Obviously, that was a silly thought. I doubted the earth shaking would get in the way of the right. I spent a lot of time thinking about what had happened to Melissa. And the more I thought about why the Duke would lie about the attacker being a dissenter, the more it started to make sense. Just like Phillips, the guard from the Rise hadn't wanted to talk about Finley's death to stop panic and fear from taking root and spreading. But it didn't explain why the Duke wasn't being honest with the royal guard. If there was an Atlantean among us, the guards needed to be prepared. Because while the Ascended were powerful and strong, the Atlanteans were too, if not more. Shortly before dusk, Rylan knocked on my door. You want to try for the garden? I thought I would ask. I don't know. I glanced at the windows. You think it will be okay? Rylan nodded. I do. I really could use the fresh air and time away from my own thoughts. It just seemed... I wasn't sure. As if it weren't even 24 hours after Melissa had been killed. Yet it was like any other evening. You don't have to stay in here, Ryland said, and I glanced back at him. Not unless that's what you want to do. What happened last night with the poor girl and with the Lord has nothing to do with what you find joy in. A small smile tugged at my lips. And you're probably tired of standing in the hall, Ryland chuckled. Possibly. I grinned as I stepped back. Let me get my veil. It took only a few minutes for me to don the headdress and become ready. This time, there were no interruptions as we made our way to the garden. However, there were servants who did the stop and stare thing. But as I continued down the path of one of my favorite places on the grounds of the castle, my worries and obsessive thoughts slipped away like they always did. While I was in the sprawling garden, my mind calmed and everything and anything ceased to nibble away at me. I wasn't thinking about Melissa and the Atlantean who'd gained access to the castle. I wasn't haunted by the image of Agnes holding her husband's limp hand, or what had happened in the Red Pearl with Hawk. I wasn't even thinking about the upcoming ascension and what Victor had said. In the Queen's Garden, I was simply present. Instead of being caught up in the past or the future full of what ifs. I wasn't sure why the gardens were called what they were. As far as I knew, it had been a very long time since the Queen had been to Macedonia. But I guessed the Duke and Duchess had named it after her as some sort of homage. 
Never once while I lived with the queen had I seen her step foot in the lush gardens of the palace. I glanced over at Rylan. Normally, the only threat he may face was an unexpected rain shower. But tonight, he was more alert than I'd ever seen him in the garden. His gaze continuously scanned the numerous pathways. I used to think these trips bored him, but never once had he complained. Victor, on the other hand, would have grumbled about literally anything else we could have been doing. Come to think of it, Rylan might actually enjoy these outings, and not just because he wasn't standing in the hall outside my room. A cool wind whipped through the garden, stirring the many leaves and lifting the edge of my veil. I wished I could remove the headdress. It was transparent enough for me to see, but it did make traveling at dusk and beyond in low-lit places a bit difficult. I made my way past a large water fountain that featured a marble and limestone statue of a veiled maiden. Water poured endlessly from the pitcher she held, the sound reminding me of the rolling waves crashing in and out of the coves of the Stroud Sea. Many coins shimmered under the water, a token to the gods in hopes that whatever the wisher wanted would be granted. I neared the outermost parts, which fed into a small but thick outcropping of jacaranda trees that camouflaged the inner walls that kept Castle Tierman separated from the rest of the city. The trees were tall, reaching over 50 feet, and in Macedonia, bold lavender-colored trumpet-shaped flowers blossomed all year round. Only during the coldest months, when snow threatened, did the leaves fall, blanketing the ground in a sea of purple. They were breathtaking, but I appreciated them not just for their beauty, but also for what they provided. The jacaranda trees hid the crumbling section of the wall that Victor and I often used to leave the grounds unseen in order to access Wisher's Grove. I stopped in front of the mass of intertwined vines that climbed up and over interlocking wooden trellises, as wide as the jacaranda trees were tall. Glancing up at the rapidly darkening sky, I then fixed my gaze ahead. Rylan came to stand behind me. We made it in time. The corners of my lips tilted up before my grin faded. We did tonight. Only a few moments passed, and then the sun conceded defeat to the moon. The last rays of sunlight pulled away from the vines. Hundreds of buds scattered over the vines, trembled, and then slowly peeled open, revealing lush petals, the shade of a starless midnight. Night Night-blooming roses. I closed my eyes. I inhaled the faintly sweet aroma. They were at their most fragrant upon opening, and then again at dawn. They are quite beautiful, Rylan commented. They remind me... His words ended in a strangled grunt. Eyes flying open, I spun around, and a scream of horror nodded in my throat as Rylan staggered backward, an arrow protruding from his chest. A look of disbelief marked his features as he lifted his chin. Run, he gasped, blood trickling from the corner of his lips. Run. Chapter 7 Rylan! I rushed to his side, throwing an arm around him as his legs crumpled. His weight was too much, and when he fell, I went down with him, my knees cracking as they hit the pathway. The impact didn't register as I pressed my hands around Rylan's wound, trying to staunch the flow of blood. I opened my senses to him, expecting to feel pain. Rylan! Whatever words I was about to say died on my tongue, tasting of ash. I, I felt nothing, and that wasn't right. He'd have to be in so much pain, and I could help that. I could take his pain, but I felt nothing. And when I looked at his face, I didn't want to see what I saw. His eyes were open, gaze fixed yet unseeing on the sky above. I shook my head, but under my hands his chest didn't move. No, I whispered, blood turning to ice and slush. Rylan. 
There was no answer, no response. Underneath him, a pool of blood spread across the walkway, seeping into the symbols etched in the stone. A circle with an arrow piercing the center. Infinity. Power. The royal crest. I pressed down on his chest, my trembling hands soaked with blood, refusing to believe. A footstep echoed like thunder behind me. I twisted at the waist. A man stood a few feet from me, a bow at his side. A hooded cloak shielded his face. You're gonna do as I say, maiden. The man spoke in a voice that sounded like churning gravel. And then no one will be hurt. No one? I gasped. Well, no one else will be hurt, he amended. I stared up at the man, and, and Ryland's chest still didn't move under my palms. In the back of my mind, I knew it would never rise again. He'd been dead before he even hit the ground. He was gone. Pain, so sharp and so real, cut through me. Something hot hit my veins and poured into my chest, filling up the empty space. My hands stopped trembling. The grip of panic and shock lessened, replaced by rage. Stand, he ordered. I rose carefully, aware of how my gown, tacky with Ryland's blood, stuck to the knees of my thin leggings underneath. My heart slowed as my hand slipped into the slit along the gown's side. Was this the same person who'd killed Melissa? If so, he was an Atlantean, and I'd have to be quick if I had any hope. We're going to walk out of here, he said. You're not going to make a sound. And you're not going to give me any trouble, are you, maiden? My fingers closed around the smooth, cool handle of the dagger. I shook my head no. Good. He took a step toward me. I don't want to have to hurt you. But if you give me any reason, I will not hesitate. I remained completely still, the heat of my fury building in me, brimming to the surface. Rylan had died because of me. That was his duty as my personal guard. But he was dead because this man thought he could take me. Melissa had possibly been assaulted and then murdered. And for what? If he was an Atlantean or a dissenter, he wouldn't use me for ransom. I'd be used to send a message, just like the three ascended who had been kidnapped from three rivers. They were returned in pieces. At the moment, I didn't care what the man's agenda was. All that mattered was that he'd killed Rylan, who found the night-blooming roses just as beautiful as I did. And he might have been the one to kill Melissa, leaving her body on display in such a careless, disrespectful way. This is good, he cajoled. You're behaving. That's smart of you. Keep being smart, and this will be painless for you. He reached for me. Unsheathing the dagger, I shot forward, dipping under his arm. What the? I sprung up behind him, fisting the back of the man's cloak. I thrust the dagger into his back, aiming where Victor had taught me, the heart. Even caught off guard, he was quick, lurching to the side. But he wasn't fast enough to avoid the dagger altogether. Hot blood gushed as the blade sank deep into his side, missing his heart by mere centimeters. He yelped in pain, the sound reminding me of a dog. Jerking the dagger out, a vastly different sound tore from his throat. A rumbling growl that raised the tiny hairs on my body and kicked my instinct into overdrive. That was such an inhuman sound. My grip on the dagger tightened as I moved to shove it deep into his back once more. He swung around, and I didn't see his fist until pain exploded along my jaw and at the corner of my mouth. Affecting my aim, I tasted something metallic, blood. The dagger sliced into his side, cutting deep, but not deep enough. Bitch, he grunted, slamming his fist into the side of my head this time. The blow was sudden, stunning. Staggering back, lights danced across my eyes as the corners of my vision turned dark. I almost went down, managing to stay on my feet by sheer will alone. If I fell, I knew I wasn't getting back up. Victor had also taught me that. 
Blinking rapidly, I tried to clear the lights from my vision as the man whirled on me. The hood of his cloak had fallen back. He was young, probably only a handful of years older than I, and his dark hair was shaggy. He pressed his hand to his side. Blood seeped out between his fingers. It was coming out of him fast. I must have hit something vital. Good. His lips peeled back in a feral snarl as his gaze lifted to mine. Even in the moonlight, I could see his eyes. They were the color of frosted water, a pale, luminous blue. You will pay for that, he growled, voice even more abrasive, as if his throat were filling with pebbles. I braced myself, instinct telling me that if I ran, he would give chase like any predator would. And if I got close again, my aim had better not be off. Take one more step toward me, and I won't miss your heart a third time. He laughed, and a chill swept through me. It sounded too deep, too changed. I'm going to enjoy tearing your skin off your weak, fragile bones. I don't care what he has planned for you. I will bathe in your blood and feast on your entrails. Fear threatened to take root, but I couldn't cave to it. That sounds delightful. Ah, oh, it will be. He smiled then, teeth smeared with blood, and he took a step toward me. Your screams. A sharp, piercing whistle came from somewhere deep in the trees, silencing him. He stopped, his nostrils flaring. The sound came again, and he seemed to vibrate with rage. The skin around his mouth went white as he took a step back. My grip was steady on the dagger, but a tremor started in my legs as I watched him, refusing to blink. He picked up the fallen bow, wincing as he straightened. His gaze met mine once more. I'll be seeing you again real soon. Can't wait, I gritted out. He smirked. I promise I'll make damn sure that smart mouth of yours is rewarded. I doubted it was the kind of reward I'd be eager to receive. Backing up until he was beyond the roses, he spun around and loped off, quickly disappearing in the heavy shadows that gathered under the trees. I stayed where I stood, breaths coming out in short, quick bursts, ready in case this was some trick where he waited for me to turn my back. I wasn't sure how long I stood there, but the tremors had spread to my hand by the time I realized that he wasn't coming back. Slowly, I lowered the dagger, my gaze snagging on the spattering of blood where he'd stood. Another short breath left me as I lifted my gaze to the roses. Drops of blood glimmered on the onyx-hued petals. A shudder racked me from head to toe. I forced my body to turn around. Rylan remained where he'd fallen, arms lax at his sides, and eyes dull. I opened my mouth to speak, but there were no words. I have no idea what I would have said anyway. I looked down at my dagger, and I felt a scream building in my throat, clawing at me. Get it together. Get it together. I had to find someone to help Rylan. He shouldn't lay out here like this, and they couldn't see me with a bloodied dagger. They couldn't know that I'd fought the attacker off. My lips trembled as I pressed them together. Get it together. Then, like a switch had been thrown, the shaking stopped, and my heart slowed. I still couldn't take a deep enough breath, but I walked forward, dipping down and wiping the blade on Ryland's breeches. I'm sorry. I whispered, my actions causing guilt to make my skin crawl, but it had to be done. Head and face throbbing, I sheathed the dagger. I'm going to get someone for you. There was no answer. There never would be. I started walking the path without realizing what I was doing. A numbness had invaded my body, seeping in through my pores and settling in my muscles. The lights from the castle windows guided me forward as I edged around the water fountain, coming to a sudden stop. 
Footsteps sounded ahead of me. My hand slipped to the dagger, fingers curled around. Maiden, we heard shouting, a voice called out. It was a royal guard who'd often kept watch over the ladies and lords in wait. His eyes widened upon seeing me. Is that, good gods, what happened to you? I went to answer, but I couldn't get my tongue to form words. Another guard cursed, and then there was a taller form with golden hair brushing past the two guards, his weathered face stoic. Victor. His gaze swept over me, lingering on my knees and hands, and then the unveiled part of my face. Are you hurt? He grasped my shoulders, his grip gentle, and his voice even more so. Poppy, are you injured? It's Rylan. He's- I stared up at Victor, suddenly stopping as what Hawk had said about death surfaced without warning. It was something I'd already known, but it still managed to shock me. Death is like an old friend who pays a visit, sometimes when it's least expected, and other times when you're waiting for her. Death had indeed paid an unexpected visit. How did this happen? Duchess Tierman demanded. The jeweled flower securing her brown hair glittered under the chandelier as she paced the room usually reserved for greeting guests. How did someone get into the garden and come that close to taking her? Probably the same way someone got into the castle and killed the lady in wait the day before. The others are scouting the inner wall as we speak, Victor said instead. He stood behind where I sat, perched on the edge of the velvet settee, half afraid that I would get blood on the golden cushions. But I imagine the culprit came through the section that has been damaged by the jacaranda trees. The very same section Victor and I used to leave the castle grounds unnoticed. The Duchess's dark eyes flashed with anger. I want them all torn down, she ordered. I gasped. Sorry, my lady, the healer murmured, dabbing a damp cloth under my lip, and then handing the material to Tawny, who provided him with a clean one. She'd been summoned as soon as I'd been placed in the sitting room. It's fine, I assured the silver-haired man. What had caused the reaction wasn't what the healer had been doing, granted the astringent stung, but it was what Duchess Tierman had demanded. Those trees have been there for hundreds of years and they have lived a long, healthy life. The Duchess turned to me. You have not, Penelope. She strode toward me, the skirt of her crimson gown gathering around her ankles, reminding me of the blood that had pooled around Rylan. I wanted to pull away, but didn't wish to cause offense. If this man had not been scared off, he would have taken you, and the last thing you would have been worried about is those trees. She had a point there. Only Victor knew what had happened, that I had managed to wound the man before he'd been signaled off. While the details couldn't be shared because we'd run the risk of exposure, Victor would notify the healers in the city to keep an eye out for anyone wounded in such a manner. But the trees, they may have caused the deterioration of the wall, but it had been like that for as long as I could remember. There was no doubt in my mind that the Duke and Duchess knew about the wall and simply hadn't ordered it repaired. How badly is she injured? She asked the healer. Superficial wounds, your grace. She'll have a few bruises and some discomfort, but nothing lasting. The old healer's long, dark coat hung from his stooped shoulders as he rose on stiff, creaking joints. You're incredibly lucky, young maiden. I wasn't lucky. I'd been prepared. And that was why I sat here only with an aching temple and a sore lip. But I nodded. Thank you for your assistance. Can you give her something for the pain? The Duchess asked. Yes, of course. He shuffled over to where his leather satchel sat on a small table. I have the perfect thing. Rooting around until he found what he was looking for, he revealed a vial of pinkish-white powder. This will help with any pain. 
but will also make her drowsy. It has a wee bit of a sedating effect. I had absolutely no intention of taking whatever was in that vial, but it was handed over to Tawny, who slipped it into the pocket of her gown. Once the healer had left, the Duchess turned to where I still sat. Let me see your face. Exhaling wearily, I reached for the chains, but Tawny moved to my side. Allow me, she murmured. I started to stop her, but my gaze caught on my hands. They'd been wiped as soon as I was placed in the sitting room, but blood had made its way under my nails, and flakes of it still dotted my fingers. Was Ryland's body still in the courtyard by the roses? Malessa's body had been in that room for hours and then removed. I wondered if she had been returned to her family, or if her body had been burned out of precaution. Tawny unhooked the veil, carefully removing it, so it didn't tangle in the strands of hair that had escaped the knot I'd gathered it in that morning. Duchess Tierman knelt before me, her cool fingers grazing the skin around my lips, and then my right temple. What were you doing out in the garden? I was looking at the roses. I do so nearly every night. I glanced up. Rylan always goes with me. He didn't, I cleared my throat. He didn't even see the attacker. The arrow struck him in the chest before he was even aware that anyone was there. Her bottomless eyes searched mine. It sounds like he wasn't as alert as he should have been. He never should have been caught off guard. Rylan was very skilled, I said. The man was hidden. Your guard was so skilled that he was felled by an arrow, she asked softly. Was this man part ghost, that he made no sound, gave no warning? My back stiffened as I thought of the sound the man had made and how it hadn't resembled anything human. Rylan was alert. Your grace, what have I told you? Her delicately arched brows lifted. Struggling for patience, I took a shallow breath. Rylan was alert, Jacinda, I amended, using her first name. She sporadically required this, and I never knew when she would want me to use the name or not. The man, he was quiet, and Rylan was unprepared. Victor finished for me. My head cranked around so fast, it sent a flare of pain across my temple. Disbelief seized me. Victor's blue eyes met mine. He enjoyed your evening strolls in the garden. He never thought there would be a threat, and unfortunately became too complacent. Last night should have changed that. Last night had changed that. Rylan had been scanning the grounds constantly. My shoulders slumped, and then my brain switched gears. Ian, please don't say anything to my brother. My gaze swung between the Duchess and Victor. I don't want him to worry, and he will even though I'm fine. I will need to inform the Queen of what has happened, Penelope. You know this, she replied. And I cannot control who she tells. If she feels Ian needs to know, she will tell him. I sank further into myself. Her cool fingertips touched my cheek, my left one. I turned back to her. Do you understand how important you are, Penelope? You are the maiden. You were chosen by the gods. Ascensions of hundreds of ladies and lords in wait all across the kingdom are all tied to yours. It will be the largest ascension since the first blessing. Rylan and all the royal guards know what is at stake if something were to happen to you. I liked the Duchess. She was kind, nothing like her husband. And for a tiny moment there, I thought she was actually worried about me as a person. But it was what I signified that concerned her the most. What would be lost if something were to happen to me? It wasn't just my life, but the future of hundreds of those who were about to ascend. The worst part was the twinge of sadness when I should have known better. If the dissenters were to somehow stop that ascension, 
It would be their greatest triumph. She rose, smoothing her hands over her gown. It would be such a cruel strike against our queen and king and the gods. You, you think he was a dissenter then? Tawny asked. That he wasn't trying to take her for ransom? The arrow used on Rylan was marked, Victor answered. It carried the Dark One's promise. His promise. Air lodged in my throat as my gaze swung to Tawny's. I knew what that meant. From blood and ash, we shall rise. It was his promise to his people and his supporters, to those scattered across the kingdom, that they would rise once more. A promise that had been scrawled across vandalized storefronts in every city, and had been carved into the stone shell of what remained of Goldcrest Manor. I must be blunt with you, the Duchess said, glancing toward Tawny. And I trust that what I'm about to say won't become whispers on the lips of others. Of course, Tawny promised, as I nodded. There is reason to believe that the assailant from last night was an Atlantean, she said, and Tawny sucked in a sharp breath. I had no reaction to the news, since Victor and I had already suspected as much. It's not news we want spread widely. The kind of panic that could cause, well, it would do none of us any favors. I glanced at Victor and found him watching the Duchess closely. You think that was who came for me tonight? The same man responsible for Melissa's death? I cannot say if it was the same man. But we do believe the one responsible for the disgraceful treatment of Our Lady in Wait was a part of a group that visited yesterday, she explained, walking toward the credenza along the back wall. She poured herself a clear drink from the glass decanter. After the castle was checked for any persons who didn't belong, we believed that the perpetrator had left, and that the act was to show how easy it was for them to gain access. We believed that the immediate threat had passed. She took a sip of her drink, her lips twitching as she swallowed. Obviously, we were wrong. They may no longer be in the castle, but they are in the city. She faced me, her already alabaster skin even paler. The Dark One has come for you, Penelope. I shuddered as my heart skipped a beat. We will protect you, she continued. But I would not be surprised if once the king and queen learn of what has happened, they take drastic steps to ensure your safety. They could summon you to the capital. Chapter 8 I don't think the man I saw in the garden was the dark one, I said to Victor, as we made our way from the sitting room, passing under the large white banners embossed with the royal crest in gold. He was escorting Tawny and me back to my room. When he said he was basically going to feast on my body parts, he referenced someone else, saying, he didn't care what he had planned. If the Dark One is behind this, I imagine the one with the plans would be him. I suspect whoever was in the garden was a dissenter, Victor admitted, hand on the hilt of his sword as he scanned the wide hall as if dissenters lurked behind the potted lilies and statues. Several ladies in wait stood together, their voices quieting as we passed. A few placed their hands over their mouths, if they hadn't heard what had happened, they now knew something else had occurred based on the amount of blood that stained my gown. We should have gone the old way, I muttered. It was rare that any of them ever saw me, and to see me like this would be the gossip of the week. Ignore them. Tawny shifted so she blocked most of me from view as we crossed the hall. She still carried with her the white vial she knew I had no plans to use. It may be good for them to see, Victor decided after a moment. What happened last night and just now could serve as a timely reminder that we are in a time of unrest. We all should be on guard, 
no one is truly safe. A shiver tiptoed its way down my spine. The numbness was still there, and all of this felt surreal until I thought of Rylan. My chest ached worse than my bruised jaw and temple. When will, when will Rylan be put to rest? Most likely in the morning. Victor glanced down at me. You know you cannot go. The ascended, as well as the lords and ladies in wait, were not expected to attend the funeral of a guard. In fact, it was simply not done. He was my personal guard, and he was, he was a friend. I don't care what's done and not done. I didn't attend Hannes's funeral because of protocol, and I wanted to be there. The guilt from that still ate at me, usually at three in the morning when I couldn't sleep. I want to be there for Rylan. Tawny appeared as if she wished to argue the point, but knew better. Victor simply sighed. You know his grace will not approve. He rarely approves of anything. This can be another thing he can add to his ever-growing list that contains all the ways I've disappointed him. Poppy, Victor warned, his jaw tightening, reminding me of our argument last night. You may continue to act as if angering the Duke is no big deal, but you know that will not lessen the weight of his anger. Did I ever? But that knowledge didn't change anything. I was more than willing to deal with whatever consequences arose, just as I was when it came to me aiding those who'd been infected by the craven. I don't care. Ryland died right in front of me, and there was nothing I could do. I wiped. My voice cracked. I wiped my blade on his clothing. Victor stopped as we entered the foyer, placing his hand on my shoulder. You did all that you could. He squeezed gently. You did what you needed to do. You're not responsible for his death. He was doing his duty, Poppy, the same as if I were to die defending you. My heart stopped. Don't say that. Don't you ever say that. You won't die. But I will die someday. I may get lucky and the god rain will come for me in my sleep. But it may be by the sword or by the arrow. His eyes met mine, even through the veil, and a knot lodged in my throat. No matter how or when it happens, it will not be your fault, Poppy. And you will not waste one moment on guilt. Tears blurred his features. I couldn't even think of something happening to Victor. Losing Hannes, and now Rylan, both who weren't nearly as close to me as Victor, was hard enough. Other than Tawny, Victor was the only person in my life who knew what kept me up at night, and why I needed to feel like I could protect myself. He knew more than my own brother did. It would be like losing my parents all over again, but worse because the memories of my mother and father, their faces and the sound of their voices, had faded with the passing of time. They were forever captured in the past, mere ghosts of who they once were. And Victor was in the now, bright and in vivid detail. Tell me you understand that. His voice had softened. I didn't. But I nodded nonetheless, because that was what he needed to see. Rylan was a good man. His voice thickened, and for a moment, grief filled his gaze, proving that he wasn't unaffected by Rylan's death. He was just too skilled to show it. I know it didn't sound like I thought so when we were with her grace. I stand by what I said. Rylan grew too complacent, but that can happen to the best of us. He was a good guard, and he cared for you. He would not want you to feel guilt. He squeezed my shoulder once more. Come, you need to clean up. The moment we reached my room, Victor checked the space, assuring that the access to the old servant's stairs was locked. It was more than just a little unsettling to think that he felt the need to check my suite. But I figured he was operating on the better safe than sorry mindset. Before he left us, I recalled a part of what the Duchess had said. The group the Duchess spoke about, do you know who they are? 
I wasn't aware of any group. Victor glanced at where Tawny was carrying an armful of fresh towels into the bathing chamber. He often spoke openly in front of her, but this, all of this felt different. But I'm not kept up to date on the comings and goings, so it's not exactly surprising. So the Duke was just trying to avoid panic, I surmised. The Duchess has always been more forthcoming, but I imagine that he probably told the commander the truth. His jaw hardened. I should have been told immediately. He should have been, and it didn't matter that he'd already suspected the truth. Try to get some rest. He placed his hand on my shoulder. I'll be right outside if you need anything. I nodded. A hot bath was quickly drawn, placed near the fireplace, and then Tawny took the soiled gown. I never wanted to see it again. I sank into the steaming water and set about scrubbing my hands and arms until they were pink with heat and friction. Without any warning, the image of Rylan appeared in my mind, the look of shock on his face as he stared down at his chest. Squeezing my eyes shut, I lowered myself more and let the water slip over my head. I stayed there until my lungs burned and I no longer saw Rylan's face. Only then did I allow myself to resurface. There I stayed, bruised knees tucked up to my chest, until my skin puckered and the water began to cool. I rose from the soaking tub, pulling on a thick robe that Tawny had left on a nearby stool, and padded on bare feet across the fire-warmed stone to the lone mirror. Using my palm to wipe away a bit of steam, I stared into my green eyes. My father had passed that color on to Ian and me. Our mother had brown eyes, I remembered that. The queen had told me once that except for my eyes, I was a replica of my mother when she was my age. I had her strong brow and her oval-shaped face, angular cheekbones, and full mouth. I tilted my cheek. The faintly red and bruised skin along my temple and the corner of my mouth were barely noticeable. Whatever the healer had rubbed onto the skin, had greatly sped up the healing process. It had to be the same mixture I'd used to heal the welts that too often marked my back. I pushed that thought from my head as I looked at my left cheek. That too had healed, but had left a mark behind. I didn't look at the scars often, but I did now. I studied the jagged streak of skin, a pink paler than my skin tone, that started below the hairline and sliced across my temple, narrowly missing my left eye. The healed injury ended by my nose. Another shorter wound was higher up, cutting across my forehead and through my eyebrow. I lifted my damp fingers, pressing them to the longer scar. I'd always thought that my eyes and mouth seemed too large for my face, but the queen had said that my mother had been considered a great beauty. Whenever Queen Ileana spoke of my mother, she did so with pained fondness. They'd been close, and I knew she regretted granting my mother the one thing she'd ever asked her for, permission to refuse the ascension. My mother had been a lady in wait, given to the court during her right but my father had not been a lord. She had chosen my father over the blessing of the gods. And that kind of love, it was, well, I didn't have any experience with that. Probably never would, and I doubted most people did, no matter what their futures held. What my mom had done was unheard of. She'd been the first and the last to ever do so. Queen Ileana had said more than once, that if my mother had ascended, she might have survived that night. But that night may have never come. I wouldn't be standing here. Neither would Ian. She wouldn't have married our father. And if she had ascended, she would bear no children. The queen's beliefs were irrelevant. But when the mist had come for us that night, if my parents had known how to defend themselves, both might still be alive. It was why I was standing here instead of the captive of a man determined to take down the ascended, and more than willing to shed blood to do so. If Melissa had known how to defend herself, her outcome may have still been the same, but she would have at least had a chance. 
My gaze once more met my reflections. The dark one would not take me. That was a vow I would kill for and die to uphold. I lowered my hand and then slowly turned from the mirror. I changed into a gown, leaving a lamp burning beside the door, and crawled into bed. It couldn't have been more than twenty minutes before a soft knock sounded on the adjoining door, and Tawny's voice called out. I rolled toward the entrance. I'm awake, Tawny eased inside, shutting the door behind her. I, I couldn't sleep. I haven't even tried yet, I admitted. I can go back to my room if you're tired, she offered. You know I won't be falling asleep anytime soon. I patted the spot beside me. Hurrying across the short distance, she snatched the edge of the blanket and slipped under it. Shifting onto her side, she faced me. I keep thinking about everything, and I wasn't even there. I can't imagine what's going on in your head. She paused. Actually, probably something that involves bloody vengeance. I grinned, despite all that had happened. That's not entirely untrue. This is my shocked face, she replied. Then her smile faded. I keep thinking about how unreal all of this feels. First with Melissa, and now Rylan. I saw him just after supper. He was alive and well. I'd passed Melissa yesterday morning. She was smiling and looked happy, carrying a bouquet of flowers. It's like, I can't process that they're gone. They're one moment and not the next, without any warning. Tawny was one of the few who hadn't been intimately touched by death. Her parents and older brother and sister were alive. Other than Hannes, no one she knew well or saw often had died. But even though I was too familiar with it, the death was still a shock. And like Hawk had also said, no less harsh or unforgiving. I swallowed. I don't know what it was like for Melissa. What I did know was that it had been terrifying, though saying that wouldn't help matters. But for Rylan, it was quick. Twenty or thirty seconds, I said. And then he was gone. There wasn't a lot of pain, and what he did feel, it was over quickly. She inhaled deeply, closing her eyes. I liked him. He wasn't as stern as Victor, or as standoffish as Hannes and the rest. You could talk to him. I know, I whispered around the burn in my throat. Tawny was silent for several moments, and then said, The dark one. Her eyes opened. He seemed more like a, a myth, she nodded. It's not like I didn't believe he was real. It's just that he's talked about like he's the boogeyman. She snuggled down, tucking the blanket to her chin. What if that was the dark one in the garden, and you managed to wound him? That would be pretty amazing, and I would brag until the end of time to you and Victor. But like I said, I don't think it was. Thank the gods you knew what to do. She reached across the bed, finding my hand and squeezing it. If not, I know. In moments like this, it was hard to remember that duty bound us together, created our bond. I squeezed her hand back. I'm just glad you weren't with me. I would like to say I wished I was there so you didn't have to face that alone, but in truth I'm glad I wasn't, she admitted. I would have been nothing more than a shrieking distraction. Not true. I've shown you how to use a dagger. Being shown the basics of how to use a blade and then using it on another living, breathing person are two very different things. She pulled her hand back. I would have definitely stood there and screamed. I'm not ashamed to admit that, and my screams probably would have brought the guard's attention sooner. You would have defended yourself. I totally believed that. I've seen how vicious you get when there's only one sweet cake left. The skin around her eyes crinkled as she laughed. But that's a sweet cake. I would push the Duchess off a balcony to get the last one. A short laugh burst from me. Another quick grin appeared 
and then faded as she toyed with the loose thread on the blanket. Do you think the king and queen will summon you to the capital? Muscles tensed along my shoulders. I don't know. That wasn't true. If they thought I was no longer safe in Macedonia, they would demand I return to the capital, almost a year ahead of my ascension. But that wasn't what caused the coldness in my chest to seep into every part of me. The Duchess had proven earlier that ensuring the ascension wasn't thwarted was the greatest concern. There was one way to ensure that. The Queen could petition the gods to move up the ascension. Shortly after dawn, when the sun shone brighter than I remembered for a morning so close to winter, I stood beside Victor. We were at the foot of the undying hills, and below the temples of Rahar, the eternal god, and Ione, the goddess of rebirth. The temples loomed above us, each constructed from the blackest stone from the far east, and both as large as Castle Tierman, casting half the valley into shadows, but not where we stood. It was as if the gods were shining light down on us. We were silent as we watched Rylan Keel's linen-wrapped body be lifted onto the pyre. Victor had been resigned when I joined him, not prepared to train, but dressed in white and veiled. He knew he wasn't going to talk me out of this, and said nothing as we walked to where funerals for all those who resided in Macedonia were held. While my presence had drawn many shocked glances, no one had demanded to know why I was present as we made the trek to the pyre. And even if they had said anything, it wouldn't have changed my decision. I owed it to Ryland to be here. Surrounded by members of the Royal Guard and the guards from the Rise, we stood near the back of the small crowd. I didn't want to get closer out of respect for the guards. Ryland was my personal guard. He was a friend, but he was their brother and his death affected them differently. As the white-robed high priest spoke of Ryland's strength and bravery, of the glory he would find in the company of the gods, of the eternal life that awaited him, the icy ache in my chest grew. Ryland looked so small on the pyre, as if he'd shrunken in size as the priest sprinkled oil and salt over the body. A sweet scent filled the air. The commander of the Royal Guard, Griffith Jansen, stepped forward. The white mantle draped from his shoulders, rippling in the breeze, as he carried forth the lone torch. Commander Jansen turned in our direction and waited. It took me a moment to realize why. Victor, as the one who had worked the closest with Rylan, he would be given the task of lighting the pyre. He started to step forward, but stopped his gaze swinging to me. It was clear he didn't want to leave my side, not even when I was surrounded by dozens of guards and it was highly unlikely that anything would occur. Oh gods, it struck me then that my presence interfered with his desire or need to pay his respects. I didn't for one second think that was why he'd initially resisted the idea of me coming the night before but I hadn't even considered how it would impact him. Feeling like a selfish brat, I started to tell him that I would be safe while he paid his respects. I have her, a deep voice said from behind me, one that shouldn't be familiar, but was. My stomach dipped as if I were standing on a ledge, while at the same time my heart sped up. I didn't even need to turn around to know whom it was. Hawk, Flynn, oh, gods. After everything that had happened, I had almost forgotten about Hawk. Almost being the key word, because this morning I had woken wishing I had waited for him to come back to the Red Pearl. To possibly be taken and used in whatever terrible manner my enemies deemed, or to be killed before I had the chance to experience all the things that people only whispered about, seemed all too frightening a reality. Victor's steely blue-gray gaze shifted over my shoulder. A long, tense moment passed as several guards looked on. Do you? With my sword and my life? Hawk replied, coming to stand at my shoulder. 
The dipping motion returned to my stomach in response to his promise, even though I knew that was what all guards said, no matter if they were from the rise or if they protected the ascended. The commander tells me you're one of the best on the rise. Victor's jaw hardened as he spoke quietly, so only Hawk and I could hear him. Said that he hasn't seen your level of skill with a bow or sword in too many years. I'm good at what I do. And what's that? Victor challenged. Killing? The simple short answer from his lips, that had felt as soft as they had firm, was a shock. But the one word didn't frighten me. I had quite the opposite reaction, and that probably should have disturbed me, or at the very least, concerned me. She is the future of this kingdom, Victor warned, and I squirmed in a strange mix of embarrassment and fondness. He'd said what everyone from the Duchess to the Queen would say, but I know he spoke those words because of who I was, and not what I represented. That is who you stand beside. I know who I stand beside, Hawk answered. A hysterical giggle climbed its way up my throat. He honestly had no idea who he stood next to. By the grace of the gods, I was able to stop that laugh. She is safe with me, Hawk added. I was, and I wasn't. Victor looked at me, and all I could do was nod. I couldn't speak. If I did, Hawk might recognize my voice, and then, gods, I couldn't even begin to fathom what would occur. With one last look of warning in Hawk's direction, Victor pivoted on his heel and stalked toward the guard who held the torch. My heart hadn't slowed as I dared one quick peek in Hawk's direction. I immediately wished I hadn't, in the bright early morning sun, With blue-black hair swept back from his face, his features were harder, harsher, and somehow all the more beautiful. The line of his lips was firm, no hint of a dimple to be seen. He had on the same black uniform he had worn the night at the Red Pearl, except now he also wore the leather and iron armor of the Rise. His broadsword at his side, the bloodstone blade, a deep ruby. Why had he stepped forward to watch over me? There were royal guards present, dozens of them who should have done so. My gaze swept the crowd, and I realized that none of them looked long in my direction. And I wondered if it was because it was so rare that they ever saw me, or if they feared punishment by the duke or the gods for even looking at me. Their duty dictated that they give their life for someone who it would be considered a grave disrespect to look upon too long or approach without permission. The disturbing irony in that sat heavily on my shoulders. But Hawk was different. There was no way that he knew it had been me at the Red Pearl. He had never heard me speak before, and I doubted my jaw and mouth were that recognizable. The Duchess had said he came from the capital with glowing recommendations, and would likely become one of the youngest royal guards. If that was what Hawk wanted, stepping up like this would surely help. After all, there was a sudden unexpected opening in the royal guard now. And wasn't that a dark assumption to make? A muscle flexed along his jaw, momentarily fascinating. Then I remembered why I was here, and that was not to ogle Hawk from behind my veil. I shifted my gaze to where Victor approached the pyre. Drawing in a shallow breath, I wanted to look away, to close my eyes when he lowered the torch. I didn't. I watched as the flames licked along the tinder and the sound of crackling wood filled the quiet. My insides twisted as the fire ignited in a rush, spreading over Ryland's body as Victor dropped to one knee before the pyre bowing his head. You do him a great honor by being here. Hawk spoke quietly, but his words startled me. My head swung in his direction. He was staring down at me with eyes so bright, they looked like the gods had polished the amber themselves and placed them there. You do us all a great honor by being here. 
I opened my mouth to tell him that Rylan and all of them were owed far more than the honor of my presence. But I stopped myself. I couldn't risk it. Hawk's gaze flicked over my lower jaw, lingering on the corner of my mouth, where I knew the skin was inflamed. You were hurt. It wasn't a question, but a statement uttered in a hard-as-granite tone. You can be assured that will never happen again. Chapter 9 Sweat dampened my skin as I dipped down and spun, the long, thick braid of hair whipping around me. I kicked out, and my bare foot connected with the side of Victor's shin. Caught off guard, he staggered to the side as I shot up beside him. He started to strike back, but froze. His gaze dropped to where I held the dagger to his throat. The corners of his lips turned down. I smiled. I win. It's not about winning, Poppy. It's not? I lowered the dagger, stepping back. It's about surviving. Isn't that winning, though? He shot me a sidelong glance as he dragged his arm over his forehead. I suppose you can look at it that way. But it's never a game. I know that. I sheathed the dagger at my thigh. Dressed in a pair of thick leggings and an old tunic of Victor's, I walked across the stone floor toward an old wooden table. I picked up the glass of water and took a long drink. If I could dress like this all day, every day, I'd be a happy girl. But if it were a game, I still would have won. You only got the upper hand twice, Poppy. Yes. But both of those times, I would have sliced your neck. You got the upper hand three times, but they would have been nothing more than flesh wounds. Flesh wounds? He barked out a short, rare laugh. Only you would think disembowelment a paltry flesh wound. You're such a poor loser. I thought this wasn't a game. He scoffed. Grinning, I shrugged as I faced him. Dust danced in the sunlight that poured through the open windows. The glass had long been removed, and the room was either drafty and near frigid in the winter, or unbearably hot in the summer. But no one ever checked for us here, so the extreme temperature variances were more than manageable. It was the morning after Ryland's funeral, too early for much of the castle to be moving about. Nearly all the staff and the stronghold's inhabitants followed the schedule of the ascended, and the servants, as well as the duke and duchess, believed that I was still abed. Only Tawny knew where I was. Rylan hadn't even known, as Victor always had morning duties with me. How's your head feeling? He asked. Fine. He arched a fair brow. Are you telling the truth? A faint bluish-purple bruise over my temple was all that remained. The skin around my mouth was no longer red. There was a superficial cut along the inside of my cheek that any amount of salt seemed to find its way into. But other than that, I was fine. Not that I would admit it, but Victor suggesting I take it easy and rest yesterday probably had a lot to do with that. After Ryland's funeral, I'd spent the day in my chambers, reading one of the books Tawny had brought to me. It was a tale of two lovers, star-crossed yet faded. The title had fallen in the Things Penelope is Forbidden to Read pile, which was pretty much everything that didn't involve some sort of educational material or the teachings of the gods. I'd finished the novel last evening, and I wondered if Tawny could bring me another. It was doubtful. Preparation for the upcoming rite was consuming much of her spare time. Whenever Tawny couldn't bring a book for me to read, I would simply sneak into the Athenaeum and help myself. Plus, with the attempted kidnapping and what had happened to Melissa, I didn't want her out there roaming around. Which meant I also shouldn't be roaming around unguarded. But the Athenaeum wasn't too far. Just a few blocks beyond the castle and easily accessible through the grove. Disguised, no one would know that I was the maiden. But it still felt too risky and dumb to do something like that so quickly after the attack. It hurt a little last night, but not since I woke up. I paused. The man had a weak punch. Victor snorted as he approached me, sliding his short sword into its scabbard. Did you sleep well? I considered lying. Do I look like I haven't slept? 
He stopped in front of me. You rarely sleep well. I imagine what happened with Rylan has exacerbated your already poor sleeping patterns. Aw, are you worried about me? I teased. You're such a good father. His expression turned bland. Stop deflecting, Poppy. Why, I'm so good at it. But you're actually not. Rolling my eyes, I sighed. It took a while to fall asleep, but I haven't had a nightmare in a while. Victor's gaze searched mine, as if trying to determine whether I was lying, and the man probably could. I wasn't lying, exactly. I hadn't had a night terror since I went to the Red Pearl, and I wasn't sure why that was. Perhaps falling asleep thinking about what had happened in the Red Pearl had somehow switched the gears of my brain away from past trauma. If so, I wasn't going to look a gift horse in the mouth. Who do you think will replace Rylan? I changed the subject before he could continue down that road of questioning. I'm not sure, but I assume it will be decided fairly soon. My mind immediately went to Hawk, even though he couldn't possibly be in the running, not when there were so many others from the Rise who'd been here longer. But the question sort of toppled out of me anyway. Do you think it would be the one who came from the Capitol recently? The guard who stood by my side at the funeral? Who assured me that I wouldn't be hurt again? You're talking about Hawk? Victor asked, securing his other sword. Oh, is that his name? He lifted his gaze to mine. You're a terrible liar. Am not? I frowned. What am I supposedly lying about? You didn't know his name? Praying that my flushed cheeks didn't give me away, I folded my arms over my chest. Why would I? Every woman in this city knows his name. What does that have to do with anything? His lips twitched as if he were fighting a smile. He's a very handsome young man, or so I've been told, and there's nothing wrong with you taking notice of him. He glanced away, as long as that is all you do. My cheeks did flush hotly then, because I had done far more than simply take notice of Hawk. When exactly would I have had a chance to do anything other than take notice, which is, might I remind you, strictly forbidden? Victor laughed once more, and my frown increased. When has something being forbidden ever stopped you? That's different, I said, wondering if the gods would strike me down for so blatantly lying. And when would I even have a chance to do something like that? I'm actually glad you brought that up. Your little adventures will need to come to an end. My stomach jumped. I have no idea what you're talking about. He ignored that. I haven't said much in the past about you and Tawny sneaking off. But after what happened in the garden, that has to end. I snapped my mouth shut. Did you think I didn't know? His smile was slow and smug. I'm watching, even when you think I'm not. Well, that is creepy. I didn't even want to know if he knew that I'd been to the Red Pearl. Creepy or not, just remember what I said the next time you think of sneaking out in the middle of the night. Before I could respond, he said, and regarding Hawk, I would say that his age would make him becoming your personal guard doubtful. But, my heart started thumping and I was barely aware of Victor taking the glass from me. But he is exceptionally skilled, more so than many of the royal guards now. I wasn't stroking his ego yesterday when I said that. He came here held in high regard by the capital, and he appears to be close to Commander Jansen. He finished off my glass of water. I wouldn't be all that surprised if he was promoted over others. Now my heart was slamming itself against my ribs. But, but to become my personal guard? Surely someone who is more familiar with the city would be a better fit. Actually, someone new and less likely to be complacent would be the best, he said. He would see things differently than many of us who have been here for years or longer. See weaknesses and threats we may overlook out of monotony. And he showed yesterday that he has no problem stepping up while everyone else stood by. 
All of that made sense, but... But he couldn't become my personal royal guard. If he did, I'd have to speak to him eventually. And if I did that, he'd recognize me at some point. And then what? If he was close to the commander and determined to rise through the ranks, he would be sure to report me. After all, the highest ranking guards who had a chance of living to see a well-funded retirement were the royal guards who protected the Duke and Duchess of Macedonia. During the day, when the sun was high, the great hall where the weekly city councils and grand celebrations were held was one of the most beautiful rooms in the entire castle. Windows taller than most of the homes in the city were spaced every 20 feet or so, allowing the warm, bright sun to drench the polished white limestone walls and floors. The windows offered views of the gardens to the left, and the temples atop the undying hills. Heavy white tapestries hung the length of the windows and in between them. The golden royal crest embossed the center of each banner. Creamy white pillars adorned with flecks of gold and silver were spaced throughout the long, wide chamber. White and purple jasmine flowers climbed out of silver urns, perfuming the air with their sweet, earthy scent. The hand-painted ceiling was the true masterpiece of the great hall. Above, all the gods could be seen watching over us. Ione and Rahar, the flaming redhead Ios, the goddess of love, fertility, and beauty. Cyan, the dark-skinned god of the sky and the soil. He was earth, wind, and water. Beside him was Theon, the god of accord and war, and his twin, Layla the goddess of peace and vengeance, the dark-haired goddess of the hunt, Bele, armed with her bow. There was Paris, the pale, white-haired god of the right and prosperity. Beside him was Rain, the god of the common man and endings. And then there was my namesake, Penelope, the goddess of wisdom, loyalty, and duty, which I found highly ironic. All their faces were captured in striking, vivid detail, all but Nyctos, the king of all the gods, who had made the first blessing. His face and form were nothing but brilliant, silvery moonlight. But as I stood on the raised dais to the left of the seated duchess, there was no sunlight pouring in through the windows, only the dark night. Several sconces and oil lamps placed to provide as much light as possible cast a golden glow throughout the hall. The gods did not walk in the sun, so neither did the ascended. How had Ian adapted to that? If it was a sunny day, he could be found outside scribbling in one of his journals, recording whatever stories his mind had drummed up. Did he now write in the moonlight? I would know sooner rather than later if I was summoned back to the capital. Anxiety bloomed and I pushed that thought aside before the unease could spread. I scanned the throng of people who had filled up the great hall, pretending that I wasn't searching for one face in particular, and failing miserably. I knew Hawk was here, he always was, but I hadn't seen him yet. Full of nervous energy, I unclasped and then wrung my hands as someone, a banker, continued to heap praise upon the Tiermans. You all right? Victor bent his head, keeping his voice low enough so only I could hear him. I turned just the slightest to the left and nodded. Why do you ask? Because you've been fidgeting like you have spiders in your gown since the beginning of this, he answered. Spiders in my gown? If I had spiders in my gown, I wouldn't be fidgeting. I'd be screaming and stripping down to nothing. I wouldn't care at all who witnessed it. I wasn't sure exactly what had me so incredibly restless. Well, there were myriad things, considering everything that had happened recently. But it felt like more than that. It had started after I'd left Victor. A brief headache I attributed to the punch, and possibly overdoing it during training. Not that I would admit that. But after lunch, it had faded. 
only to be replaced by a wealth of nervous energy. It reminded me of the blend of coffee beans Ian had shipped from the capital. Tawny and I had only drunk half a cup, and neither of us could sit still for the entire day afterward. Making a more conscious effort to remain still, my gaze shifted to the left, to the gardens where I'd found such peace before. My chest ached. I hadn't gone to the gardens last night or at any time today. The area hadn't been forbidden to me, but I knew if I stepped foot outside, I would be surrounded by guards. I couldn't even imagine how the upcoming rite would go. But I didn't think I could ever go back to the gardens, no matter how much I loved them and the roses therein. Even now, just looking at the shadowy outline of the garden through the windows brought forth an image of Ryland's blank stare. Drawing in a shallow breath, I pulled my attention from the garden to the front of the hall. Members of the court, those who had ascended, stood the closest, flanking the dais. Behind them were the ladies and lords in wait. Royal guards stood among them, their shoulders bearing white mantles with the royal crest. Merchants and businessmen, villagers and laborers crowded the hall, all there to petition the court for one thing or another, air their grievances, or curry favor with his or her grace. Plenty of the faces that stared up at us were wide-eyed and slack-jawed with awe. For some, this was the first time they'd seen the brown-haired beauty, Duchess Tierman, or the coolly handsome Duke, whose hair was so blonde it was almost white. For many, this was the first time they'd been as close as they were to an ascended. They looked like they were in the presence of the gods themselves. And in a way, I guessed they were. The ascended were descendants of the gods by blood, if not by birth. And then there was me. Nearly none of the commoners who stood in the great hall had ever seen the maiden before. For that alone, I was subjected to many curious, quick glances. I imagined that word of Melissa's death and my attempted abduction had also traveled widely by now. And I was sure that had aided in the curiosity and the buzz of anxious energy that seemed to permeate the hall. Except for Tawny. She looked half asleep as she stood there. And I bit down on the inside of my cheek when she smothered a yawn. We had been here for nearly two hours already and I wondered if the tearman's asses ached as much as my feet were beginning to. Probably not. Both looked mighty comfortable. The Duchess was dressed in yellow silk, and even I could admit that the Duke cut a rather dashing figure in his black trousers and tailcoat. He always reminded me of the pale snake I'd once stumbled upon near the beach as a little girl. Beautiful to look upon, but its bite dangerous and often deadly, swallowing a sigh as the banker began to speak of their great leadership, I started to look toward the temples. I saw him, Hawk. A strange, funny little hitch took up residence in my chest at the sight of him. He stood between two pillars, arms folded across his broad chest. Like yesterday, there was no teasing half-grin on his face. And his features would have been considered severe, if it were not for the unruly strands of midnight-hued hair tumbling over his forehead, softening his expression. A tingling sense of awareness swept down my spine, spreading tiny bumps all over my skin. Hawk's gaze was lifted to the dais, to where I stood. And even from across the hall and from behind the veil, I swore our gazes connected. Air whooshed from my lungs, and the entire hall seemed to fade away, going silent as we stared at one another. My heart thumped heavily as my hands spasmed open and then closed. He was staring at me. But so were a lot of others. Even the ascended often stared. I was a curiosity, a sideshow, put on display once a week, to serve as a reminder that the gods could actively intervene in births and in lives. But my legs still felt strange, and my pulse fluttered as if I had spent the last hour practicing different combat techniques with Victor. Magnus, a steward to the Duke, announced the next to speak, 
drawing my attention. Mr. and Mrs. Tulis have requested a word, your graces. Dressed in simple but clean clothing, the fair-haired couple stepped out from a grouping of those waiting toward the back. The husband had his arm around his shorter wife's shoulders, keeping her tucked close to his side. Hair pulled back from their bloodless face, the woman wore no jewels but held a small swaddled bundle in her arms. The bundle stirred as they approached the dais, little arms and legs stretching the pale blue blanket. Their gazes were fixed to the floor, heads bowed slightly. They didn't look up, not until the Duchess gave them permission to do so. You may speak, she said, her voice hauntingly feminine and endlessly soft. She sounded like someone who'd never raised their voice or hand in anger. Neither were untrue, and for what had to be the hundredth time, I wondered what exactly she and the Duke had in common. I couldn't remember the last time I'd even seen them touch one another, not as if it was necessary for the Ascendant to marry. Unlike others, Mr. and Mrs. Tulis clearly shared a wealth of feelings for one another. It was the way Mr. Tulis held his wife close, and in the way she lifted her gaze, first to him and then to the Duchess. Thank you. The wife's nervous gaze darted to the male royal. Your grace. Duke Tierman tilted his head in acknowledgement. It is our pleasure, he told her. What can we do for you and your family? We are here to present our son, she explained, turning so the bundle faced the dais. The little face was creased and ruddy as he blinked large eyes. The Duchess leaned forward, hands remaining clasped in her lap. He is darling. What is his name? Tobias, the father answered. He takes after my wife, as cute as a button, if I dare say so myself, your grace. My lips curled into a grin. That he is, the Duchess nodded. I do hope all is well with you and the babe. It is. I'm perfectly healthy, just like him. And he's been a joy, a true blessing. Mrs. Tulis straightened, holding the baby close to her breast. We love him very much. Is he your first son? The Duke asked. Mr. Tulis's Adam's apple bobbed with a swallow. No, your grace, he isn't. He's our third son. The Duchess clapped her hands together. Then Tobias is a true blessing, one who will receive the honor of serving the gods. That's why we're here, your grace. The man slipped his arm from around his wife. Our first son, our dear Jamie, he, he passed no more than three months ago. Mr. Tulis cleared his throat. It was a sickness of the blood the healers told us. It came on real quick, you see. One day he was fine, chasing around and getting into all kinds of trouble. And then the following morning, he didn't wake up. He lingered for a few days, but he left us. I'm incredibly sorry to hear that. Sorrow filled the Duchess's voice as she settled back in her seat. And what of the second son? We lost him to the same sickness that took Jamie. The mother began to tremble. No more than a year into his life. They lost two sons? My heart was already aching for them. Even with the loss I'd experienced in my life, I couldn't even begin to understand the kind of anguish a parent must suffer when they lose a child, let alone two. If I felt it, I knew I would want to do something about it, and I couldn't, not here. I locked down my gift. That is truly a tragedy. I hope you find solace in the knowledge that your dear Jamie is with the gods, along with your second born. We do. It's what's gotten us through his loss. Mrs. Tulis gently rocked the baby. We come today to hope. To ask. She trailed off, seeming unable to finish. It was her husband who took over for her. 
We came here today to ask that our son not be considered for the right when he comes of age. A rolling gasp echoed through the chamber, coming from all sides at once. Mr. Tullis's shoulders stiffened, but he forged ahead. I know that it's a lot to ask of you and the gods. He is our third son, but we lost our first two, and my wife... As much as she desires more babies, the healers said she shouldn't have more. He is our only remaining child. He will be our last. But he is still your third son, the duke responded, and my chest hollowed. Whether your first thrived or not doesn't change that your second son, and now your third, are fated to serve the gods. But we have no other child, your grace. Mrs. Tullis's lower lip trembled as her chest rose and fell rapidly. If I were to get pregnant, I could die. We- I understand that. The tone of the Duke's voice didn't change. And you do understand that while we've been given great power and authority by the gods, the issue of the right is not something we can change. But you can speak with the gods. Mr. Tullis moved to step closer, but drew up short when several royal guards shifted forward. A low murmur rose from the audience. I glanced to where Hawk stood. He was watching what I believed to be the Tullis's third tragedy play out before us, his jaw as hard as the limestone around us. Did he have a second or third brother or sister who had been given over to the right? One who may go on to serve the court and receive the blessing from the gods, and another he would never be able to see again? You can speak with the gods on our behalf, couldn't you? Mr. Tullis asked, his voice rough like sand. We are good people. Please. Tears rolled down the mother's face, and my fingers itched to reach out and touch her, to ease her pain even if for a little while. We beg you to at least try. We know the gods are merciful. We have prayed to Ios and Nyctos every morning and night for this gift. All we ask is that what you ask cannot be granted. Tobias is your third son, and this is the natural order of things. The duchess stated. A piercing sob left the woman. I know it's hard. And it hurts now, but your son is a gift to the gods, not a gift from them. That is why we would never ask that of them. Why not? What harm could there be in asking? Surely there were enough in service to the gods that one boy would not upset the natural order of things. And besides, some exceptions had been made in the past. My brother was proof of that. Many in the audience appeared rooted in shock, as if they could not believe the audacity of what was being asked. There were others, though, whose faces were soaked in sympathy and marked with anger. Their stares were fixed on the dais, on Duke and Duchess Tierman, and on me. Please, I beg of you, I beg. The father dropped to his knees, his hands folded as if in prayer. I gasped, my chest squeezing. I wasn't sure how it happened or why, but my control over my gift snapped and my senses opened. I sucked in a sharp breath as grief poured into me in icy waves. The potency shook my knees and I could barely breathe around it. A moment later, I felt Victor's hand on my back, and I knew he was prepared to grab me in case I went to them. It took everything in me to stand there and do nothing. Tearing my gaze away from Mr. Tullis, I forced out deep, even breaths. My wide eyes roamed the crowd as I pictured a wall in my mind, one as great as the rise, so tall and thick that no one's pain could breach it. That had always worked in the past, and it worked now. The claws of sorrow loosened their grip, but my gaze snagged on a blonde man, 
He stood several rows back, his chin bowed, and much of his face obscured by the curtain of hair that fell forward. I felt something burning through the wall I'd built, but it didn't quite feel like anguish. It felt hot, like physical pain, but this was, it was bitter tasting in the back of my throat, as if I'd swallowed acid. He had to be in pain, but unnerved, I closed my eyes and rebuilt the wall until all I felt was the pounding of my heart. After a few seconds, I was able to take a deeper, stronger breath. And finally, the strange sensation disappeared. I opened my eyes as the father pleaded, Please, we love our son, he cried. We want to raise him to be a good man to- He will be raised in the temples of Rahar and Ioni, where he will be cared for while in service to the gods, as it has been done since the first blessing. The duke's voice brooked no argument, and the woman's sobs deepened. Through us, the gods protect each and every one of you from the horrors outside the rise, from what comes in the mist, and all we must do is provide them with service. Are you willing to anger the gods to keep a child at home, to grow old or possibly sicken and die? Mr. Tullis shook his head, his face draining of all color. No, your grace, we would not want to risk that. But he is our son. That is what you ask, though. The duke cut him off. In one month from his birth, you will give him to the high priests, and you will be honored to do so. Unable to look at the tear-stricken faces any longer, I closed my eyes once more and wished I could somehow drown out the sounds of their heartbreak. However, even if I could, I wouldn't forget them. And truthfully, I needed to hear their pain. I needed to bear witness to it and remember. Serving the gods in the temples was an honor, but this was still a loss. Cease the tears, the duchess implored. You know that this is right, and what the gods have requested. But this didn't feel right. What harm could come in asking for one child to remain at home with his parents, to grow, to live, and to become a useful member of society? Neither the duke nor the duchess would bend to grant such a simple favor. How could anyone mortal be unmoved by the mother's pleas, her cries, and her husband's desolate hopelessness? But I already knew the answer to that. The ascended were no longer mortal. Chapter 10 I smothered a yawn as Tawny helped secure my veil in place, feeling like I hadn't gotten a moment of rest. My mind wouldn't shut down last night. I couldn't stop thinking about Melissa and Rylan, the threat of the Dark One, and what had happened with the Tulis family. The utter hopelessness that had drenched the mother's face as her husband had led her from the chamber haunted me as did the audience parting and giving them a wide berth. It was as if their request had left the Tulises with an infectious taint. As they left, cradling their infant, their heartbreak had projected, becoming a tangible, lingering entity. But that wasn't the only part of this that preyed upon my mind. The look that had settled over Hawk's face as he watched the broken couple also kept resurfacing. Anger had hardened his jaw and pressed his lips into a firm, unyielding line. And he wasn't the only one in attendance who'd borne what could easily be construed as the mark of resentment. I thought of the blond man I'd seen and what I'd felt from him. It had to be some form of pain, as that was the only thing I could feel from others but it had reminded me of the anger that had settled into Hawk's features and in others. Men and women of different classes, who didn't look upon the Tulises with distaste, but had instead stared at the dais, unable to hide their displeasure and bitterness. Had some of them handed over third sons and daughters to the priests? Or would they soon be watching their second sons and daughters 
go to court after their right? Had the Duke and Duchess noticed those stairs? I doubted they did, but I was sure the royal guards had. As Victor had said, this was a time of unrest, and it was spreading. I didn't think all could be blamed on the dissenters. Some of the fault could be laid at the feet of the natural order of things, to the right, which was beginning to feel unnatural when extenuating circumstances such as the Tullus's plight were ignored. Could it be changed, the way things were done? That was another thing that had kept me awake. Surely the gods had enough sons and daughters to serve them. They had the entire kingdom. And maybe it could become a case-by-case basis when it came to those who served the gods at the time of their right. Many parents were honored to have their children do so. And for some, a lifetime in servitude to the gods was a far better life than the one they would have had if they remained at home. Could I change the order of things once I returned to the capital, before I ascended? Did I have that kind of power? Surely I had more than the ladies and lords in wait. As I was the maiden, I could speak to the queen on behalf of the Tulises. And if I ended up returning from the gods as one of the ascended, I could continue petitioning for change. I could at least try which was more than the Duke and Duchess were willing to do. That was what I'd decided before I'd finally drifted off to sleep, only to wake a few hours later to meet with Victor. You sound like you need a nap, Tawny commented, as she secured the final chain of the veil. If only I could do just that. I sighed. I have no idea how you can't nap during the day. She stepped to my side, tucking the ends of the veil, so the length fell down the center of my back. Give me any comfy chair and you'll be out cold in minutes. It makes me so jealous. I slipped my feet into white slippers with all too thin soles. Once the sun comes up, I can't sleep. That's because you can't stand to be idle, she responded. And sleeping requires a certain amount of idleness, which is something I excel at. I laughed. We all have to be good at something. She shot me a look just before a sharp rap sounded, and then Victor's voice rang out. Heading for the hall door, I groaned, even though I had expected his arrival. I was due to meet with Priestess Analia for prayers, but in reality, the time was generally spent with the priestess criticizing everything from my posture to the wrinkles in my gown. If you want to make a run for it, I'll tell Victor you jumped out the window, Tawny offered. I snorted. That would only buy me a five-second lead time. True. Tawny reached the door before me, all but throwing it open. The moment I saw Victor's face, I tensed. Deep grooves of tension bracketed his mouth. What happened? I asked. You've been summoned to meet with the Duke and Duchess, he announced, and knots of dread formed. Tawny sent me a quick, nervous glance. What for? I believe it has to do with who will replace Rylan, he said. And instead of feeling relief like I knew Tawny did, given how her shoulders loosened, my unease grew. Do you know who? I followed him out into the hall. He shook his head, sending a lock of sandy blonde hair across his forehead. I haven't been told. That wasn't exactly uncommon, but I would think that since Victor would be working closely with whoever replaced Rylan, he'd be one of the first to know. What about Priestess Analia? I asked ignoring the raised brows that Tawny directed at me as she fell into step beside me. And yes, I was surprised that I was asking, since jumping out a window would almost be preferable to spending an afternoon listening to all the things that were wrong with me. But a bad, anxious feeling had taken root in my stomach. She's been advised that there will be no session this week, Victor answered. I'm sure you're disappointed to hear that. Tawny stifled a giggle, 
as I stuck my tongue out at Victor's back. We made our way to the end of the otherwise vacant wing of the castle and headed to the narrow hallway that accessed the main staircase. The wide stone steps fed into a large foyer where servants dusted statues of Penelope and Rain. The eight-foot-tall limestone statues stood in the center of the circular space and were cleaned every afternoon. How there could even be a speck of dust or dirt on any part of the statue was beyond me. The foyer led to the front of the castle, where the great hall, sitting rooms, and atrium were located. However, Victor led us to the right of the statues, through the archway adorned with lush green garland. The large banquet table, designed to seat dozens, was cleared of all except for the golden vase in the center containing several long-stemmed, night-blooming roses. Air catching in my throat, my gaze latched on to the roses as we skirted the table, walking toward one of the doors to the right that had been left ajar. The sight of the flowers, the scent, I could practically smell the blood. Tawny lightly touched my shoulder, drawing my attention. I exhaled, forcing a smile. Her worried gaze lingered as Victor opened the door to one of the Tierman's many office spaces in the castle, this one used for less intimate meetings. My gaze swept the room, and my heart stopped. It wasn't because the Duke sat behind his black-painted desk, his pale head bent as he scoured whatever paper he held in his hand. Nor was it because the Duchess stood to the right of his desk, speaking with Commander Jansen. What caused the reaction was the dark-haired young man standing beside the commander, dressed in black and armored in leather and iron. My lips parted as my heart tumbled all the way to the pit of my stomach, while Tawny came to a sudden stop, blinking rapidly, as if she'd just walked into the room to find one of the gods. Slowly, she looked over at me, and the corners of her lips turned up. She looked curious and amused, and I was sure if she could see my face, I likely looked like I was five seconds from bolting from the room. In that moment, I really wished I'd told her about Hawk and the Red Pearl. I couldn't think of another reason why Hawk would be here with the commander. But I desperately clung to the hope that Victor had been wrong, and it had nothing to do with Ryland's replacement. But what other reason could there be? A sudden new fear took root. What if Hawk had discovered that it was me at the Red Pearl? Oh my gods, that seemed improbable. But wasn't Hawk becoming my guard just as unlikely? My heart seemed to restart and was now in a race with itself. The Duke looked up from his paper, his coolly handsome face giving me no indication of what was about to occur. Please, close the door, Victor. The stately room stood out in too vivid detail as Victor moved to obey the request. The royal crest painted in gold on a white marble wall behind the duke was blinding, and the bare walls were in stark contrast to the black chair rails that ran along the length and width of the room. There was only one chair besides the one the duke sat in. It was a plush, cream-colored wingback chair that the duchess usually occupied. The only other seating options were polished limestone benches, placed in three neat rows. The room was as cold as the Duke, but it was far better than the chamber he usually preferred, the one I'd been summoned to far too often. Thank you. Tierman nodded at Victor, his smile close-lipped as he lowered the paper to the desk. His black, fathomless eyes flicked to where I stood, just inside the door. His mouth tightened as he motioned me forward. Please, sit, Penelope. Legs oddly numb, I forced myself to cross the short distance, wholly aware of Hawk's gaze tracking my every step. I didn't need to look to know that he watched. His gaze was always that intense. 
I sat on the edge of the middle bench, folding my hands in my lap. Tawny took the bench behind me, while Victor moved to stand to my right, so he stood between me and the commander and Hawk. I hope you're feeling well, Penelope, the Duchess said, as she sat in the chair beside the desk. Hoping that I was only asked simple yes and no questions, I nodded. I'm relieved to hear that. I was worried that attending the city council so soon after your attack would be too much, she said. For once, I was beyond grateful for the veil, because if my face were visible, there'd be no hiding how ridiculous that concern was. I'd been bruised not seriously injured or shot through the chest with an arrow, as Rylan had. I would be fine. I was fine. Rylan would never be okay. What happened in the garden is why we're all here. The Duke took over, and muscles all along my neck and back began to tense. With the death of... His fair brow pinched as disbelief whirled through me. What was his name? he asked the Duchess, whose forehead creased. The guard. Rylan Keel, your grace, Victor answered before I blurted out his name. The Duke snapped his fingers. Ah, oh, yes, Ryan. With Ryan's death, you are down one guard. My hands curled into fists. Rylan, his name was Rylan, not Ryan. No one corrected him. Again, the Duke added after a pause, a faint twist of his lips forming a mockery of a smile. Two guards lost in one year. I hope this isn't becoming a habit. He said it as if it were somehow my fault. Anyway, with the upcoming right, and as you draw closer to your ascension, Victor cannot be expected to be the only one keeping a close watch on you. Tierman continued. We need to replace Ryan. I bit the inside of my cheek, which, as I'm sure you realize now, explains why Commander Jansen and Guard Flynn are here. I might have stopped breathing. Guard Flynn will take Ryan's place effective immediately, the Duke said, confirming what I had already guessed the moment I walked into the room, but hearing him say it aloud was an entirely different thing. I'm sure this is surprising, as he is new to our city and quite young for a member of the Royal Guard. I was wondering exactly that. The Duke sounded like he, too, was questioning it. There are several Rise Guards in line to be promoted, and bringing on Hawk is no slight to them. The Duke sat back, crossing one leg over the other. But the commander has assured us that Hawk is better suited to this task. I couldn't believe this was happening. Guard Flynn may be new to the city, but that isn't a weakness. He's able to look at possible threats with fresh eyes. Commander Jansen spoke up then, nearly parroting what Victor had said before. Any number of guards would have overlooked the potential of a breach occurring in the Queen's Gardens, not due to lack of skill. Debatable, murmured the Duke. The commander wisely continued without acknowledging the comment. But because there is a false sense of security and complacency that often comes with being in one city for too long, Hulk does not have such familiarity. He also has recent experience with the dangers outside the rise. The duchess spoke and my gaze sharpened on her. Your ascension is a little less than a year from now, but even if you're summoned sooner than expected, or at the time of your ascension, having someone with that kind of experience is invaluable. We won't have to pull from our huntsmen to ensure that your travel to the capital is as safe as possible. The dissenters and the dark one are not the only things to fear out there. As you know, I did know. And what she said made sense. There were fewer huntsmen, and not many guards were suited for travel outside the rise. Those who were had to excel at killing. 
Wasn't that what Hawk had said he was really good at? The possibility of you being summoned to the Capitol unexpectedly played a role in my decision, Jansen said. We plan trips outside the Rise at least six months in advance, and there could be a chance that when and if the Queen requests your presence in the Capitol, we'd have to wait for the Huntsman to return. With Hawk being assigned to you, we would be able, for the most part, to avoid that situation. The gods hated me. And that wasn't exactly surprising, considering all the things I regularly did that were forbidden. Maybe they had been watching, and this was my punishment. Because how in the world did the commander not think a single rise guard was better suited or qualified? Was Hawk that good? My head moved then without any command from my brain. I looked to where Hawk stood and found his gaze fixed on me. A shiver curled its way down my spine. He inclined his head in acknowledgement, and I swore there was a faint glimmer to his amber eyes, as if he were amused by all of this. But surely that had to be my paranoia. As a member of the Maiden's personal royal guard, it is likely that a situation may occur where you will see her unveiled. The Duchess's tone was soft, even a little sympathetic, and then it struck me. I knew what would occur now. It can be distracting seeing someone's face for the first time, especially a chosen, and that could interfere with your ability to protect her. That is why the gods allow this breach. For some reason, I'd been so caught up in fear of being discovered that I'd forgotten what had happened when Rylan was brought in to work with Victor. Commander Jansen, if you will please step outside, the Duke said, and my wide gaze shot to him. There was a smile on his face, one that was wholly pleased, and not at all forced and brittle. I didn't even realize the commander had left until the click of the door closing behind him jolted me. You are about to bear witness to what only a select few have seen, an unveiled maiden, Tierman announced to Hawk. But his gaze was centered on me, to where my hands trembled in my lap. A real smile appeared on his face, turning my stomach. Penelope, please reveal yourself. Chapter 11 there had been a handful of times in my life where reality felt more like a dream. The night I'd heard my mother's screams and my father's shouts to run was one of them. Everything had felt hazy, as if I was there but somehow disconnected from my body. My parents being slaughtered was far more serious and traumatizing than what was happening right now. Still, I was on the brink of possibly being discovered. And if Hawk told the Duke where I'd been, my mouth dried as a fist clenched deep in my chest. Perhaps there was some truth to what Victor had said about me wanting to be found unworthy. But even if that were true, I would want to be as far away from the Duke as possible, if and when that occurred. Hawk hadn't seen my full face the night at the Red Pearl but he'd seen enough that it could trigger recognition. At some point, he was bound to figure it out, probably after he heard me speak. However, I hadn't considered that moment occurring here, in front of the Duke and Duchess. Penelope, the Duke's tone carried a thread of warning. I was taking too long. We do not have all day. Give her a moment, Dorian. The Duchess turned to her husband. You know why she hesitates. We have time. I was not hesitating for the reason they believed, why the Duke smiled with such relish. Of course I was uncomfortable bearing my face, my scars in front of Hawk. Truthfully, though, that was the least of my concerns at the moment. But the Duke was probably internally screaming with twisted joy. The man absolutely loathed me. Dorian Tierman pretended that he didn't. 
that he thought I was this miracle born, a chosen, just like his wife believed, but I knew better. The time spent in his other office proved exactly how he felt about me. I wasn't sure what it was about me that he hated, but there had to be something. As far as I knew, he was at least somewhat decent toward the ladies and lords in wait. But me? He loved nothing more than discovering something that made me uncomfortable, only to then exploit it. And if I really wanted to make his day, I'd give him something to be disappointed in, a reason to continue his lessons. Face burning as if on fire, from anger and frustration more than embarrassment, I reached for the clasps along the chains at the same moment Tawny rose, nearly tearing them apart as I unhooked them. The veil loosened, and before it could fall, Tawny caught the sides and helped ease the headdress off. Cool air kissed my cheeks and the nape of my neck. I stared straight at the Duke. I wasn't sure what he saw in my face, but his smile faded and his eyes turned to shards of obsidian. His jaw clenched, and I knew I shouldn't, but I couldn't stop myself. I smiled. It was just a hint of a grin, one that probably wasn't noticeable to anyone but the Duke but he saw it. I knew he did. I was sure I'd pay for it later, but at that moment, I didn't care. Someone shifted to my right, ending my epic stare off with the Duke and reminding me that we weren't the only two in the room. He wasn't the only one looking at me. The right side of my face was visible to Hawk, the side that the Duke often said was beautiful the side I imagined matched my mother's. Drawing in a shallow breath, I turned my head until I completely faced Hawk. No side profiles, no hiding or mask that covered the two scars. My hair was secured in a braid and then wrapped in a knot, so it too provided no curtain. He saw everything that had been bared at the red pearl, and then some. He saw the scars. I braced myself, just like the Duke knew I would, because deep down, whether Tierman knew why or not, Hawk's reaction would affect me. It would hurt more than it should, but I'd be damned if I'd let it show. Lifting my chin, I waited for the look of shock or revulsion, or even worse, pity. I expected nothing less. Beauty was highly coveted and worshipped, flawlessness even more, because beauty was considered godlike. Hawk's golden gaze roamed my face, his stare so potent that it felt like a caress along the scars, my cheeks, then my lips. A shiver danced across my shoulders as his eyes came back to mine, our gazes locked, held. The air seemed to be sucked from the room, and I felt flushed, as if I'd been sitting out in the sun for too long. I didn't know what I saw as I stared back at him, but there was no shock etched to his expression, no revulsion, and especially, no pity. His face wasn't empty, exactly. There was something there, in his eyes and in the set of his mouth but I had no idea what it was. But then the Duke spoke, his tone deceptively pleasant. She's truly unique, isn't she? I stiffened. Half of her face is a masterpiece, the Duke murmured, and my skin flashed cold and then hot as my stomach twisted. The other half, a nightmare. A tremor coursed down my arms but I kept my chin high and resisted the urge to pick up something, anything, and throw it at the Duke's face. The Duchess spoke, though saying what, I wasn't sure. Hawk's gaze remained fastened on mine as he stepped forward. Both halves are as beautiful as the whole. My lips parted on a sharp inhale. I couldn't even look to see what the Duke's reaction was, 
though I was sure it was nothing short of cataclysmic. Hawk placed a hand on the hilt of his broadsword and bowed slightly, his gaze never once leaving mine. With my sword and with my life, I vowed to keep you safe, Penelope. He spoke, voice deep and smooth, reminding me of rich, decadent chocolate. From this moment until the last moment, I am yours. Closing my bedroom door behind me, I leaned against it and exhaled raggedly. He'd said my name when he took his vow as my guard. Not what I was, but who I was. And that was, that wasn't the way it was supposed to be. With my sword and with my life, I vow to keep you safe, maiden the chosen. From this moment until the last moment, I am yours. That was how Victor had sworn his oath, as did Hannes, and then Rylan. Had the commander not informed Hawk of the correct words? I couldn't imagine he'd forget. The look on the Duke's face, once Hawk had straightened, could have set fire to wet grass. Tawny spun to face me, the pale blue gown she wore swishing around her feet. Hawk Flynn is your guard, Poppy. I know. Poppy, she repeated my name, practically shouting it. That, she pointed to the hall, is your guard. My heart toppled over itself. Keep your voice down. I peeled away from the door and took her hand, pulling her farther into the chamber. He's probably standing outside. As your personal guard, she stated for the third time. I know. Heart thumping, I pulled her toward the window. And I know that this is going to sound terrible, but I have to say it. I can't contain it. Her eyes were wide with excitement. It's a vast improvement. Tawny? I replied, slipping my hand free of hers. I know, I recognize that it was terrible, but I had to say it. She pressed her hand to her chest as she glanced back to the door. He's quite exciting to look at. Indeed, and he's clearly interested in moving up the ranks. Her brows knitted as she turned back to me. Why would you say that? I stared at her, wondering if she'd paid any attention to what the Duke had said. Have you ever heard of a royal guard that young? Tawny's nose scrunched. No, you haven't. That's what befriending the commander of the royal guard will do for you. I pointed out, heart thumping. I cannot believe that there was no other royal guard just as qualified. She opened her mouth, closed it and then her eyes narrowed. You're having a very strange, unexpected reaction. I crossed my arms. I don't know what you mean. You don't? You've watched him train in the yard. I have not. I totally had. Tawny cocked her head to the side. I've been with you on more than one occasion as you watched the guards train from the balcony. And you weren't watching just any guard. You were watching him. I snapped my mouth shut. You seem almost angry about him being named your guard. And unless there's something you haven't told me, then I have no idea why. There was a lot that I hadn't told her. The suspicion in her gaze grew as she studied me. What haven't you told me? Has he said something to you before? When would I have had a chance for him to speak to me? I said weakly. As much as you creep around this castle, I'm sure there's a lot you overhear that doesn't actually require you speaking to someone. She pointed out, and then stepped forward, her voice lowered. Did you overhear him say something bad? I shook my head. Poppy? The last thing I wanted was for her to think Hawk had done something wrong. That was why I blurted out what I did. Or maybe it was because I had to say something. I kissed him. Her lips parted. What? 
Or he kissed me, I corrected. Well, we kissed each other. There was a mutual kiss. I get it, she shrieked, and then took a visible deep breath. When did this happen? How did this happen? And why am I just now hearing about this? I plopped down in one of the wing-back chairs by the fireplace. It was, it was the night I went to the Red Pearl. I knew it. Tawny stomped her slippered foot. I knew something else had happened. You were acting too weird, too worried about being in trouble. Oh, I want to throw something at you. I can't believe you haven't said anything. I would be screaming this from the top of the castle. You'd be screaming it because you could. Nothing would happen to you but me? I know, I know, it's forbidden and all that. She hurried over to the other chair and sat, leaning toward me. But I'm your friend. You're supposed to tell your friends these kinds of things. Friend. I wanted so very badly to believe that we were, that we'd be that if she weren't bound to me. I'm sorry I didn't say anything. It's just that I've done a lot of things I shouldn't do, but this, this is different. I thought if I didn't say anything, it would, I don't know, go away? That the gods wouldn't know? Tawny shook her head. If the gods know now, they knew then, Poppy. I know, I whispered, feeling terrible. But I couldn't tell her why I'd kept it to myself. I didn't want to hurt her, and I sensed that this would. I wouldn't need my touch to know that. I'll forgive you for not telling me if you tell me what happened in very, very graphic detail, she said. I cracked a grin, and then I did just that. Well, almost that. As I slowly unhooked my veil and draped it across my lap, I told her how I'd come about to be in the room with him, and how he thought I was Britta. I told her how he offered to do whatever I wanted, once he realized that I wasn't her, and that he'd asked me to wait for him to return. But I didn't tell her how he'd kissed me elsewhere. Tawny stared at me with more awe than even Agnes had when she realized I was the maiden. Oh my gods, Poppy. I nodded slowly. I so wish you'd stayed. Tawny, I sighed. What? You can't say you don't wish you'd stayed, not just a little bit. I couldn't say that. I bet you wouldn't be a maiden any longer if you had. Tawny! What? She laughed. I'm kidding. But I bet you'd barely be a maiden. Tell me, did you enjoy it? The kissing? I bit down on my lip, almost wishing that I could lie. Yes, I did. Then why are you so upset that he's your guard? Why? Your hormones must be clouding your rational thought. My hormones are always clouding my rational thought, thank you very much. I snorted. He's going to recognize me. He has to once he hears me speak, right? I imagine. What if he goes to the Duke and tells him that I was at the Red Pearl, that I allowed him to kiss me, and do more, but at this point the kissing would be bad enough. He has to be one of the youngest royal guards, if not the youngest. It's clear he's interested in advancement, and what better way to secure that than to gain the duke's favor? You know how his favorite guards or staff are treated? They're practically treated better than those on the court. I don't think he has an interest in gaining his grace's favor, she argued. He said you were beautiful. I'm sure he was just being kind. She stared at me, as if I'd just admitted to snacking on dog hair. First off, you are beautiful. You know that. I'm not saying that to fish for compliments. I know, but I felt the overwhelming need to remind you of such. She gave me a quick, broad smile. He didn't have to say anything in response to the Duke being a general ass. My lips twitched. He could have just ignored it and proceeded on to the Royal Guard Oath, which, by the way, he made sound like 
sex. Yes, I admitted, thinking I wouldn't have realized that before the night in the red pearl. Yes, he did. I almost needed to fan myself, just so you know. But back to the more important part of this development. Do you think he's already recognized you? I don't know. I let my head fall back against the seat. I wore a mask that night, and he didn't remove it. But I think I would recognize someone in or out of a mask. She nodded. I would like to think that I would, and I would definitely hope that a royal guard would. Then that means he chose not to say anything. He hadn't said anything as both Victor and he had escorted us to my chambers. Although he might not have recognized me, it was dimly lit in that room. If he didn't, then I imagine he will when you speak, as you said. It's not like you can be completely silent every time you're around him, she stated. That would be suspicious. Obviously. And odd. Agreed. I toyed with the chains on the veil. I don't know. Either he didn't, or he did, and chose not to say anything. Maybe he's planning to lord it over my head or something. Her brows slammed down. You're an incredibly suspicious person. I started to deny that, but realized I couldn't. I wisely moved along. He probably just didn't recognize me. A weird mixture of relief and disappointment mingled with the thrill of anticipation. You know what? What? I don't know if I'm relieved or disappointed that he didn't recognize me, or if I'm excited that he might have. Shaking my head, I laughed. I just don't know. But it doesn't matter. What, what happened between us was one time only. It was just this thing. It can't happen again. Sure, she murmured. Not that I'm even thinking he'd want to do any of that again, especially now that he knows it was me, if he does. Uh-huh. But what I'm trying to say is that it's not a thing to even consider. What he does with the knowledge is the only thing that matters. I finished with a nod. Tawny looked as if she were seconds away from clapping. You know what I think? I'm half afraid to hear it. Her brown eyes glimmered. Things are about to get so much more exciting around here. Chapter 12 Early afternoon the following day, I sat in the airy, sun-drenched atrium with Tawny, and not one, but two ladies in wait, wondering how I'd ended up in this situation. My trips outside my chambers were always well-timed, especially when I came to the atrium, so no one but me would be in the room. When I arrived some thirty minutes ago, it was empty as usual. That had changed within minutes of sitting down and picking at the tiny sandwiches Tawny had confiscated from another room. Lauren and Daphina had arrived, and while I sat as I'd been groomed to do, hands clasped lightly in my lap, ankles crossed and feet tucked behind the ivory hem of my gown, I shouldn't be in the room. Not while the ladies-in-wait were present, since they'd cozied up to the table where Tawny and I had sat at. The situation could easily be construed as me interacting with them, which was one of the many things expressly forbidden by the priests and priestesses. Interaction was, in their words, too familiar. I wasn't interacting, though. I imagined I was the picture of well-bred serenity, or I could easily be mistaken for one of the statues of the veiled maidens. I may appear calm on the outside, but internally... I was nothing more than an exhausted, frazzled ball of nerves. Some of it had to do with the lack of any restful sleep the night prior. Well, to be honest, for the last several days. It was also partly due to the fact that I knew I was going to be blamed for Daphina's and Lauren's presence. I didn't even know if I was allowed to be in the atrium. It had never been an issue before, and no one had ever spoken to me about it. However, no one other than a stray servant or guard had ever shown up in the atrium while I'd been here before. They weren't the only reasons I was a mess of anxious, restless energy, though. 
The primary cause stood catty corner from where I sat, hand braced on the hilt of his sword, amber colored eyes constantly alert. Hawk. It was strange to glance over and see him standing there. And it wasn't just because it was usually Rylan who watched over these afternoon brunches Tawny and I sometimes took in the atrium. It was how different it was with Hawk being there. Normally, Rylan had stared out into the garden or spent the majority of the time speaking with one of the other royal guards who were nearby as he lingered just inside the entrance. Not Hawk. He found the one area in the room where he had a view of the entire brightly lit space and the gardens outside the atrium. Luckily, the windows didn't face the roses. Unluckily, I often found myself staring at the fountain of the veiled maiden. In just one day, it had become almost painfully evident how lax Rylan had gotten in terms of security. Granted, there hadn't been an attempt before, but he had softened. I hated even acknowledging that. It felt like a betrayal to do so. But that wasn't the only thing that made this brunch so very different from the ones before. Another thing that made it so different was the appearance of the two ladies in wait. I suspected that this was the first time they'd even been in the atrium since they arrived at Castle Tierman after their rights. Daphina, a second daughter of a rich merchant, fluttered a silk lilac-hued folding fan as if she were attempting to end the life of an insect only she could see. While the late morning sun poured in through the windows, the atrium was still cool, and I doubted Dafina had grown overheated between eating cucumber sandwiches and sipping tea. Beside her, Lauren, the second daughter of a successful trader, had all but given up on sewing the tiny crystals onto her mask that was to be worn during the upcoming rite, and had fully committed herself to watching every move the dark-haired royal guard made. I was confident she knew just how many breaths Hawk took in a minute. Deep down, I knew why I hadn't risen and left the room like I was supposed to, like I knew Tawny waited for me to do. I understood why I was so willing to risk censure for simply sitting and minding my own business. I was enthralled by the antics of the two ladies in wait. Lauren had already done several things to catch Hawk's attention. She'd dropped her pouch of crystals, which Hawk had gallantly assisted her in retrieving, while she pretended to be engrossed with a blue-winged bird hopping along the branches of a tree close to the windows. That had provoked Daphina to feign a faint, due to what I had no idea. Somehow the neckline of her blue gown had slipped so far, I wondered how she managed not to fall out of it. I couldn't fall out of my dress if it was on fire. My gown was all flowing sleeves, tiny beads, and a bodice that nearly reached my neck. The material was far too thin and delicate for me to sheathe the dagger to my thigh. As soon as I could change into something else, the blade would be back where it belonged. Ever the gentleman, Hawk had escorted Dafina to the chaise and brought her a glass of mint water. Not to be outdone, Lauren had then swooned from a sudden inexplicable headache that she'd quickly recovered from once Hawk had brandished a smile the one that showed the dimple in his right cheek. There'd been no headache, just as there'd been no faint. I had opened up my senses out of curiosity and felt no pain or anguish from either of them, other than a thread of sadness. I thought that might be due to Melissa's death, even though neither spoke of her. You know what I heard? Daphina snapped her fan as she dragged her teeth over her lower lip, glancing toward Hawk. Someone, she threw out the word and then lowered her voice, has been a rather frequent visitor to one of those, her gaze flicked to me, one of those dens in the city. Dens? Tawny asked, giving up, pretending that they weren't there. Not that I could blame her, she was friends with them, and while the ladies in wait were well aware that they probably shouldn't be sitting with me, Tawny appeared just as entertained as I was by their antics. 
Daphina sent her a meaningful look. You know the kind, where men and women often go to play cards and other games. Tawny's brows lifted. You're talking about the Red Pearl? I was trying to be discreet. Daphina sighed, her glance darting pointedly in my direction. But yes. I almost laughed at Daphina's attempt to shield me from the knowledge of such a place. I wondered what she'd do if she knew I'd been there. And what have you heard he does at such a place? Tawny nudged me with her foot under the table. I imagine he's there to play cards, right? Or do you? Pressing a hand to her chest, she slumped in her chair and sighed. A curl slipped free from the elaborate twist that was trying and failing to contain her hair. Or do you think he engages in other, more illicit games? Tawny knew exactly what Hawk did at the Red Pearl. I wanted to kick her, like a maiden, of course. I'm sure playing cards is all he does. Lauren arched a brow as she pressed her yellow and red fan against the deep blue of her dress. The contrast of the fan and gown was atrocious and also interesting. My gaze dipped to her mask. Crystals of every color were already sewn into the material. I was sure it would look like a rainbow had vomited all over her face once she finished. If that is all he does, then that would be a disappointment. I imagine he does what everyone does when they go there, Tawny said humor dripping like syrup from her words. Find someone to spend quality time with. Her mischievous gaze slid to mine. I was going to replace the sugars Tawny loved to dump into her coffee with coarse salt. She knew I wouldn't chime in, that I couldn't. I wasn't allowed to speak to the ladies, and I still hadn't spoken to Hawk or around him. And other than Hawk asking if I wished to do anything after supper last night, to which I had shaken my head no, he hadn't spoken to me either. Like before, I wasn't sure if I was relieved or disappointed. You shouldn't suggest such things in current company, Daphina suggested. Tawny choked on her tea, and behind the veil my eyes rolled. I imagine if Miss Willow were alive today, she would have snared him in her web, Lauren said, and my interest was piqued. Was she talking about the Willa Collins? And then wrote about him in her diary. She was. Miss Willa Collins was a woman who'd lived in Macedonia some 200 years ago. She'd apparently had a very active love life. Miss Collins had detailed her rather scandalous affairs quite explicitly in her journal, and it had been filed away in the city Athenaeum as some sort of historical account. I made a mental note to ask Tawny to retrieve that journal for me. I heard that she only wrote about her most skilled partners. Daphina whispered with a giggle. So, if he made it onto those pages, you know what that means. I did know what that meant, because of him. My gaze drifted to where Hawk stood, the black breeches and tunic molded to his body like a second skin. And I couldn't blame Daphina or Lauren for how their gazes seemed to find their way back to him every couple of minutes. He was tall, with lean muscle, and the sheathed sword at his waist along with the one at his side said he was prepared for more than just fainting ladies. The white mantle of the royal guard was a new addition, draped over the back of his shoulders. But he also filled the air with a certain type of unquantifiable tension, as if the room were electrified. Anyone around him had to be aware of that. My gaze drifted over his chest, and the memory of how hard it had felt, even without the armor, sent heat creeping into my cheeks. A newly familiar heaviness settled in my chest, making the silk of my dress feel coarse against my suddenly sensitive and flushed skin. Maybe one of those stupid fans would be useful.
swallowing a groan. I wanted to smack myself in the face. But since that wasn't exactly an option, I took a sip of my tea, trying to ease the inexplicable dryness in my throat, and focused on Daphina and Lauren once more. They were talking about the right, their excitement a heady hum. The celebration was just a week away, on the night of the harvest moon. Their excitement was infectious. With it being my first right, I would be there, masked and not in white. Most would have no idea that I was the maiden. Well, the two guards who were sure to be with me at all times would probably give me away to those paying attention. Still, a thrill of anticipation-laced uncertainty curled its way through me as my gaze slowly ticked its way back to Hawk. My stomach tumbled. If he saw me in the mask, would he know I was the one who'd been in the room with him? Would that even matter? By the time of the rite, he would have to know I was one and the same, wouldn't he? If he hadn't realized it already, he stood with feet shoulder width apart, his gaze on our little group. The sunlight almost seemed drawn to him, caressing his cheekbones and brow like a lover. His profile was flawless, the line of his jaw as chiseled as the statues that adorned the garden and the castle foyer. You know that it has to mean that he's near, Lauren was saying. Prince Castile. My head snapped in her direction in shock. I had no idea what she was talking about or how the subject had come up, but I couldn't believe she had actually spoken his name aloud. My lips parted. No one other than the dissenters would dare utter his actual name, and I doubted that any of them would even speak it in the castle. It was treasonous to call him a prince. He was the dark one. Daphina was frowning. Because of the, she glanced at me, her brows knitted. Because of the attack? It was only then that I realized they must have been talking about the attempted kidnapping while I'd been... Well, while well, I'd been doing exactly what they had been doing earlier, staring and thinking about Hawk. Besides that, Lauren returned to threading a blood-red crystal to her mask. I overheard Britta saying so this morning. The maid, Daphina huffed. Yes, the maid. The dark-haired lady in wait lifted her chin. They know everything. Daphina laughed. Everything? She nodded as she lowered her voice. People speak about anything in front of them, no matter how intimate or private. It's almost like they're ghosts in a room. There's nothing they don't overhear. Lauren had a point. I'd seen it myself with the Duchess and the Duke. What did Britta say? Tawny placed her cup on the table. Lauren's dark eyes flicked to me and then moved back to Tawny. She said... That Prince Castile had been spotted in Three Rivers. That it was he who started the fire that took Duke Everton's life. How could anyone claim that? Tawny demanded. No one who has ever seen the Dark One will speak of what he looks like, or has lived long enough to give any description of him. I don't know about that, argued Daphina. I heard from Ramsay that he is bald, and has pointy ears, and is pale, just like, you know what. I resisted the urge to snort. Atlanteans looked just like us. Ramsay, one of his grace's stewards. Tawny arched a brow. I should have stated how could anyone credible claim that. Britta claims that the few who've seen Prince Castile say he's actually quite handsome. Lauren added. Oh, really? Mused Daphina. Lauren nodded as she knotted the crystal to her mask. She said that was how he gained access to Goldcrest Manor. Her voice dropped. That Duchess Everton developed a relationship of a physical nature with him without realizing who he was. And that was how he was able to move freely through the manor. Britta sure talked a lot, didn't she? Nearly all of what she says turns out to be true. Lauren shrugged, 
as she worked an emerald green crystal beside the red. So, she could be right about Prince Castile. You should really stop saying that name, Tawny advised. If someone overhears you, you'll be sent to the temples faster than you can say, I knew better. Lauren's laugh was light. I'm not worried. I'm not foolish enough to say such things where I can be overheard. And I doubt anyone present will say anything. Her gaze flicked to me, brief but knowing. She knew I couldn't say a word because I'd have to explain how I was even a part of the conversation. Which, for the record, I wasn't. I was just sitting here. What? What if he was actually here? Lauren gave a delicate shudder. In the city, now. What if that was how he gained access to Castle Tierman? Her eyes lit up. Befriended someone here, or perhaps even poor Melissa? You don't sound all that concerned by the prospect. Tawny picked up her cup. To be blunt, you sound excited. Excited? No. Intrigued? Possibly. She lowered the mask to her lap, sighing. Some days are just so dreadfully dull. The shock of her statement caused me to forget who I was and where I was. All that I managed to do was keep my voice low when I spoke. So a good old rebellion may liven things up for you. Dead men and women and children are a source of entertainment? Surprise flickered across both her and Dafina's faces. It was probably the first time either had ever heard me speak. Lauren swallowed. I suppose I, I might have misspoken, maiden. I apologize. I said nothing. Please ignore Lauren, pleaded Dafina. Sometimes she speaks without any thought and means nothing by it. Lauren nodded emphatically, but I didn't doubt that she'd meant exactly what she said. A rebellion would break up the monotony of her day, and she hadn't thought of the lives affected or lost, because she simply hadn't cared to. It happened then, once more without any warning, causing my body to jerk forward and my spine to stiffen. My gift reached out on its own, and before I even realized it was happening, that invisible link formed between Lauren and me. A sensation came through the connection, a mixture that reminded me of fresh air on a warm day, and then something acrid, like bitter melon. I focused on the sensations as my heart thumped against my ribs. They felt like excitement and fear as Lauren stared at me as if she wished to say something additional. But that couldn't be what I was picking up on from Lauren. It didn't make any sense. Those emotions had to be coming from me and somehow influencing my gift. Dafina grabbed her friend's arm. Come, we should be on our way. Not given much choice, Lauren was hauled out of her seat and quickly escorted out of the room with Dafina whispering in her ear. I think you scared them, Tawny said. Lifting a trembling hand, I took a quick sip of the sweet lemon drink. I had no idea what had just happened. Poppy? Tawny touched my arm lightly. Are you okay? I nodded as I carefully placed the cup down. Yes, I'm just... How could I explain it? Tawny didn't know much about the gift, but even if she did, I wasn't sure I could have put it into words, or be sure that anything had actually happened. I looked over at her and opened my senses. Like at first with Dafina and Lauren, all I felt was a twinge of sorrow, no deep pain or anything I shouldn't be feeling. My heart slowed and my body relaxed. I sat back, wondering if it was just stress causing my gift to behave so oddly. Tawny stared at me, concern creeping into her expression. I'm okay, I told her, still keeping my voice low. I just can't believe what Lauren said. Neither can I, but she's always been amused by the most morbid things. Like Dafina said, she means nothing by it. I nodded, thinking that whether or not she meant anything by it didn't exactly matter. 
I took another sip of the drink, relieved to find that my hand wasn't trembling. Feeling measurably more normal, I chalked up the weirdness to stress and lack of sleep. My thoughts returned to the dark one. He would be behind the attacks and might very well be after me. But none of that meant he was actually within the city. However, if he were, unease trickled through me as I thought about Goldcrest Manor. It wasn't impossible for something like that to happen here, especially considering an Atlantean and a dissenter had already infiltrated the castle grounds. What are you going to do? Tawny whispered. About the Dark One possibly being in the city? I replied, confused. What? No. She squeezed my arm. About him. Him? I glanced at Hawk. Yes, him. Sighing, she let go of my arm. Unless there is another guy you've made out with while your identity was concealed? Yes, there are many. They have an actual club. I replied dryly as she rolled her eyes. There's nothing for me to do. Have you even spoken to him? She tapped her chin, glancing at him. No. She tilted her head. You do realize you will have to actually speak in front of him at some point. I'm speaking right now, I pointed out, even though I knew that wasn't what she'd meant. Her eyes narrowed. You're whispering, Poppy. I can barely hear you. You can hear me just fine, I told her. She looked as if she wanted to kick me under the table again. I have no idea how you haven't confronted him yet. I understand the risks involved, but I would have to know if he recognized me. And if he did, why hasn't he said anything? It's not like I don't want to know, I glanced at Hawk. But there's... I stiffened as Hawk's gaze connected with mine and held. He was looking straight at me, and even though I knew he couldn't see my eyes, it still felt like he could. There was no way he could hear Tawny and me, not from where he stood and with as quietly as I was speaking. But his stare was piercing, as if he could see not only through me, but into me. I tried to brush off the sensation, but the longer he held my gaze, the more the feeling increased. It had to be his eyes and their color. Such a strange, stunning golden hue. One could imagine all sorts of things while staring into those eyes. He broke eye contact, pivoting toward the entryway. My breath left me in a ragged exhale, my heart hammering as if I were running across the rise once more. That was intense, Tawny murmured. I blinked giving a shake of my head as I turned to her. What? That. Her brows were lifted. You and Hawk, staring one another down? And no, I can't see your eyes, but I knew you two were engaged in a rather heated one-on-one -on -one there. I could feel warmth creep into my cheeks. He's just doing his job, and I, I just lost track of what I was saying. Tawny lifted her brow. Is that so? Of course. I smoothed my hands over the lap of my dress. So he was just making sure you're still alive and breathing? Hawk suggested, startling both of us. He stood a mere foot from where we sat, having moved with the stealth of a trained guard and the quiet of a ghost. Since I am responsible for keeping her alive, making sure she's breathing would be a priority. My shoulders stiffened. How much had he overheard? Tawny made a poor attempt to smother her giggle with a napkin. I'm relieved to hear that. If not, I'd be remiss in my duty, would I not? Uh, yes, your duty? She lowered her napkin. Between protecting Poppy with your life and limb and gathering spilled crystals, you are very busy. Don't forget, assisting weak ladies in wait to the nearest chair before they faint, he suggested. Those strange, mesmerizing eyes glinted with a hint of mischief, and I was as transfixed with him as I'd been with the ladies in wait. 
This was the hawk I'd met in the Red Pearl. A well of pain hidden behind a teasing and charming personality. I'm a man of many talents. I'm sure you are, Tawny replied with a grin, while I fought the urge to reach out with my senses. His gaze flicked to her, and the dimple in his right cheek appeared. Your faith in my skills warms my heart, he said, glancing at me. Poppy. My eyes widened behind the veil as I clamped my mouth shut. Tawny sighed. It's her nickname. Only her friends call her that, and her brother. Ah, the one who lives in the capital, he questioned, still looking at me. I nodded. Poppy, he repeated in a way that made it sound as if my name was wrapped in chocolate and would roll off his tongue. I like it. I gave him a tight smile to match how the muscles in my lower stomach suddenly felt. Is there a threat of stray crystals we need to be aware of? Or is there something you need, Hawk? Tawny asked. There are many things I'm in need of, he replied, as his gaze slid back to me. Tawny tipped forward as if she couldn't wait to hear what those things were. But we'll need to discuss that later. You've been summoned by the Duke, Penelope. I'm to escort you to him at once. Tawny grew so very still I wasn't sure if she took another breath. Ice drenched my insides. Summoned by the Duke so quickly after yesterday? I knew it wasn't for idle conversation. Did Lord Mazine make good on his threat and go to the Duke? Or was it because of how I'd stared back at the Duke and smiled when I was unveiled? Had he found out that I had stabbed the man who attempted to kidnap me? While most would celebrate that I'd been able to thwart the abduction, Duke Tierman would focus solely on the fact that I'd been carrying a dagger. Could someone have seen me in here and already reported back to him? Had he found out about the Red Pearl? My stomach dropped as I stared up at Hawk. Had he said something? Gods. The options were truly limitless, and none of them were good. Stomach churning as if I'd swallowed spoiled milk, I managed to plaster a smile on my face as I rose from the chair. I'll await you in your chambers, Tawny said, and I nodded. Hawk waited until I was past him before falling in step slightly behind me, a position that allowed him to react to threats from the front and back. I led us out into the hall, where shimmering white and gold tapestries hung from the walls, and servants in maroon gowns and tunics scurried, carrying out various tasks that kept the large household running. He didn't lead me toward the banquet hall. He aimed for the staircase, and my stomach sank even further. We crossed the foyer and had neared the foot of the wide stairs before he asked, Are you all right? I nodded. Both you and your maid seemed disturbed by the summons. Tawny's not a maid, I blurted out, and then immediately cursed up a storm in my mind. It was silly to have tried not to speak, but it would have been better for it to have occurred when we weren't in the foyer, surrounded by any number of people, and I would have liked to have lasted at least an entire day. I braced myself as I snuck a peek at him. He stared. Expression utterly unreadable. If he recognized my voice, he showed no sign whatsoever. That strange mixture of disappointment and relief hit me once more as I stared straight ahead. Did he seriously not know it had been me in that room? Then again, should I be surprised? He'd believed that I'd been Britta at first, and had no problem continuing on when he realized I wasn't her. Who knew how many random women he- Is she not? He queried. She may be a lady in wait, but I was advised that she was duty bound to be your lady's maid, your companion. She is, but she's not. I glanced over at him as the stone staircase curved. One hand rested on the hilt of the sword at his waist. She's- She was duty bound to be my companion. 
It doesn't matter. Nothing is wrong. He looked over at me then. Well, he looked down at me, even though I was a step higher than he was. He was still taller, which seemed unfair. One dark brow rose, his gaze questioning. What? I asked, heart seizing as I lifted my foot, but not high enough. I tripped. Hawk reacted fast, curving his hand above my elbow, steadying me. Embarrassment flooded my system as I muttered, Thank you. No insincere thanks are required or needed. It's my duty to keep you safe. He paused, even from treacherous staircases. I took a deep, even breath. My gratitude was not insincere. My apologies then. I didn't have to look at him to know he was grinning, and I'd bet that stupid dimple was gracing the world with its presence. He fell quiet then, and we reached the third floor landing in silence. One hall led to the old wing, to my chambers and many of the household staff. To the left was the newer wing. Stomach full of tiny lead balls, I turned left. My mind was now so fixated on what awaited me that I wasn't all that focused on Hawk's apparent lack of recognition or what it meant if he did recognize it was me and just wasn't saying anything. Hawk reached the wide wooden doors at the end of the hall, his arm brushing my shoulder as he opened one side. He waited until I had entered the narrow spiral staircase. Sunlight poured in through the numerous oval-shaped windows. Watch your step. You trip and fall here, you're likely to take me out on your way down. I huffed. I won't trip. But you just did. That was a rarity. Well then, I feel honored that I bore witness to it. I was glad he couldn't see my face then, and not out of fear of recognition, but because I was sure my eyes were so wide, they took up my entire upper face. He was speaking to me in a way no other guard did, besides Victor. Not even Rylan had been so familiar. It was as if we had known each other for years instead of hours. Or days, whatever. The comfortable way he was talking to me was disconcerting. He eased past me, reaching the entryway to the fourth floor. I've seen you before, you know. My breath hitched, and only by the grace of the gods did I not trip again. I've seen you on the lower balconies. Holding open the door, he gestured for me to enter. Watching me train. Heat blasted my cheeks. That had not been what I'd expected him to say. I wasn't watching you, I was taking in the fresh air, waiting for your lady's maid, who is not a maid. Hawk caught my arm as I walked past him, stopping me. He lowered his head until his lips were mere inches from my veil-covered ear, and whispered, perhaps I was mistaken, and it wasn't you. Surrounded by the earthy, woodsy scent of him, my breath caught. We were nowhere near as close as we were the night of the Red Pearl, but if I tilted my head to the left just a few inches, his mouth would touch mine. The curling motion inside me returned, settling even lower in my stomach this time. You are mistaken. He let go of my arm, and when I looked up, I saw that the corner of his lips was tipped up. My heart was doing funny, strange things in my chest as I stepped into the airy hall, my pulse thrumming. Two royal guards were stationed outside the private quarters of the Duke and Duchess. There were several rooms on the floor used for greeting various members of the house and court. Both had their own spaces and suites that connected to bedchambers. But based on where the royal guards stood, I knew the Duke was in the main suite. Unease returned, slithering through my veins. For a brief moment, I'd forgotten about why I could have been summoned. Penelope, Hawk said from behind me. Only then did I realize two things. One, I'd come to a complete standstill in the hall, and I was sure that seemed odd to him. And secondly, he had called me by my name twice now instead of maiden.
He wasn't Victor. He wasn't Tawny, both of whom only called me by my name when we were alone. I knew I should correct his use of my given name. But I couldn't. I didn't want to. And that frightened me as much as what awaited me in the Duke's office. Taking a deep breath, I clasped my hands together as I straightened my shoulders and started forward. The royal guards avoided eye contact as they bowed upon our approach. The dark-skinned one stepped aside, his hand on the door. He started to open it. For some reason, I looked back at Hawk. Why? I had no idea. I'll wait for you here, he assured. I nodded and then faced forward again, forcing one foot in front of the other, telling myself that I was getting worked up over nothing. Stepping into the suite, the first thing I noticed was that the curtains had been drawn. The soft glow of several oil lamps seemed to be absorbed by the dark wood paneling and the furniture fashioned from mahogany and crimson-hued velvet. My gaze fell to the large desk and then the credenza behind it, where several crystal bottles of various sizes were full of amber liquor. Then I saw him. The duke sat on the settee, one booted foot resting on the table before him, a glass of liquor in his hand. Chills swept through me as he looked over at me with eyes so dark the pupil was almost indistinguishable. It made me think that when I next saw Ian, his eyes would no longer be green like mine. They'd be like the Duke's, pitch black, bottomless. But would they be as chilling? I suddenly realized that the Duke wasn't alone. Across from him was Lord Mazine, seated in an arrogant sprawl. He held no drink in his hands, but his fingers tapped idly on his bent knee. There was a smirk on his well-formed lips, and every instinct in me screamed that I needed to run because there was no fighting what was coming. The door clicked shut behind me, causing me to jump a little. I hated the response, hoping that the Duke hadn't seen it, and knowing that he had when I saw him smile. Tierman rose from the settee in one fluid, boneless movement. Penelope, I am so incredibly disappointed in you. Chapter 13 Cold to my very core, I drew in a short measured breath as I watched him take a drink from his glass. I knew I had to choose my words carefully. It wouldn't change what was to come but it could determine the severity. I'm sorry to have disappointed you, I started. I, do you even know what you have done that has disappointed me? Muscles in my shoulders stiffened, and my gaze darted from the silent lord to the corner of the suite, where several narrow pieces of reddish-brown wood were propped against a bookcase. They were fashioned from a tree that grew within the blood forest. When I looked back at Lord Mazine, I saw that he was smiling. I was beginning to think that he had reported something back to the Duke. But if I was wrong about that, it would only add to my problems. And Lord Mazine knew this as he watched me. He gave no indication of the role he played in this, even if his part was only to bear witness. He rarely spoke when he attended these lessons. While his silence would typically give me relief, it only heightened my anxiety now. I forced the next words out, even though they rolled off my tongue all wrong. I don't, but I'm sure whatever it is, I'm at fault. You are never disappointed in me without cause. That was so not true. There seemed to be times when the way I walked or how I cut my food at supper was a disappointment to the Duke. I was sure how many breaths I took in a minute could be of offense to him. You're right. I wouldn't be disappointed for no reason at all, he agreed. But this time, I find myself blindsided by what I've been told. My stomach turned over as sweat dotted my brow. Dear gods, had he learned of my time at the Red Pearl? I'd feared that Hawk would say something, 
had obsessed and stressed over it. A part of me must not have wanted to believe it was possible, though, because the ripe feeling of betrayal tasted like spoiled food in the back of my throat. Hawk most likely had no idea what went down in this room. But he had to have known there would be consequences, wouldn't he? He probably thought I'd receive nothing more than a stern lecture. After all, I was the maiden, the chosen. I would receive a dressing down, but I doubted Hawk had any idea that the Duke's lessons were not normal. Tierman took a step toward me, and all my muscles tensed up. Remove your veil, Penelope. I hesitated for only the span of a few heartbeats. Even though it was not uncommon for the Duke or the Duchess to request such a thing while in their presence. They didn't like speaking to half a face. I couldn't blame them. But normally the Duke made me keep it on when Lord Mazine was present. You do not want to test my patience. His grip had tightened on his glass. I'm sorry, it's just that we, we are not alone, and the gods forbade me from showing my face, I said, knowing full well that I'd done this before, but in situations vastly different. The gods will not find fault in today's proceedings, the duke interrupted. Of course not. Willing my hands steady, I lifted them and undid the fine clasps of the veil near my ears. The headdress immediately loosened. Keeping my gaze lowered as I knew he preferred, I slipped it off over where my hair had been bound in a simple knot at the nape of my neck. My exposed cheeks and brows prickled. Tierman came forward, taking the veil from me and placing it aside. I clasped my hands and waited. I hated doing so, but I waited. Lift your eyes, he demanded softly. And I did just that. His ebony gaze slowly tracked over my features, inch by inch, missing nothing, not even the wisps of burnt copper hair that I could feel curling against my temple. His perusal lasted an eternity. You grow more beautiful each time I see you. Thank you, Your Grace, I murmured, revulsion bubbling up in my stomach. I knew what was coming next. The tips of his fingers pressed into the skin under my chin, tilting my head to the left and then to the right. He clucked his tongue. Such a shame. And there it was. I said nothing as my focus shifted to the large oil painting of the temples, where veiled women knelt before a being who was so bright he rivaled the moon. What do you think, Bran? He asked of the Lord. As you said, such a shame. I didn't give a craven's ass what Lord Mazine thought. The other scars are easy to hide, but this? The Duke sighed almost sympathetically. There will come a time when there will be no veil to hide this unfortunate flaw. I swallowed, resisting the urge to pull away when his fingers left my chin to trail down the two ragged indentations that started at my left temple and continued downward, skirting my eye, to end just beside my nose. Do you know what that new guard of hers said? The Lord didn't speak, but I imagined he shook his head no. He said she was beautiful, the Duke answered. Half of her is truly stunning. There was a pause. You look so much like your mother. My gaze flew to his in shock. He knew my mother? He'd never, not once, mentioned that before. You knew her? His eyes met mine, and it was hard to stare into the never-ending darkness. I did. She was special. Before I could even question that, he said, You do realize that the guard wouldn't have said otherwise. Wouldn't have spoken the truth. I flinched as my chest hollowed, having spotted the reaction. The Duke's smile returned. I suppose it's some small blessing. The damage to your face could have been far worse. The damage could have included a missing eye, or worse, death. But I didn't say that. My gaze shifted back to the painting, wondering how his words could still sting after all these years. 
When I was younger, they'd hurt. His words had cut deep. But the last couple of years, there'd been nothing but numb resignation. The scars were not something I could change. I knew that. But today, they sliced through me, as they had when I was 13. You do have such pretty eyes. He removed his fingers from the scars and pressed one to my lower lip. And a well-formed mouth. He paused, and I swore I could feel his gaze lower and linger. Most will find your body pleasing. Bile clogged my throat and crawled across my skin like thousands of spiders. Only by sheer will was I able to hold myself completely still. For some men, those things will be enough. Tierman dragged his finger across my bottom lip before lowering his hand. Priestess Analia came to see me this morning. Wait, what? My heart started to slow as confusion surfaced. The priestess, what could she possibly have to say about me? Do you not have anything to add? Tierman asked, raising one pale brow. No, I'm sorry, I shook my head. I don't know what priestess Analia would have to say. I saw her last a week ago in the second floor parlor and all seemed fine. I'm sure it did, since you only spent half an hour there, before leaving unexpectedly, he said. I was advised you didn't once pick up your embroidery set, nor did you engage in any conversation with the priestesses. Irritation flared, but I knew better than to cave to it. Besides, if this was what he was upset over, it was far better than what I'd feared. My mind was occupied with my upcoming right. I lied. The real reason I didn't engage in their conversation was because the women spent the entire time speaking poorly of the ladies in wait and how they were not deserving of the God's blessing. I must have been daydreaming. I'm sure you're very excited about the right. And if this had just been one situation, I would have easily overlooked your poor conduct. He was lying. The Duke never overlooked any perceived poor conduct. But I've learned that you were just in the atrium, he continued, and my shoulders slumped. Yes, I was. I didn't know that I wasn't supposed to be, I said. And that wasn't a lie. I don't go often, but spending time in the atrium is not the issue, and you're smart enough to know that. Don't play coy with me. I opened my mouth and then closed it. You were speaking with two of the ladies in wait, he continued. You know that is not allowed. Knowing this was coming, I remained silent. I just hadn't realized he would find out so quickly. Someone must have been watching. Perhaps his steward or one of the other royal guards. Do you have nothing to say? he asked. Dipping my chin, I stared at the floor. I could tell him the truth, that I hadn't said more than one sentence to the ladies, and that this was, as far as I knew, the first time they'd visited the atrium. It wouldn't matter, though. The truth didn't work with the duke. Such a demure maiden, the lord murmured. I could practically feel my tongue sharpen, but I softened my words as much as I could. I'm sorry. I should have left when they entered, but I didn't. And why not? I was curious. They were talking about the upcoming rite, I told him, looking up. I'm not surprised to hear that. You were always an active child with a curious mind that flicked from one thing to the next. Something I've warned the Duchess you wouldn't grow out of easily. He continued his features turning taut, a glint of anticipation forming in his eyes. Priestess Analia also informed me that she fears your relationship with your lady's maid has become far too familiar. My spine stiffened as he turned, straightening the veil he'd draped over a chair. The back of my skull tingled as I said, Tawny has been a wonderful lady's maid, and if my kindness and gratefulness 
has been mistaken for anything else, then I apologize. He slid a long look in my direction. I know it may be hard to keep boundaries with someone you spend so much time with, but a maiden does not seek intimacies of the heart or the mind with those who serve them. Not even those who are to become members of the court. You must never forget that you are not like them. You were chosen by the gods at birth, and they are chosen at their right. You will never be equals. You will never be friends. The words I forced past my lips scratched at my heart. I understand. Tierman took another drink. How much had he already consumed? My heart rate tripled. Once, when I'd upset the Duke, his lesson had been carried out after he'd indulged in what I'd heard the guards call Red Ruin, a liquor brewed in the cliffs of Hor. The Lord had been with him then. That was the time he'd struck me, and it had taken several days before I'd been able to resume training with Victor. I don't think you do. His tone hardened. You were chosen at birth, Penelope. Only one other has ever been chosen by the gods. It was why the Dark One sent the Craven after your family. It was why your parents were slaughtered. I flinched once more, my stomach hollowing. That hurts, doesn't it? But it's the truth. That should have been the only lesson you ever needed. Placing his glass on the table, he faced me while the Lord unfolded his legs. But between your lack of awareness regarding overstepping boundaries, your lack of attention with Priestess Analia, your blatant disregard today for what is expected of you, and, he drew the word out, enjoying the moment, the attitude you displayed yesterday toward me. What, you thought I wouldn't address your behavior while we discussed Ryan's replacement? The air I inhaled did nothing to inflate my lungs. That wasn't his name. You stared back at me as if you wished to do me physical harm. He chuckled, amused by the idea that I could do such a thing. The meeting would have ended vastly different if others had not been present, and we weren't there to discuss Hawk replacing Ryan. Rylan, I snapped. His name is Rylan, not Ryan. There it is, Lord Mazine echoed the words he'd spoken the night Melissa had been found. He chuckled, not so demure now. I ignored him. Tierman cocked his head. You mean his name was Rylan? I sucked in air that seemed to go nowhere. And does it really matter? He was just a royal guard. He would have been honored that I even thought of him. Now I truly wanted to inflict physical harm. Either way, you just proved that I must double my attempts to strengthen my commitment to make you more than ready for your ascension. Apparently, I've been too easy on you. The gleam in his eyes brightened. Unfortunately, that means you require yet another lesson. Hopefully, it will be your last. But somehow, I doubt it. My fingers spasmed where I twisted them. Anger rose so swiftly, I was surprised that I didn't breathe fire when I exhaled. That was the last thing Tierman hoped for. If he couldn't find a reason to give me a lesson, then he'd have a complete breakdown. Yes, I bit out the word, my control slipping. Hopefully. He cut me a sharp look, and a long, tense moment passed. I believe four lashes should suffice. Before I could remind myself who I was, what Tierman was, fury burned through my blood, seizing control. Nothing he'd taken me to task for mattered. None of that had anything to do with the dissenters and the dark one being behind my attempted abduction and Ryland's murder. The gods blessed the ascended with near immortality and unfathomable strength and they spent their time worrying about who I was speaking to, I couldn't stop myself. Are you sure that's enough? 
I wouldn't want you to feel as if you haven't done enough. His gaze hardened. How does seven sound? Apprehension flickered through me, but I'd received ten before. I see that number agrees with you, he said. What do you think, Bran? I think that is sufficient. There was no mistaking the eagerness in his tone. The Duke looked back to me. You know where to go. Holding my chin high, it took everything in me to walk past him and not lay him flat on his back. That was the worst part as I walked to the shiny, cleared surface of his desk. The ascended were stronger than even the most skilled guard, but neither Tierman nor Mazine had raised a hand in combat since the War of Two Kings. I could easily knock him flat on his back. But then what? There'd be more lessons, and word would make its way back to Queen Ileana. She'd be disappointed, genuinely so. And unlike the Duke, I cared about what the Queen thought and felt. Not because I was her favorite, but because it had been she who had taken care of me as a wounded, terrified child. Her hands had changed my bandages and held me when I screamed and cried for my mother and father. And it was Queen Ileana who had sat with me when I could not sleep, terrified of the dark. She'd done things no queen needed to do without her caring for me as my own mother would have. I would have been lost in a way I doubted I could ever have recovered from. I stopped in front of the desk, hands shaking with barely leashed rage. I believed in my heart of hearts that if Queen Ileana knew what the Duke did in this room, things would not end well for the Ascended. Out of the corner of my eye, I saw the Lord lean forward as Tierman picked up the red, narrow cane, smoothing his hand down its length. But the Queen wouldn't know. Letters sent to the capital were always read, and I wouldn't see her until I returned. But then? Then? I would tell her everything. Because if he did this to me, I was sure he did this to others as well, even if no one ever spoke of it. He came to stand beside me, that glint of eagerness now a shine in his eyes. You're not ready, Penelope. You should know better by this point. Clamping my jaw shut, I looked away as I lifted my hands to the row of buttons. My fingers only trembled once, and then stilled, as I undid the bodice, all too aware that Mazine had picked his seat with knowledge of what was to come. He had an unobstructed view. The Duke remained at my side, watching as the bodice of my gown gaped, revealing the all-too-thin undergarment underneath. Both slipped down my shoulders until the clothing pooled at my waist cool air washed over my back and chest, and I wanted to stand there as if I was wholly unaffected by the entire ordeal, wished I could be strong and brave and unmoved. I didn't want them to see how humiliating this was, how much it bothered me to be seen like this, and not by someone of my choosing, someone worthy. But I couldn't. Cheeks burning and eyes stinging, I folded an arm over my chest. This is for your own good, Tierman spoke, his voice going dark and rough as he walked behind me. This is a necessary lesson, Penelope, to ensure that you take your preparations seriously and are committed to them, so you do not dishonor the gods. He almost sounded like he believed what he said, as if he weren't doing this simply because it excited him to inflict pain. But I knew better. I knew what Mazine would do if he could, and I'd seen the look in the Duke's eyes. I saw it far too many times before when I made the mistake of looking. The kind of look that told me if I wasn't the maiden, he would inflict a different kind of pain. Just like I knew Mazine would. I couldn't suppress the shudder that followed that thought. A moment later, I felt his hand on my bare shoulder, and everything in me recoiled. 
It wasn't just the touch of his too cold skin against mine, but it was also what I didn't feel. I felt nothing. No faint trace of anguish that all people carried within them, no matter how long ago the source of the hurt that had inflicted its damage. There was no pain of any kind, and it was that way for every ascended. While that should bring me some sort of relief that I wouldn't pick up on pain, it only left me with the feeling of crawling skin. It was a reminder of how different the ascended were from mortals, what the blessing of the gods did. Brace yourself, Penelope. I planted a palm on the desk. The room was silent, except for the sound of the Lord's deep breaths. And then I heard the soft whistle of the cane cutting through the air a second before it struck my lower back. My entire body jerked as fiery pain rippled across my skin. The first strike was always a shock, no matter how many times it had happened before, or that I knew what was coming. Another strike landed across my shoulders, pushing out a rough burst of air as fire swept across them. Five more. Another blow landed, and my body trembled as I lifted my gaze. I will not make a sound. I will not make a sound. My hips knocked against the desk with the next hit. The settee creaked as Lord Mazine rose. Skin burning, I bit down on my lip until I tasted blood. I stared through the haze of tears at the painting of the veiled worshippers, wondering how horrible the Atlanteans must have been for men like the Duke of Macedonia and Lord Mazine to receive the blessing of ascension from the gods. Chapter 14 The gods had granted me one small favor when I left the Duke's suite. Hawk hadn't been waiting for me, and that had been a blessing. I had no idea how I could have hidden what had happened. Instead, it was Victor who stood silently by the two royal guards. Neither looked at me as I stepped into the hall, skin pale and covered in a sheen of cold sweat. Did they know what had happened in the Duke's chamber? I hadn't made a sound, not even when Lord Mazine had come to stand beside the desk and pulled my arm away from my chest to place it beside my other. Not even when the sixth and seventh blows had felt like lightning streaking across my back, and Mazine had watched every lash absorbed by my body with eager eyes. If the guards were aware, there was nothing I could do about that, or the bitter bite of shame that somehow burned worse than my back. But Victor knew. The knowledge was in the deep lines bracketing his mouth as we walked toward the staircase, each step tugging at the inflamed skin. He waited until the stairwell door closed behind us and then stopped on the landing, concern settling into his light blue eyes as he stared down at me. How bad is it? My hands trembled as I pressed them against the skirt of my gown. I'm fine. I just need to rest. Fine. His sun-kissed cheeks mottled. Your breathing is rapid, and you're walking as if each step is a challenge. You have no reason to pretend with me. I truly didn't, but admitting how bad it was felt like I was giving Tierman what he wanted. It could have been worse. Victor's nostrils flared. It shouldn't happen at all. I couldn't argue with that. Did he break your skin? He demanded. No, there are just welts. Just welts? His laugh was harsh and without humor. You speak as if they are nothing more than scratches. Why were you punished this time? Does he need a reason? My smile was tired and felt brittle, as if it would crack my entire face. He was upset over my lack of commitment to my time spent with the priestess. And today, while I was in the atrium, two ladies in wait showed up. He was not pleased about that. How is that your fault? Does it need to be my fault? Victor stared at me, 
struck silent for a moment. So this is why he took the cane to you? I nodded, gaze falling to the nearest oval-shaped window. The sun had drifted away while I'd been in the suite, the stairwell not nearly as bright and airy as it had been. And he didn't like my attitude during the meeting yesterday. It's not nearly the most minor offense he has punished me for. This is why I said you must be careful, Poppy. If he lashes you for being in a room while others walk in, what do you think he would do if he learned of your little adventures? Or if he learned that I've been training like a guard for years? My shoulders tightened, the movement pulling at my skin. I'd be caned, of course, probably more than seven lashes. Victor's golden skin paled. He may petition the queen to find me unworthy, and maybe the gods already do, I continued. But as you've said before, my ascension will happen no matter what I do. You, though? What would happen to you, Victor, if it were ever discovered that you've been training me? It doesn't matter what they may or may not do. There wasn't a second of hesitation there. The risk is worth it. Knowing you can protect yourself, I would gladly take whatever punishment I received. And I wouldn't regret what I've done. I lifted my chin, holding his gaze. And being able to defend my home, those I cared for, and my life is worth the risk of whatever may happen. He was quiet for a moment, and then his wintry blue eyes closed. He might have been thinking of a prayer for patience, something I'd known him to do many times before. That brought another small smile to my lips. I'm careful, Victor. Being careful doesn't seem to matter. His eyes opened. I welcome the idea of the queen summoning you to the capital sooner rather than later. I shivered as I started down the stairs, because then I couldn't be subjected to the duke's lessons. Exactly. That was something to look forward to, especially since I planned on telling the queen everything. Was he alone? I asked the guards, but they acted as if they had no idea who was in the room with him, he said. They always knew who was in with the Duke. They just hadn't wanted Victor to know. And I, I didn't either. He was alone. He didn't answer, and I wasn't sure if that meant he believed me or not. I decided it was time to change the subject. How did you know where I was? Victor moved only a step behind me. Hawk sent one of the Duke's stewards for me. He was concerned about you. My heart skipped a beat. Over what? He said that both you and Tawny appeared distressed over the Duke's summons, Victor explained. He thought I could explain why. And did you? I told him there was nothing to be worried about and that I would remain as your escort for the rest of the day. Victor's brow wrinkled as he casually took my arm, lending me his support. He wasn't exactly receptive, so I had to remind him that I was higher ranking than him. My lips twitched at that. I'm sure that went over well. As well as an avalanche. We rounded the next floor. The knowledge that I was getting closer to my bed, keeping me going as I mulled over what Hawk had done. He is quite observant, isn't he? And intuitive. Yes, Victor sighed, obviously thinking that wasn't a good thing. Yes, he is. Three dozen torches blazed beyond the rise, their flames a beacon of light in the vast darkness, a promise of safety to the slumbering city. I cast a longing look toward the bed letting out a tired sigh as I twisted the ends of my braid. Nightmares from a different night had driven me from sleep, leaving my skin slick with a cold sweat and my heart thrumming like a rabbit caught in a snare. Luckily, I hadn't woken Tawny with my screams. She'd been up late the past two nights. The first night, she'd spent a good part of the evening doing everything possible to make sure the welts healed. And last night, 
she'd been summoned by the mistress to assist with preparations for the rite. Tawny had used a concoction the healers swore by, and which the guards frequently used for their numerous injuries, rubbing the mixture of pine and sage-scented arnica and honey onto the inflamed skin of my back. It was the same stuff the healer had used the night of the abduction. The ointment had cooled my skin and eased the ache almost immediately. Still, we knew from previous experience that it had to be applied nearly every other hour to achieve the desired effect. And it had worked. By yesterday evening, there was only a twinge of discomfort, even though the skin was still pinker than normal. I hadn't been making light of what had occurred when I told Victor and then Tawny that it could have been worse. The welts would most likely be gone by the morning, and there'd be little if any pain. I was lucky I always healed quickly, and even luckier that Tierman hadn't been drinking red ruin the afternoon of my summons. The Duke had known my mother? How? As far as I knew, she had never been to Macedonia. So that had to mean that the Duke had met her in the capital. It was rare for the ascended to travel, especially such a great distance, but they'd obviously met. There had been such a strange look in Tierman's face when he spoke of her. Nostalgia mixed with, what? Anger, perhaps? Disappointment? Had whatever interactions he'd had with her caused the way he behaved toward me? Or was I just looking for a reason for his treatment, as if there had to be something to explain his cruelty? There wasn't a lot I knew about life. But I knew that sometimes there was no reason. A person, whether ascended or not, was who they were with no explanation. Sighing, I shifted my weight from foot to foot. I'd been holed up in my room the last two days, mainly because rest ensured that the ointment worked as fast as possible. And also because I was avoiding, well, everyone but especially Hawk. I hadn't seen him since I'd stepped into the Duke's private office, and knowing that he'd sensed that something was wrong left me with a gurgling feeling of anxiety and embarrassment, even though what Tierman had done wasn't my fault. I just didn't want Hawk to figure out that something was wrong, and he was observant enough to do so. Granted, staying in my room for two days would probably also send up a red flag, but at least he hadn't borne witness to how carefully I had to move while my back healed. I didn't want Hawk to see me as weak, even though as the maiden he would expect exactly that. And maybe it had to do with the weird mix of relief and disappointment I felt every time he showed no recognition that he'd met me at the Pearl. Dragging my gaze from the bed, I returned to watching the torches beyond the rise. The fires were calm tonight, as they had been for several nights. But when the flames danced like mad spirits driven by the winds of twilight, it meant the mist would not be far behind. And sweeping, terrible death followed the thick white fog. Absently, my hand slipped through the thin folds of the dressing gown to the bone handle of the dagger strapped to my thigh. My fingers curled around the cool hilt, reminding me that I would be ready if and when the rise fell. Just as I would be ready if the dark one tried to come for me again. My hand drifted from the handle to a few inches above my knee, brushing over the patch of uneven skin on my inner thigh. Hawk had come so incredibly close to touching the scar. What would he have done if he had? Would he have jerked his hand away? Or pretended as if he hadn't felt anything? I pulled my hand away. I wasn't going to think about that. I curled my fingers into a fist as I cut off those thoughts. There was no reason to go down that road. Nothing good would come from doing so. It didn't matter if he recognized me or not, if I was just one of many girls he'd kissed in dimly lit rooms. It also didn't matter if he'd gone back to the Pearl, like he'd promised. I shook my head, as if I could scatter my thoughts. But it didn't work. 
One thing I'd discovered over the last two days of near isolation was that I could continue telling myself it didn't matter over and over. But it did. Hawk had been my first kiss, even if he didn't know that. Silvery moonlight seeped through the chamber as I crept silently toward the west windows. Placing my fingers on the cool glass, I counted the torches. Twelve on the rise, twenty-four below, all aflame. Good, that was good. I pressed my forehead to the thin glass that did very little to keep the chill from finding its way into the castle. In the west, where Carcedonia was nestled between the Stroud Sea and the Willow Plains, there was no need for glass windows. Summer and spring were eternal there, where autumn and winter forever reigned here. It was one of the things I looked forward to when I returned to the capital. The warmth, the sunshine, the scent of salt and sea, and all the glittering bays and coves. Tawny, who had never seen the beaches, would absolutely love them. A tired grin tugged at my lips. When she had been summoned by one of the mistresses, Tawny had sent me a look that said she might have been happier scrubbing the bathing chambers than spending the evening attempting to please the unappeasable. I often felt the same when it was time to meet with the priestess. I'd rather spend the evening plucking my own body hair from very sensitive areas than spending hours with that dragon of a woman. Perhaps I needed to be better at hiding how I felt when it came to her and the other priestesses. I still couldn't believe she'd gone to the Duke, all because I didn't spend half of my day listening to her and the others complain about everyone else. Wrapping my arms around myself, I wished for what felt like the hundredth time that my brother was still in Macedonia. Ian had nightmares too, and if he were still here right now, he'd distract me with silly made-up tales. Did he still have nightmares after his ascension? If not, then wasn't that something else to look forward to? My gaze traveled along the rise, catching sight of a guard patrolling along the top of the wall. I'd rather be out there than in here. The ascended would be shocked to hear such a thing, as would most others. To even think it, that I, the maiden, the chosen, who would go to the gods, would want to exchange places with a commoner, a guard, would be an affront to not only the ascended, but also to the gods themselves. All over the kingdom, people would do anything to be in the presence of the gods. I was, I was privileged, no matter what I suffered. But at least, if I were out there on the rise, I could be doing something productive. I'd be protecting the city and all those who enabled me to have such a comfortable life. Instead, I was in here, reaching an all-new height of self-pity when in reality, my ascension would do more than protect one city. It would ensure the entire future of the kingdom. Wasn't that doing something? I wasn't sure, and I wanted nothing more than to be able to close my eyes and find sleep. But I knew it wouldn't come, not for hours. On nights like this, when I knew sleep would evade me, I caved to the urge to sneak out and explore the silent and dark city until I found places that didn't sleep, spots like the Red Pearl. Unfortunately, that would be the height of stupidity after the attempted abduction. Even I wasn't that reckless, and a flame beyond the rise began to dance, snapping me forward. I pressed both palms to the window, staring at the fire and refusing to blink. It's nothing, I told the empty room. It's just a breeze. Another flash moved, and then another, and another. The whole line of torches beyond the wall, rippling wildly, spitting sparks as the wind picked up. I took a breath, but it seemed to go nowhere. The one in the middle was the first to be snuffed, sending my heart slamming against my ribs. The others rapidly followed, pitching the land beyond the rise into sudden darkness. I took a step back from the window, 
Dozens of fiery arrows shot into the air, arcing high above the rise, and then racing downward, slamming into the tinder-filled trenches. A wall of fire erupted, running the entire length of the rise. The flames were no defense against the mist or what came with it. The fire made what was in the fog visible. Returning to the window, I threw the latch and flung it open. Cold air and kind of unearthly silence poured into the chamber as I gripped the stone ledge and leaned out, squinting. Smoke wafted up and weaved through the flames, spilling into the air and onto the ground. Smoke didn't move like that. Smoke didn't creep under the tinder, a thick, murky white against the black of night. Smoke didn't blanket flames, suffocating them until they were extinguished, and all that remained was a heavy, unnatural mist. The mist wasn't empty. It was full of twisted shapes that had once been mortal. Horns blared from all four corners of the rise, shattering the tense quiet. Within seconds, what few lights had shone through the windows went dark. A second call of warning went out, and the entire castle seemed to shudder. Snapping into action, I grabbed the window and latched it into place before I spun around. I'd have roughly three minutes, possibly less, before all exits were sealed. I started forward. A moment later, the adjoining door swung open and Tawny burst in, her white nightgown flowing around her and the mass of brown and gold curls spilling over her shoulders. No! Tawny stumbled to a halt, the whites of her wide eyes a stark contrast to her brown skin. No, Poppy! Ignoring her, I raced over to the chest, throwing open the heavy lid and rooting around until I found the bow. Rising, I tossed it onto the bed. You cannot be planning to go out there, she exclaimed. I am. Poppy! I will be fine. I situated the quiver along my spine. Fine! She gaped at me as I turned to her. I can't believe I have to point out the obvious, but here I am. You're the maiden, the chosen. You cannot go out there. If they don't kill you, his grace will if he catches you. He won't catch me. I snatched up a black hooded cloak and shrugged it on, securing it at my neck and breast. The duke will be hiding in his room behind a dozen royal guards, if not more, right alongside the duchess. The royal guards will come for you. I retrieved the curved bow by the grip. I'm positive Victor left for the rise the moment he heard the horns. And Hawk, their duty is to protect you. Victor knows I can protect myself. And Hawk won't even know I've left my room. I paused. He doesn't know about the servant's entrance. You're injured, Poppy. You're back. My back is almost completely healed, you know that. And what if the dark one? What if this is a ploy? This is no ploy, Tawny. I saw them in the mist, I told her, and her face grayed. And if the dark one tries to come for me, I will be ready for him too. She followed me as I crossed the room. Penelope Balfour, stop. Surprised, I spun around and found her standing right behind me. I have less than two minutes, Tawny. I will be trapped in here. Where it's safe, she reasoned. I grasped her shoulder with my free hand. If they breach the walls, they will take the city and they will find a way into the castle. And then there will be no stopping them. That I know. They got to my family. They got to me. I will not sit and wait for that to happen once more. Her eyes frantically searched mine. But you didn't have the rise to protect you then. That was true, but nothing is infallible, Tawny, not even the rise. And neither are you, she whispered, her lower lip trembling. I know. She drew in a deep breath, her shoulder sagging under my hand. All right. If anyone comes, I'll tell them you're ill with fright and have locked yourself in the bathing chamber. I rolled my eyes. Of course you will. I let go of her shoulder. There are several bloodstone daggers in the chest and a sword under the pillows. 
Please tell me your head is not resting above a sword every night, Tawny demanded, voice ringing with disbelief. No wonder you have nightmares. Only the gods know what kind of bad luck using a sword as a pill. Tawny, I cut her off before she really got going. If the castle is breached, use the weapons. You know how. I know. She did, only because I made her learn in secret, just like Victor had taught me. The head or the heart? I nodded. Be safe, Poppy, please. I'll be so very disappointed if I'm assigned to serve the Duchess, or worse yet, given to the temple in service to the gods. Not that it wouldn't be an honor to serve them. She tacked on, placing her hand over her heart. But the whole celibacy thing? I cracked a grin. I will return. You'd better, Poppy, I promise. Giving her a quick kiss on the cheek, I spun and headed for the old servant's store beside the bathing chamber. This was the whole reason I had all but begged and pleaded to be moved to this room in the older, far uglier portion of the castle. These pathways and accesses were no longer used, but they connected to nearly every room in the old part of the stronghold, including the stone bridge that led directly to the southern portion of the rise. Old hinges creaked as I opened the door. The pathways allowed me to move undetected through the castle. Over the last years, I'd used them to meet with Victor in one of the old, unused rooms for training. And it was also how I was able to slip out of the castle without being seen. But most importantly, the old stairs and halls could provide a quick escape if necessary. Poppy, Tawny called out, stopping me. Your face! Confusion rose for only a moment, and then I realized that my face was unveiled. Right! I lifted the heavy hood, tugging it into place before I slipped out into the narrow, winding staircase. Stone slid against metal as thick iron doors rattled and began their descent as I raced down the cracked, uneven stone steps. My slippers weren't the best footwear for such a thing, but there hadn't been time to ferret out the only boots I owned from their hiding place, tucked under the head of the bed. If the maids found them, they would be sure to talk, and eventually, whatever they said would make its way to someone. I had less than a minute to get out. Dust and small rocks drifted from above as the castle continued to tremble. Moonlight broke through the cracked, dusty windows as I rounded the final set of steps, slipping over the bottom two and all but sliding out into the empty pantry. The movement caused nothing more than a dull flare of pain where the welts were healing. Thrusting the bow into the folds of the cloak, I darted into the chaotic kitchen where servants clamored for access to the hidden safe rooms that doubled as food storage. Guards rushed for the main entrance, where the largest shield would be locking into place within seconds. No one paid me any mind as I ran for the back hall, where one of the iron doors was already halfway down. Spitting out a curse that Victor would have turned red at, and Rylan would have, he would have smiled at if he were still here, I picked up speed and then dipped. The silk and satin slippers aided in the descent. I slid under the door, nearly losing my balance as I skidded out into the night air. The heavy doorway groaned as it settled into place. I backed away and then turned my lips curving into a broad smile Tawny would have found not only concerning, but also disturbing. I'd made it to the bridge. Not wasting time, I raced across the narrow walk high above the houses and shops. I didn't dare look to my sides as there was no railing. One slip and, well, what was in the mist would no longer be a concern. Reaching the wider ledge of the rise, I tossed the bow onto the top and then hoisted myself up. The healing skin of my back stretched, causing me to wince as the cloak and the gown parted, revealing nearly the entire length of my leg. I yearned for the thin breeches often worn under certain styles of gowns, but there hadn't been enough time. 
I grasped the bow and started toward the western wall, arriving as the mist seemed to become a solid mass, carrying with it the scent of metal and decay. Ahead, archers waded in their nests of stone, like birds of prey, their bows and arrows ready. I knew not to get too close, as a guard from the rise would surely notice and ask questions. And while Tawny had exaggerated the killing me part, I would face yet another lesson from the Duke. I cast a quick look around. The city had gone completely quiet and dark, except for the temples. Their flames were never extinguished. Tearing my gaze from them and the unsettled feeling they often roused, I searched for an empty battlement until I found one. If it were to be manned by a guard, someone would already be in it. Keeping close to the shadows, clinging to the walls, I eased inside the enclosure. My smile returned when I saw several quivers resting near the short ladder. Perfect. Bloodstone arrows, their shafts made of wood from the blood forest, were not easy to come by when you were a maiden who wasn't supposed to have a need for them. Grabbing several of the quivers, I scurried up the ladder. Partially hidden behind the stone wall, I set the quivers beside me and pulled out an arrow. A sound came then, raising the hairs all over my body. It started as a low howl, reminding me of the wind during the coldest part of winter. But the moaning gave way to shrill shrieks. Goosebumps pimpled my skin and my stomach twisted with nausea, even as I knocked an arrow. I would never forget that sound. It haunted my dreams, forcing me awake night after night. Shouts erupted from the ground, a call to fire. Sucking in a breath of awe, I watched the sky light up with burning arrows. They ripped through the encroaching mist as fires sprang to life once more, all around the rise, turning the night to silvery dusk. Guards waited on foot in front of the rise, their black armor making them nearly indistinguishable as I searched out the familiar white cape of a royal guard. There, I found pale blonde hair and a weathered face the color of sand. My heart skipped a beat. Toward the center stood Victor. I expected to see him where death now gathered, but a knot of fear still gathered in my breast. Victor was the bravest man I knew. What about Hawk? I had no idea if he was in the castle, stationed outside my door, believing I was inside or on the rise. Or like Victor, perhaps he was beyond it. The knot expanded, but I couldn't let it grab hold of me. Keeping an eye on Victor, I curled my fingers around the string, pulling back as he donned his helmet. Another volley of arrows went up, these reaching farther. When they cut through the mist, I heard the screams. And then I saw them, their pale bodies a milky white, leached of all color, their faces sunken and hollow, eyes burning like fiery coal. Mouths open wide, revealing two sets of jagged, serrated teeth. Their fingers were elongated into claws, and both their fangs and their claws could flay skin like the softest butter. I had the scars to prove it. They were what Marlowe and Ridley would have become if their lives hadn't been ended before it was too late. They poured out of the mist, the source of my nightmares. The creatures sent by the Dark One over a decade ago to rob my brother and me of our parents in a blood-soaked massacre. They were the evil ones who'd nearly killed me before my sixth birthday, clawing and biting in a frenzy of bloodlust. The craven were here. Chapter 15 And now? They swarmed the guards outside the rise, crashing into them in a wave that knew no fear of death. Screams of pain and terror tore through the night, and my breath seized. In a matter of seconds, I lost sight of Victor. No, I whispered, fingers trembling around the string. Where was he? He couldn't have fallen. Not that quickly. Not Victor. I found him holding his ground as he cleaved his sword through the air, slicing off the head of a craven as another launched itself at him. He spun, 
narrowly avoiding a swipe that would have torn through his breastplate. There was no time for relief. My gaze shifted as an archer's bloodstone arrow slammed into the head of a craven, knocking it backward. Dark, inky blood spewed out of the back of its skull. I focused on another craven, calming my breath until it was deep and slow like Victor had taught me. Years of training steadied my hand, so did experience. This wasn't the first time I had aided the guards on the rise. Once your fingers take hold of the string, the world around you must cease to exist. Victor's instructions echoed in my mind. It's just you, the pull of the string, and your aim. Nothing else matters. And that was all it could be. Trusting my aim, I released an arrow. It flew through the air, striking a craven in the heart. I knocked another before what was once someone's child or parent even hit the ground. I found another, a craven who had a guard on its back, tearing at its armor. I let the bowstring go, smiling when the projectile burst through the craven's head. Loading the next arrow, I caught sight of Victor, his sword slick with dark blood, as he shoved it deep into a craven's stomach, and then drew it upward with a shout. A craven rushed Victor from behind as he yanked the sword out. I pulled back the string. The bolt sliced through the air, catching the creature in the back of its patchy-haired skull. The thing fell forward, dead before it even hit the ground. Victor's head whipped around, and I swore he looked straight at me, knew who had sent down that arrow. And although I couldn't see his face, I knew he wore the expression he always did when he was proud, yet irritated. Grinning, I readied another arrow, and, and for what felt like a small eternity, I lost myself to the killing, taking down one craven after another. I went through two quivers before one of the cravens broke through the line of guards, hitting the wall, its clawed hand dug into the stone, gaining purchase. For the briefest heartbeat, I stood transfixed as it tore its hand free and then slammed it down again, higher, pulling itself up the wall. My gods, I whispered. The craven let out a screeching wail, tearing me out of my stupor. I took aim, firing the arrow directly down into its skull. The impact knocked it off the wall. A shout to my right jerked my head around. An archer fell forward, bow slipping from his hands, as a craven gripped him by the shoulders, sinking its jagged teeth into the guard's neck. Good gods, they had reached the top. Spinning around, I knocked an arrow and quickly let it go. The arrow didn't deliver a fatal blow, but the impact knocked the craven free from the guard, sending it back to the ground below. It wasn't the only one that fell. The guard tumbled backward into nothing but air. I swallowed a cry, telling myself that the man was already dead before the loud fleshy smack caused me to briefly squeeze my eyes shut. The cravens' minds may be rotted, but they had enough sense to go for the archers. Victor had once said that the only thing that rivaled their thirst for blood was their survival instincts. A high-pitched scream jolted me into action. To my right, another craven had reached the edge of the rise, seizing an archer. The guard dropped his bow and embraced the craven, pushing forward. He fell to the ground outside the rise, taking the craven with him. A round of fiery arrows lifted once more into the air, reaching high above the wall. They came down, striking mortal and monster alike. Over the sound of unearthly howls and screams, hooves pounded off cobblestone and dirt. But I still stared at where the archer had fallen, his body swarmed by craven. The guard had sacrificed himself. This unnamed, unknown man had chosen death over allowing the craven to reach the other side of the rise. Blinking back sudden tears, I gave a wordless shake of my head as battle cries erupted, forcing me into motion.
Rising just enough to see over the ledge, I looked over my shoulder as more guards on horseback spilled out from the gate, brandishing sickle blades. They split into two directions, attempting to seal off access to the rise. As soon as they cleared the entrance, the gates closed behind them. A craven launched itself at a guard, powering through the air like a large jungle cat would. It slammed into the ground, throwing him from his horse. They hit the ground. Damn it, I hissed, taking aim at the craven, who was now halfway up the rise. I caught him at the top of his patchy-haired skull, knocking him from the wall. I quickly knocked another arrow, searching out the craven who were at the rise. They were the clear threat. It quickly became obvious that these craven were different. They looked less monstrous. Still, their appearance was nothing short of nightmare fodder, but their faces were less hollow, their bodies less shriveled. Were they newly turned? Possible. The battle below was lessening, bodies falling on top of one another, catching sight of Victor as he thrust his sword through the head of a fallen craven. I dropped down to one knee so I could peer over the wall. The cloak parted exposing nearly the entire length of my leg, from my calf to my thigh, to the chilled air. There was only a handful of craven remaining, half of them feeding on and tearing into wounded guards, unaware of anything around them. I could see no more near the rise. Setting an arrow against the bow, I took aim at one, who had torn through armor and into the cavity of a stomach, exposing thick, ropey innards. Bile clogged my throat. The guard was already dead, but I couldn't let the craven continue desecrating the fallen man. Focusing on the blood and gore smeared mouth, I sent the arrow flying straight into it. The contact snapped the craven back. Whatever satisfaction I felt was tempered by sorrow. The mist had begun to dissipate, revealing the carnage left behind. So many had fallen tonight, too many. The stone cold under my bare knee. I reached for another arrow as I searched. You must be the goddess Bella, or Layla, given mortal form, a deep voice said from behind me. Sucking in a sharp breath, I spun around on my knee, the cape and gown whirling around my legs. My arrow locked and ready. I aimed at... Hawk, oh gods, my stomach tumbled with relief and dismay as I stared down. He stood under a beam of moonlight as if the gods themselves had blessed him with eternal light. Inky blood dotted his broad high cheekbones and the straight line of his jaw. His wide expressive lips were parted as if he were only able to take the thinnest breath. And those strange, beautiful eyes seemed to almost glow in the moonlight. He held his blood-soaked sword at his side. His leather had been clawed, showing how close he'd come to falling. Hawk had been beyond the rise, and like Victor as a royal guard, that wasn't required. But he went out there nonetheless. Respect blossomed in my chest, warming me, and I reacted without thought reaching out with my senses to see if he was injured. I felt the barest hint of the anguish that lingered in him. The battle had eased it, giving him an outlet in the same way my touch would. Temporary, but still effective. He wasn't injured. You are. His stare was intense and unblinking as he sheathed his sword at his side. You are absolutely magnificent, beautiful. I jolted, shocked. He'd said that I was beautiful before, once he saw my face, and he sounded like he'd meant it then. But now, he'd spoken words which too often meant nothing and too rarely meant everything. And he'd said them in such a manner that there was a tight, tense, curling sensation low in my stomach, even though he had no idea who he spoke to. My heavy hood remained in place. I needed to get away. 
I glanced behind him, searching for the easiest path to escape. I swallowed hard. Hawk may not have realized yet that I was the girl who'd been at the Red Pearl, but there was no way I could let him know it was me up here now. I had no idea what he would do if he realized I was the one on the rise. The last thing I expected was to find a hooded lady with a talent for archery, manning one of the battlements. The dimple made an appearance on his right cheek, and I felt the tug low in my stomach. Why did he have to have such a charming grin? It was the kind I knew numerous others had fallen prey to. I doubted any of them regretted that fall. I knew I didn't. He extended his gloved hand. May I be of assistance? Swallowing a snort, I lowered the bow, shifting it to one hand. I stayed silent in case he recognized my voice, motioning for him to back up. With an arch of one dark brow, he placed the offered hand over his heart and took a step back. Hawk bowed. He actually bowed with such elaborate flourish that a laugh crept up my throat. I managed to squelch it as I placed the bow down on the lower ledge, propping it against the wall. Keeping my gaze on him, I scooted to the ladder and slowly climbed down, not giving him my back. The sounds of fighting had all but ceased down below. I needed to get back to my room, but there was no way I could enter the castle the way I'd come out. Not with Hawk here. That would rouse suspicion. I slipped the bow under my cloak, hooking it to my back. I flinched as it rested against the still healing welts. You're, uh... He trailed off, an odd look settling into his features. I couldn't decipher what it was. Suspicion? Bemusement? Something entirely different? His eyes narrowed. Below, heavy gates groaned as they reopened for the wounded and dead to be recovered. The craven would be burned where they lay. I moved to exit the battlement. Hawk smoothly blocked my path, and my heart turned over heavily as my hands tightened into fists. I forced my fingers to relax. The playful light in his eyes had faded. What are you doing up here? Whatever patience his curiosity had brought was gone. Brushing past him, I knew I would have to go to the ground and lose him in the crowd as people began to leave their homes to take stock of the losses. I didn't make it far. Hawk caught me by the arm. I think. Instinct sparked, seizing control. I spun and twisted under the arm that held mine, ignoring the faint burn along my back. The shock flickering over his face brought a savage smile to my lips. Popping up behind him, I dipped low and kicked out, sweeping his legs out from under him. He dropped my arm to throw out his hands, stopping his fall. His curse rang in my ears as I took off, racing out of the battlement and onto the inner ledge of the rise. The closest stairs were several yards. Something caught my cloak. The force spun me around and jerked me back against the wall. I started to pull away, but didn't make it more than a few inches. Looking down, I saw a dagger embedded deep in the wall, catching my cloak. Stunned, my voice dropped open. Hawk stalked toward me, his chin lowered. That wasn't very nice. Well, he wasn't going to think this was very nice either. I gripped the handle of the dagger, wrenching it free. Flipping it so I held it by the blade, I cocked my arm back. Don't, he warned, stopping. I threw the dagger directly at his annoyingly handsome face. He spun just as I knew he would. He caught the dagger by the handle, plucking it out of the air like it was nothing. And that was impressive. And I was jealous. No way could I have done that. I didn't even think Victor could. Eyes glittering like chips of gold, he tisked softly and started toward me once more. Pushing off the wall, I started running again, seeing the stairs up ahead. If I could make it to them, 
a dark form dropped down in front of me. My feet skidded, and I slipped, losing my balance. Damn slippers and their smooth, soft sole. I went down hard on my hip, swallowing the cry of pain as it lanced up my lower back. At least I hadn't landed on my back. Hawk rose from a crouch, the dagger held at his hip. Now that really wasn't nice at all. How had he- My gaze flicked to the narrow ridge of the wall above. He'd run along that? It couldn't be wider than a few inches. He was insane. I'm aware that my hair is in need of a trim, but your aim is off, he said. You should really work on that, since I'm quite partial to my face. My aim had been spot on. With a silent snarl, I waited until he was close enough. And then I kicked out, catching him in the lower leg. He grunted as I jumped to my feet, ignoring the ache of what was surely a bruised hip and rear. I whirled to the right, and he jumped to block me, but I darted to the left. He came right back at me, and I kicked out once more. Hawk caught me by the ankle. I gasped, arms pinwheeling, until I steadied myself. Wide-eyed, I stared at him. He raised his brows as his gaze traveled the length of my bare leg. Scandalous, he murmured. A growl of annoyance burst from me. He laughed. And such dainty little slippers. Satin and silk? They're as finely tailored as your leg, the kind of slipper no guard of the rise would wear. How astute of him, unless they're being outfitted differently than I am. Hawk dropped my ankle, but before I could run, he caught my arm and yanked me forward. Suddenly I was against him, and on the tips of my toes. Air seized in my lungs at the sudden contact. My breasts were flattened against the hard leather and iron of his stomach. The warmth of his body seemed to bleed through his armor, sinking through my cloak and the thin gown underneath. A flash of heat rolled through me as I dragged in a deep breath. Beyond the rot of craven blood, he smelled of dark spice and lush smoke. A flush crept into my cheeks. His nostrils flared, and as crazy as it sounded, the hue of his eyes seemed to deepen to a striking amber color. He lifted his other arm. You know what I think? The blade pressing into the skin of his throat silenced him. His lips thinned as he stared down at me. He didn't move or release me, so I pressed the tip of the dagger in just enough. A bead of blood swelled just below his throat. Correction, he said. And then he laughed as the trickle of blood seeped down his neck. It wasn't a harsh laugh or a patronizing one. He sounded amused. You are an absolutely stunning, murderous little creature. Pausing, he glanced down. Nice weapon. Bloodstone and woven bone. Very interesting. His gaze flicked up. Princess. Chapter 16 The dagger! Damn it! I'd forgotten that he'd seen the knife at the Red Pearl. Gods! How could I forget that? I jerked the blade away, but it was too late. And it was also a mistake. Hawk's other hand moved lightning quick, catching the wrist of the hand that held the weapon. You and I have so much to talk about. We have nothing to talk about, I snapped, irritated at myself for making not one, not two, but three incredibly foolish moves. And beyond frustrated with Hawk, because he'd gained the upper hand. She speaks. He widened his eyes in false shock, and then dipped his chin, causing me to tense. I thought you liked to talk, princess. He paused. Or is that only when you're at the Red Pearl? I said nothing to that. 
You're not going to pretend that you have no idea what I'm talking about, are you? He asked. That you're not her? I pulled on my arms. Let me go. Oh, I don't think so. He turned sharply, and suddenly my back and the bow were against the stone wall of the rise. The contact sent a dull wave of fire over my healing back. But he pressed in, caging my body with his. There was barely an inch between us. After all we shared, you throw a dagger at my face? All we shared? It was a handful of minutes and a few kisses, I said. And the truth of that struck me with startling clarity. That was all we'd shared. Gods, I was so sheltered. Because in my limited experience, it had become so much more to me. The wake-up call that it was only a few kisses was utterly brutal. It was more than a few kisses. His voice dropped low. If you've forgotten, I'm more than willing to remind you. Tiny coils of tension formed in my stomach. Part of me wanted to be reminded of what I surely had not forgotten. Thank the gods, the smarter, logical part of me won out. There was nothing worth remembering. Now you insult me after throwing a dagger at my face. You've wounded my tender feelings. Tender feelings, I snorted. Don't be overdramatic. Hard not to be when you threw a dagger at my head and then cut my neck. He shot back, his grip on me surprisingly gentle compared to the hardness of his tone. I knew you'd move out of the way. Did you? Is that why you tried to slice open my throat? His golden eyes burned from beneath heavy, thick lashes. I nicked your skin, I corrected, because you had a hold of me and wouldn't let go. Obviously, you haven't learned anything from it. I've actually learned a lot, princess. That's why your hands and your dagger aren't getting anywhere near my neck. His thumb slid over the inside of my wrist as a reminder and my fingers spasmed around the handle of my weapon. But if you let go of the dagger, there is a whole lot of me I'll let your hands get close to. I choked on my next breath. Did he not realize who he was speaking to? Was the sound of my voice so common that he had no idea it was me? But if he hadn't figured it out yet, that meant I still had the advantage. A small one but still. How generous of you, I retorted. Once you get to know me, you'll find that I can be quite benevolent. I have no intention of getting to know you, so you just make a habit of sneaking into the rooms of young men and seducing them before running off. What? I gasped. Seducing men? Isn't that what you did to me, princess? His thumb made another slow sweep along the inside of my wrist. You're ridiculous, I sputtered. What I am is intrigued. Groaning, I pulled at my arms, and he chuckled in response, eyes reminding me of pools of warm honey. Why do you insist on holding me like this? Well, besides what we went over already, which is the whole being partial to my face and neck thing, you're somewhere you're not supposed to be. I'm doing my job by detaining and questioning you. Do you typically question those on the rise who you don't recognize like this? I challenged. What an odd method of interrogation. Only pretty ladies with shapely bare legs. He leaned in, and when I took my next breath, my chest met his. What are you doing up here during a craven attack? Enjoying a relaxing evening stroll, I snapped. His lips curled up on one side, but there was no dimple. What were you doing up here, princess? He repeated. What did it look like I was doing? It looked like you were being incredibly foolish and reckless. Excuse me? Disbelief thundered through me. 
How reckless was I being when I killed Craven, and am I unaware of a new recruitment policy where half-dressed ladies in cloaks are now needed on the rise? He asked. Are we that desperately in need of protection? Anger hit my blood like wildfire. Desperate? Why would my presence on the rise signal desperation when, as you've seen, I know how to use a bow? Oh, wait, is it because I happen to have breasts? I've known women with far less beautiful breasts that could cut a man down without so much as blinking an eye, he said. But none of those women are here in Macedonia. I would have liked to know where this group of rather amazing-sounding women lived. Wait, far less beautiful breasts? And you are incredibly skilled, he continued, snapping my attention back to him. Not just with an arrow. Who taught you to fight and use a dagger? Clamping my mouth shut, I refused to answer. I'm willing to bet it was the same person who gave you that blade. He paused. Too bad whoever they are didn't teach you how to evade capture. Well, too bad for you, that is. Anger flooded my system once more, overwhelming me. I thrust my knee up, aiming for a very sensitive part of him, the one that somehow made him more qualified than I was to fight. Hawk sensed my move and shifted, blocking my knee with his thigh. You're so incredibly violent. He paused. I think I like it. Let me go, I seethed. And be kicked or stabbed? He shoved his leg between mine, preventing any further kicks. We've already covered that, princess, more than once. I lifted my hips off the wall, attempting to throw him off, but all I accomplished was pressing a very sensitive part of my body against the hard length of his thigh. The friction created a sudden jarring rush of heat that was so powerful, it was like being struck by lightning. Sucking in a startled breath, I stilled. Hawk had done the same thing against me, his large body filling with tension. His chest rose and fell against mine. What? What was happening? I felt hot, despite how far up we were, and that we stood in the cold night air. My skin seemed to buzz as if fine currents of energy were dancing along my flesh, and hard, pounding heat had replaced the aching coldness in my body. Several too long moments stretched out between us. And then he said, I came back for you that night. The noise from below was beginning to calm. At any moment, someone could come up here. But I was so incredibly reckless and foolish because I let my eyes drift shut as his words cycled through me. He had come back. Just like I told you I would, I came back for you, and you weren't there. He continued, you promised me, princess. A smidgen of guilt formed within me, and I wasn't sure if it was for lying to him or the throwing the dagger at his face part. Probably both. I, I couldn't. Couldn't? His voice had dropped again, becoming lower, thicker. I have a feeling that if there's something you want badly enough, nothing will stop you. A harsh, bitter-sounding laugh escaped me. You know nothing. Maybe. He'd let go of my arm, and before I knew what he was up to, his hand had slipped inside my hood. His cold fingers touched the unmarred skin of my right cheek. I gasped at the contact and started to draw back, but there was nowhere to go. Maybe I know more than you realize. A small measure of unease crawled across my skin. Hawk bent his head, pressing his cheek to the left side of my hood. Do you really think I have no idea who you are? Every muscle in my body tensed as my mouth dried. You have nothing to say to that. He paused, and his voice was barely above a whisper when he said, Penelope. D. 
damn it. I exhaled noisily, unsure if I was relieved or afraid that I no longer had to wonder if he knew. The confusion spiked my irritation into uncharted territories. Are you just now figuring that out? If so, I'm concerned about you being one of my personal guards. He chuckled deeply, the sound infuriatingly infectious. I knew the moment you removed the veil. My lips parted in a thin inhale. Why? Why didn't you say something then? To you? He asked, or to the Duke. Either, I whispered. I wanted to see if you'd bring it up. Apparently, you were just going to pretend that you're not the same girl who frequents the Red Pearl. I don't frequent the Red Pearl, I corrected. But I hear you do. Have you been asking about me? I'm flattered. I haven't. I'm not sure if I can believe you. You tell a lot of lies, princess. Don't call me that, I demanded. I like it better than what I'm supposed to call you, maiden. You have a name. It's not that. I didn't ask for what you liked, I said, even though I wholeheartedly agreed with his dislike of how I was supposed to be addressed. But you did ask why I didn't tell the Duke about your little explorations, he countered. Why would I do that? I'm your god. If I were to betray you, then you wouldn't trust me, and that would definitely make my job of keeping you safe much harder. His very logical reasoning for not saying anything carried a bitter bite of disappointment, and I didn't even want to delve into why. As you can see, I can keep myself safe. I see that. He drew back, brows furrowed, and then his eyes widened just a fraction, as if he'd figured something out. Hook! A voice called from the ground below, causing my heart to trip. Everything okay up there? His gaze searched the darkness of my hood for a moment, and then he looked over his shoulder. Everything's fine. You need to let me go, I whispered. Someone is bound to come up here and catch you, force you to reveal your identity. Those amber eyes slid back to me. Maybe that would be a good thing. I sucked in a sharp breath. You said you wouldn't betray me. I said I didn't betray you. But that was before I knew you would do something like this. Ice drenched my skin. My job would be so much easier if I didn't have to worry about you sneaking out to fight the craven, or to meet random men in places like the Red Pearl, he continued. And who knows what else you do when all believe you're safely ensconced in your chambers. I, I imagine that once I brought it to the Duke's and Duchess's attention, your penchant for arming yourself with a bow and climbing to the rise would be one less thing I had to worry about. My chest seized with panic, and I blurted out, you have no idea what he'd do if you went to him, he'd... I cut myself off. He'd what? Taking a slow, even breath, I lifted my chin. It doesn't matter. Do what you feel you need to do. Hawk stared down at me for so long, it felt like a small eternity had passed. And then he let go of me, stepping back. Cold air blew in between us. You better hurry back to your chambers, princess. We'll have to finish this conversation later. Confusion held me in its grip for only a few moments. But then I snapped out of it, easing away from the wall I ran. And even though I didn't look back, I knew he didn't take his eyes off me. Slipping through the old servant's access, I wasn't surprised when I found that Tawny was still in my chambers, even though it had taken me nearly an hour before the gates were lifted and I could sneak back in. She gasped. I thought you were never going to come back. I closed the creaky door behind me and faced her, slowly reaching up to pull the hood down. 
Tawny drew up short. Are you, are you okay? Her gaze searched mine, and I saw a faint tremor radiate through her. Was it bad? The attack? Opening my mouth, I had no idea where to start, recalling all that had happened. I leaned against the door. My confrontation with Hawk still had my heart pounding. My mind was a confusing mess, and my stomach churned with the knowledge that the craven had reached the top of the rise. Poppy, she whispered. I decided to start with the most important. There were a lot of them. Dozens. Her chest moved as she took in a deep breath. And? I wasn't sure if she really wanted to know, but to be in the dark was far more dangerous than fear of the truth. And several of them reached the top of the rise. Tawny's eyes flew open. Oh my gods. She pressed a hand to her chest. But the shields have lifted. They were stopped, but a lot, a lot of guards died tonight. I peeled myself away from the door as I unbuttoned my cloak with chilled fingers, letting it fall to the floor. I went to the fireplace and stood there for several minutes, allowing the warmth to beat back some of the coldness. There were just so many of them that they basically swarmed the front line. If there'd been more, they would have breached the wall. It's more than possible. Stepping away from the fire, I unhooked the cloak, letting it fall in a messy puddle. I slipped off the bow, carefully placing it in the chest before I closed the lid. They sent out the horsemen, but at least two craven had already made it to the top of the rise by then. If they wait like that again, it could be too late. But I don't think, I don't imagine they expected them to be able to do that. Tawny sat down on the edge of the bed. Did you kill any of them? Towing off my slippers, I looked over at her. Of course. Good. Her gaze drifted to the window, where the torches now burned brightly in the darkness. There'll be a lot of black flags raised tomorrow. There would be. Each house that had lost a son, a father, a husband, or a friend would raise the flag in memoriam. Commander Jansen would visit each and every one of them over the next day or so. Many pyres would be lit. And I feared that some of those who'd bravely faced down the craven tonight would return to their homes or the dorms, bitten. It happened every time after an attack. I plopped down on the bed, catching the scent of burnt wood in my hair. Before I could say anything else, there was a knock on the door. I'll get it. Tawny rose, and I didn't stop her, figuring it was Victor or another royal guard checking on us. As she made her way over, I gripped the edge of my braid, quickly unraveling it as I heard Tawny open the door and say, the maiden is sleeping. Doubtful. My heart slammed against my ribs. I jumped up from the bed and spun around just as Hawk came through the door. My mouth dropped open, mirroring Tawny's expression. Hawk kicked the door shut behind him. It's time for that talk, princess. Chapter 17 the blood had been wiped from Hawk's face, and his dark hair was damp, curling against his temples and forehead. His broadsword was absent, but the two shorter swords were still attached to his waist. Standing in my chambers with his booted feet braced, shoulder width apart, and the curve of his jaw hard, Hawk reminded me so very much of Theon, the god of accord and war. He appeared no less dangerous than he had on the rise. And it was clear by the fiery burn of his amber gaze that he wasn't here to make peace. He glanced over to where Tawny stood, struck as silent and still as I was. Your services are no longer needed this evening. 
Tawny's mouth dropped open. Snapping out of my stupor, I had a very different reaction. You don't have the authority to dismiss her. I don't? He raised a dark brow. As your personal royal guard, I have the authority to remove any threats. Threats? Tawny frowned. I'm not a threat. You pose the threat of making up excuses or lying on behalf of Penelope. Just like you said she was asleep when I know for a fact that she was on the rise. He countered, and Tawny snapped her mouth shut. She turned to me. I have a feeling I'm missing an important piece of information. I didn't get a chance to tell you, I explained, and it wasn't that important. Tawny lifted her brows. Beside her, Hawk snorted. I'm sure it was one of the most important things to have happened to you in a long time. My eyes narrowed. You have an overinflated sense of involvement in my life if you really think that. I think I have a good grasp on just how much of a role I play in your life. Doubtful, I parroted back. I do wonder if you actually believe half the lies you tell. Tawny's gaze snapped back and forth between us. I am not lying, thank you very much. He smiled, showing off the dimple in his right cheek. Whatever you need to tell yourself, princess. Don't call me that. I stomped my foot. Hawk lifted an eyebrow. Did that make you feel good? Yes, because the only other option is to kick you. So violent, he chuckled. Oh my gods, my hands curled into fists. You shouldn't be in here. I'm your personal god, he replied. I can be wherever I feel I'm needed to keep you safe. And what do you think you need to protect me from in here? I demanded, looking around. An unruly bedpost I might stub my toe on? Oh, wait. Are you worried I might faint? I know how good you are at handling such emergencies. You do look a little pale, he replied. My ability to catch frail, delicate females may come in handy. I sucked in a sharp breath. But as far as I can determine... Other than a random abduction attempt, you, princess, are the greatest threat to yourself. Well, Tawny drew the word out, and when I shot her a look that should have sent her running from the room, she shrugged. He kind of has a point there. You're absolutely no help. Penelope and I do need to speak, he said, his gaze never leaving mine. I can assure you that she is safe with me. And I'm sure that whatever I'm about to discuss with her, she'll tell you all about it later. Tawny crossed her arms. Yes, she will. But that's not nearly as entertaining as witnessing it. I sighed. It's okay, Tawny. I'll see you in the morning. She stared at me. Seriously? Seriously, I confirmed. I have a feeling that if you don't leave, he's just going to stand there and drain precious air from my room. While looking exceptionally handsome, he added. You forgot to add that. A short, light giggle left Tawny. I ignored the comment. And I would like to get some rest before the sun rises. Tawny exhaled loudly. Fine. She glanced over at Hawk. Princess? Oh my gods, I muttered, a dull ache pulsing behind my eyes. Hawk watched Tawny, waiting until she had slipped through the adjoining door before saying, I like her. Good to know, I said. What is it you wish to talk about that couldn't wait until the morning? His gaze slid back to me. You have beautiful hair. I blinked. My hair was unbound. And without seeing it, I knew it was a mess of crimped waves. I resisted the urge to touch it. Is that what you wanted to talk about? Not exactly. Then his gaze dipped and roamed slowly, starting at my shoulders, moving all the way down to the tips of my toes. His stare was heavy, almost like a touch, and a flush followed in its wake. 
It was at that exact moment I remembered that not only was my face uncovered, but I was also wearing only a thin sleeping gown. I knew that with the light of the fire and the oil lamps behind me, very little of the shape of my body was hidden from Hawk. The flush deepened, became headier. I started for the robe lying at the foot of the bed. Hawk's lips twisted into a knowing half-smile that sent a bolt of irritation streaking through me. I stopped, meeting his gaze and holding it. Hawk might not have seen all the shadowy areas visible beneath the flimsy white gown, but he had done more than just feel a few of them with his hands. There was a tiny part of me that thought about moving my hair to cover the left side of my face, but he'd seen the scars already, and I wasn't ashamed of them. I utterly refused to allow what the Duke had said about Hawk, saying that I was beautiful, to have any impact on me. Hiding my face or covering myself was rather pointless, but more importantly, I swore I saw a challenge in his gaze, as if he expected me to do both things. I would not. A long, tense moment passed. Was that all you were wearing under the cloak? That's none of your concern, I told him, as I held my arms to my sides. Something flickered across his face, reminding me of the look Victor often gave me when I bested him. But it was gone too quickly for me to be sure. Feels like it should be, he said. The rasp of his voice caused a wave of goosebumps to break out over my skin. That sounds like your problem, not mine. He stared at me with that strange expression again. The one that made me think he was caught between amusement and curiosity. You're, you're nothing like I expected. The way he said that sounded so genuine that some of my irritation eased. Was it my skill with an arrow or the blade? Or was it the fact that I took you to the ground? Barely took me to the ground, he corrected. His chin dipped and his lashes lowered, shielding his odd eyes. All of those things. But you forgot to add in the red pearl. I never expected to find the maiden there. I snorted. I imagine not. His lashes lifted, and there was a wealth of questions in his stare. I didn't think there'd be any avoiding them this time around. Suddenly, too tired to stand there and argue, I walked over to one of the two chairs by the fire all too aware of how the sides of my gown parted, revealing nearly the entire length of my leg. And all too aware of how Hawk tracked every step. That was the first time I was in the Red Pearl. I sat, letting my hands fall to my lap. And the reason I was on the second floor was because Victor came in. I wrinkled my nose as I gave a little shudder. He would have recognized me, mask or not. I went upstairs because a woman told me the room was empty. I still felt as if she had set me up, but that was neither here nor there at the moment. I'm not telling you this because I feel like I need to explain myself. I'm just telling the truth. I didn't know you were in the room. He remained where he stood. But you knew who I was, he said. And that wasn't a question. Of course. I shifted my gaze to the fire. Your arrival had already stirred up quite a bit of talk. Flattered, he murmured. My lips twitched as I watched the flames curl and ripple over the thick logs of wood. Why I decided to stay in the room isn't up for discussion. I know why you stayed in the room, he said. You do? It makes sense now. I thought back to that night and remembered what he had said. He seemed to sense that I was there to experience, to live. Now that he knew what I was, it would make sense. But that still wasn't something I was willing to discuss. What are you going to do about me being on the rise? He didn't answer for a long moment. And then he walked to where I sat, his long-legged prowl full of fluid grace. May I? He gestured to the empty seat. I nodded. 
Sitting across from me, he leaned forward, resting his elbows on his bent knees. It was Victor who trained you, wasn't it? My pulse skipped, but I kept my face blank. It had to be him. You two are close, and he's been with you since you arrived in Macedonia. You've been asking questions. I'd be stupid not to learn everything I could about the person I'm duty-bound to die to protect. He had a very good point there. I'm not going to answer your question. Because you're afraid I'll go to the Duke, even though I didn't before? You said out on the rise that you should, I reminded him. That it would make your job easier. I'm not going to bring anyone else down with me. He inclined his head. I said that I should, not that I would. There's a difference? You should know there is. His gaze flickered over my face. What would his grace do if I had gone to him? My fingers curled inward. It doesn't matter. Then why did you say I had no idea what he'd do? You sounded as if you were going to say more, but stopped yourself. I looked away, staring at the fire. I wasn't going to say anything. Hawk was quiet for a long moment. Both you and Tawny reacted strangely to his summons. We weren't expecting to hear from him. The lie rolled off my tongue. There was another pause. Why were you in your room for almost two days after being summoned by him? Sharp, biting pain radiated from where my nails dug into my palms. The flames were dying, flickering softly. What did he do to you? Hawk asked, his voice too soft. Suffocating shame crept up my throat, tasting acidic. Why do you even care? Why wouldn't I? He asked, and again he sounded unbelievably sincere. My head turned before I realized what I was doing. He'd sat back, hands curled around the arms of the wingback chair. You don't know me. I bet I know you better than most. Heat creeped into my cheeks. That doesn't mean you know me, Hawk. Not enough to care. I know you're not like the other members of the court. I'm not a member of the court, I pointed out. You're the maiden. You're viewed as a child of the gods by the commoners. They see you higher than an ascended. But I know you're compassionate. That night at the Red Pearl, when we talked about death, you genuinely felt sympathy for any losses I'd experienced. It wasn't a forced nicety. How do you know? I'm a good judge of people's words, he remarked. You wouldn't speak out of fear of being discovered until I referred to Tawny as your maid. You defended her at the risk of exposing yourself. He paused. And I saw you. Saw what? He tipped forward again, lowering his voice. I saw you during the city council. You didn't agree with the Duke and Duchess. I couldn't see your face, but I could tell you were uncomfortable. You felt bad for that family. So did Tawny. No offense to your friend, but she looked half asleep throughout most of that. I doubt she even knew what was going on. I couldn't exactly argue that point, but what he had seen was me briefly losing control of my gift. However, that didn't change the fact that I wasn't okay with what was happening to the Tulis family. And you know how to fight, and fight well. Not only that, you're obviously brave. There are many men, trained men, who wouldn't go out on the rise during a craven attack if they didn't have to. The Ascended could have gone out there, and they'd have a higher chance of surviving, yet they didn't. You did. I shook my head. Those things are just traits. They don't mean you know me well enough to care about what does and doesn't happen to me. His eyes fixed on mine. Would you care what happens to me? Well, yes. My brows knitted in a frown. 
I would, but you don't know me. I snapped my mouth shut. Damn it. You're a decent person, princess, he sat back. That's why you care. And you're not a decent person? Hawk lowered his gaze. I'm many things. Decent is rarely one of them. I had no idea how to respond to that little bit of honesty. You're not going to tell me what the Duke did, are you? He sighed, his back bowing slightly in the chair. You know, I'll find out, one way or another. I almost laughed. I was confident that was one thing no one would ever speak about. If you think so. I know so, he replied, and a heartbeat passed. It's weird, isn't it? What is? His gaze met mine again, and I felt a hitch in my chest. I couldn't look away. I felt ensnared. How it feels like I've known you longer? You feel that too. I couldn't deny it, but he was right, and it was weird. I said none of that because I didn't want to acknowledge it. Doing so felt like a start down a road I couldn't travel. Knowing that caused a deep, twisting sensation in my chest. And I didn't want to acknowledge that either, because it felt a lot like disappointment. And didn't that mean I'd already begun to travel that road? I broke eye contact, my gaze falling to my hands. Why were you on the rise? He asked, changing the subject. Wasn't it obvious? Your motivation wasn't. At least tell me that. Tell me what drove you to go up there to fight them. Easing open my fingers, I slipped two of them under the sleeve of my right arm. They skimmed my skin until the tips brushed over two jagged tears. There were others, along my stomach and my thighs. It would be easy to lie, to come up with any number of reasons, but I wasn't sure if there was any harm in the truth. Was three instead of two knowing the truth somehow earth-shattering? I didn't think it was. The scar on my face? Do you know how I got it? Your family was attacked by some craven when you were a child, he answered. Victor, he filled you in? A faint, tired smile pulled at my lips. It's not the only scar. When he said nothing, I slipped my hand out from under my sleeve. When I was six, my parents decided to leave the capital for the Nile Valley. They wanted a much quieter life, or so I'm told. I don't remember much from the trip, other than my mother and father being incredibly tense throughout the whole thing. Ian and I were young and didn't know a lot about the Craven, so we weren't afraid of being out there or stopping at one of the smaller villages a place I was told later hadn't seen a craven attack in decades. There was just a short wall, like most of the smaller towns, and we were staying at the inn only for one night. The place smelled like cinnamon and cloves, I remember that. I closed my eyes. They came at night, in the mist. There was no time once they appeared. My father, he went out onto the street to try and fend them off while my mother hid us, but they came through the door and the windows before she could even step outside. The memory of my mother's screams forced my eyes open. I swallowed. A woman, someone who was staying at the inn, was able to grab Ian and pull him into this hidden room, but I hadn't wanted to leave my mom, and it just Dark and disjointed flashes of the night attempted to piece themselves together. Blood on the floor, the walls, running down my mother's arms, losing my grip on her slippery hand, and then grabbing hands and snapping teeth, the claws, and then the soul-crushing, fiery pain, until finally, nothing. I woke up days later back in the capital. Queen Ileana was by my side. She told me what had happened, that our parents were gone. I'm sorry, Hawk said, and I nodded. I truly am. It's a miracle you survived. 
The gods protected me. That's what the queen told me, that I was chosen. I came to learn later that it was one of the reasons the queen had begged my mother and father not to leave the safety of the capital. That, that if the dark one became aware of the maiden being unprotected, he'd send the craven after me. He wanted me dead then, but apparently he wants me alive now. I laughed, and it hurt a little. What happened to your family is not your fault. And there could be any number of reasons for why they attacked that village. He dragged a hand through his hair, pushing the now dry strands back from his forehead. What else do you remember? No one. No one in that inn knew how to fight. Not my parents, none of the women, or even the men. They all relied on the handful of guards. I rubbed my fingers together. If my parents knew how to defend themselves, they could have survived. It might have been just a small chance, but one nonetheless. Understanding flickered across Hawk's face. And you want that chance? I nodded. I won't. I refuse to be helpless. No one should be. Blowing out a little breath, I stilled my fingers. You saw what happened tonight. They reached the top of the rise. If one makes it over, more will follow. No rise is impenetrable. And even if it were, mortals come back from outside the rise cursed. It happens more than people realize. Any moment, that curse could spread in this city. If I'm going down, you'll go down fighting, he finished for me. I nodded. Like I said, you're very brave. I don't think it's bravery. I returned to staring at my hands. I think it's fear. Fear and bravery are often one and the same. It either makes you a warrior or a coward. The only difference is the person it resides inside. My gaze lifted to him in stunned silence. It took me a moment to formulate a response. You sound so many years older than what you appear. Only half of the time, he said. You saved lives tonight, princess. I ignored the nickname. But many died. Too many, he agreed. The craven are a never-ending plague. Letting my head rest against the back of the chair, I wiggled my toes toward the fire. As long as an Atlantean lives, there will be craven. That is what they say, he said. And when I glanced back at him, a muscle flexed along his jaw as he stared at the dwindling fire. You said that more come back from outside the rise, cursed, than people realize. How do you know that? I opened my mouth. Damn it! How would I know that? I've heard rumors. Shit. His gaze slid to me. It's not spoken about a lot, and when it is, it's only whispered. Unease stirred. You're going to need to be more detailed. I've heard that the child of the gods has helped those who are cursed, he said. And I tensed that she has aided them, given them death with dignity. I didn't know if I should be relieved that was all he'd heard and that he hadn't brought up my gift. But the fact that he, someone who hadn't been in the city all that long, had heard such rumors wasn't exactly reassuring. If Victor found out that Hawk had heard such a thing, he would not be happy. Then again, I doubted if Victor would allow me to assist him after the last time anyway. Who has said such things? I asked. A few of the gods, he told me, and my stomach sank even further. I didn't believe them at first, to be honest. I schooled my features. Well, you should have stuck with your initial reaction. They're mistaken if they think I would commit outright treason against the crown. His gaze flickered over my face. Didn't I just tell you that I was a good judge of character? So? 
so I know you're lying, he replied. I wondered what exactly made him believe that it was me the guards had been talking about. And I understand why you would. Those men speak of you with such awe that before I even met you, I half expected you to be a child of the gods. They would never report you. That may be the case, but you heard them talking about it. Others could hear them as well. Perhaps I should be clearer in what I said about hearing rumors. They were actually speaking to me, he clarified, since I too have helped those who are cursed die with dignity. I did so in the capital and do so here as well. My lips parted as my stomach steadied, but my heart flipped and flopped around like a fish out of water. Those who come back cursed have already given all for the kingdom. Being treated as anything other than the heroes they are, and being dragged in front of the public to be murdered, is the last thing they or their families should have to go through. I didn't know what to say as I stared at him. He was speaking my own thoughts, and I knew there were others out there who believed the same. Obviously. But to know that he was willing to risk high treason to do what was right? I've kept you up long enough. I arched a brow. That is all you have to say to me about being on the rise. I ask only one thing of you. He rose, and I prepared for him to tell me to stay away from the rise. I'd probably tell him I would. Of course I wouldn't. And I didn't think he'd believe me. The next time you go out, wear better shoes and thicker clothing. Those slippers are likely to be the death of you, and that dress, the death of me. Chapter 18 Hawk hadn't reported my presence, but he did tell someone. I discovered that when I woke up only a few hours after he'd left and went to see if Victor was up for training. There wasn't a single part of me that was surprised to find him waiting for me and more than ready to get physical. I wanted to talk to him about what had happened with the craven reaching the top of the rise. Victor wanted to talk about what Hawk had told him. Apparently, after he'd left my room, he went straight to Victor. I wasn't exactly mad about that. Mostly just annoyed with Hawk feeling the need to tell Victor anything. But it confirmed that Hawk figured Victor would be aware of my presence on the rise, or at the very least, not surprised or angered by it. Hawk had miscalculated the whole not being angered part. Victor frowned as he prowled around me, eyeing my stance. He was checking to make sure my legs were braced and my feet were planted shoulder width apart. You shouldn't have been on the rise. But I was and you were caught. Victor stopped in front of me. What would you have done if it had been another guard who discovered you? If it were anyone else, I wouldn't have been caught. This isn't a joke, Poppy. I didn't say anything funny, I said. I'm being honest. Hawk is, he's fast, and he's very well trained. Which is why we're working on your hand-to-hand -hand combat. My lips thinned. My hand-to-hand -hand fighting skills aren't bad. If that was true, he wouldn't have caught you. Go, Victor ordered. Keeping my chin low, I threw a punch. He blocked with his forearm, and I pulled back, looking for an opening, though not finding one. So I made one. I shifted as if to kick, and his arms dropped a fraction of an inch. My opening appeared, and I swung, slamming my fist into his stomach. He grunted softly. Nice move. I dropped my arms, smiling. It was, wasn't it? Victor smirked, but it faded quickly. I know you're probably tired of me saying this, he started, but I'm gonna say it again. You need to be more careful, and you're throwing punches with your arm instead of your core. I was getting tired of hearing him say that. I am careful, and I'm throwing a punch like you taught me. Your swings are weak, limp. That's not how I taught you. He grabbed my arm, shaking it like a wet noodle. You don't have a lot of upper body strength. Your strength is here. He placed his hand on the front of my stomach. 
you will inflict way more damage this way. When you throw a punch, your torso and hips should move with you. I nodded and did what he said. I missed, but I could feel the difference in the swing. Hawk isn't going to report me to his grace. You really think that? He blocked my next punch. Better. If he was going to say anything, he would have gone straight to the Duke. There could be a hundred reasons why he hasn't said anything yet. A few days ago, I would have agreed, but not anymore. Not after what he'd confessed the night prior. I don't think he's going to, Victor. I don't have anything to worry about. And neither do you. I didn't tell him you were the one who trained me. Poppy, he said. He said it in the same way he had when I asked if he thought I could hide a broadsword under my veil. I still believed I could. I just needed to position it right. You don't know him. I know that. I crossed my arms as Victor backed off. But you don't know him either. You don't know what his motivations are, why he would keep quiet. I knew what he'd said about the Red Pearl, and I was sure it also applied to the Rise. But it was more than that. The fact that Hawk was willing to risk being charged with high treason to help those who'd been cursed spoke volumes about who he was as a person. It didn't feel right sharing that with Victor, though. There was a reason we didn't know the identities of others in the network. So I went with, he said that if he had, he knew I wouldn't trust him, which would make his job harder. You have to admit he has a point. He does, but that doesn't mean you shouldn't be careful. Victor fell silent for a moment. And I understand, I do. Understand what? Like I said before, he's an attractive young man. That has nothing to do with it. And you've been surrounded by old men like me. You're not all that old. He blinked. Thanks. A pause, I think. It has nothing to do with how he looks. I'm not saying that I don't think he's attractive. I do. But that's not why I trust him. And that was the truth. My faith didn't stem from what he looked like. I'm not that foolish. I'm not suggesting you are. He thrust a hand through his hair. So... You trust him. I, I told him why I needed to be out on that rise. I told him about the night my family was attacked. You know how he responded? Even though he said at first that I shouldn't be out there, he listened to my reasons. And the only thing he said was that I needed to wear better shoes. I figured I'd keep the part about my gown to myself. I trust him, Victor. Is there a reason I shouldn't? Victor sighed heavily as he looked away. He hasn't given us any reason to doubt him. I know that. It's just that we don't know him. And you're important to me, Poppy. Not just because you're the maiden, but because you're... you. A knot of emotion formed in my chest and fought its way up my throat. I didn't give him a chance to realize what I was doing, I launched myself at him, wrapping my arms around his waist and hugging him tightly. Thank you, I murmured against his chest. Victor was as stiff as a guard on the rise for the very first time, but then he put his hands on my back and patted me. I grinned. You know I'll never replace your father, nor would I ever try to, but you're like a daughter to me. I hugged him tighter. He patted me again. I worry about you, partly because it's my job, but mostly because it's you. You're important to me, too. My words were muffled against his chest. Even though you think my punches are weak. His chuckle was rough as he dropped his chin to the top of my head. Your punches are weak when you're not doing them correctly. He pulled back, clasping my cheeks. But girl, your aim is deadly. Don't ever forget that. The gods have not failed us. The ascended have not failed you. The duke's voice carried from where he stood on the balcony of the castle wall that evening. Below him, a mass of people filled the open yard. And under the glow of oil lamps and torches, 
I could see several wore all black, the somber color of death. Among them were guards astride horses, keeping an eye on the nervous crowd. I'd never known his grace to address the people like this. He and the Duchess were never in front of so many, not even during the councils or the right. I couldn't have been more surprised when both Victor and Hawk arrived after supper to escort me to the balcony. Then again, how many years had it been since such a significant movement of Craven reached the rise? Black flags had been raised over too many homes, and too many funeral pyres had been lit at dawn. The air was still choked with ash and incense. Because of the gods' blessing, Tierman continued, the rise did not fall last night. Standing back, next to Tawny and flanked by Victor and Hawk, I wondered exactly how the gods' blessing had kept the wall from falling. It had been the guards, men like the archer who had chosen death over allowing the craven to come over the top. They reached the top, a man shouted. They almost made it over the rise. Are we safe? When it happens again, the duchess answered, her soft voice silencing the murmurs. Because it will happen again. Behind the veil, my brows lifted. Over my right shoulder, I heard Hawk murmur dryly, that will surely ease fears. My lips twitched. The truth is not designed to ease fears, Victor responded. Is that why we tell lies then? Hawk questioned, and I pressed my lips together. Ever since they'd arrived to escort Tawny and me, they had been doing this. One of them would say something, anything. The other would disagree, only for the one who'd spoken first to have the last word. It started with Hawk commenting that it was surprisingly warm this evening and that I should enjoy it, to which Victor had followed up by stating that the temperatures would surely drop too rapidly for that. Hawk had proceeded to ask Victor where he'd gained such prophetic knowledge of the weather. In the span of an hour, it had only progressed from there as they attempted to outsnark each other. Hawk was winning by at least three comebacks. Even after I had defended him to Victor, and I hadn't been lying when I told him that I trusted Hawk, there was still a small part of me that couldn't believe what he'd said. He hadn't told me never to go on the rise again. He hadn't demanded that I stay in my room where it was theoretically safer. Instead, He'd listened to my reasons for why I needed to be out there and accepted them, only asking that I wear more suitable shoes and additional clothing. The latter annoyed and excited me, which was altogether confusing and was definitely not something that I'd shared with Victor that morning. My gaze slid to the Duchess as she stepped forward. The gods didn't fail you, she repeated placing her hands on the waist-high railing beside her husband. We didn't fail you, but the gods are unhappy. That is why the craven reached the top of the rise. A murmur of dismay swept through the crowd like a rainstorm. We have spoken to them. They are not pleased with recent events, here and in nearby cities, she said scanning the paling and graying faces below. They fear that the good people of Solis have begun to lose faith in their decisions and are turning to those who wish to see the future of this great kingdom compromised. The whispers turned to outright cries of denouncement, startling the horses. The guardsmen quickly calmed the equine's nervous prancing. What did you all think would happen when those who support the Dark One and plot with him are standing among you right now? The Duke asked. As I speak, at this very moment, dissenters stare back at me, thrilled that the craven took so many lives last night. In this very crowd, there are dissenters who pray for the day that the Dark One comes. Those who celebrated the massacre of Three Rivers and the fall of Goldcrest Manor. Look to your left and to your right. You may see someone who helped conspire to abduct the maiden. 
I shifted uncomfortably as dozens and dozens of gazes landed on me. Then, one by one, as if the faces were dominoes stacked side by side, they looked to each other as if seeing neighbors and familiar faces for the first time. The gods hear and know all, even what is not spoken but resides in the heart, the duke said, and my stomach twisted with unease. What can any of us expect, he repeated, when those the gods have done all to protect come before us questioning the right? I tensed. Immediately the image of Mr. and Mrs. Tullis formed in my mind. He hadn't said their names, but he might as well have screamed them from the top of Castle Tierman. I didn't see them in the crowd, but that didn't mean they weren't there. What can anyone expect? When there are those who wish to see us dead, Tierman asked, raising his hands. When we are the gods given form, and the only thing that stands between you and the dark one and the curse his people have cast upon this land. And yet, not a single ascended, not the duke or duchess or any of the lords or ladies had raised one hand to defend the rise. All of them were faster and stronger than any guard. I imagined they could have taken down double the amount of craven I had with a bow. And just like Hawk had said, they had a higher likelihood of surviving an attack. What do you think would have happened if the craven had crested the rise? Tierman lowered his hands. Many of you were born within these walls and have never experienced the horror of a craven attack. Some of you know, though. You come from cities less guarded or were attacked on the roads. You know what would have happened if only a handful had made it past our guards. If the gods had turned their backs on the people of Solus, it would have been the wholesale slaughter of hundreds. Your wives, your children, yourselves. Many of you would not be standing here. He paused, and the crowd swelled. It happened again. I felt my senses stretch out from me, and that wasn't too surprising. With a crowd like this, it was hard to keep myself locked down. But I didn't, I didn't just feel pain. Something touched the back of my throat, reminding me of what I'd felt in the atrium with Lauren. Terror. I felt terror swelling and rising, coming from so many different directions as my gaze skittered from face to face. Another sensation reached me. It was hot and acidic. It wasn't physical pain. It was anger. My heart started thumping. I wasn't feeling pain, but I, I had to be feeling something. It didn't make sense, but I could sense it pressing against my skin like a hot iron. My throat dried as I swallowed hard. People clasped their hands under their chins and prayed to the gods. I took a small step back. Others stared, their expressions hard. Victor's hand touched my shoulder as he murmured, Are you all right? Yes? No? I wasn't sure. Anxiety-spiked adrenaline flooded my system as icy ghost fingers danced along the back of my neck. Pressure clamped down on my chest. I wanted to run. I needed to get as far away from people as I could. But I couldn't. Closing my eyes, I focused on my breathing as I struggled to rebuild my mental walls. I kept breathing, in and out, as deeply and slowly as I could. And if you're lucky, they'll go for your throat, and it will be a quick death, the Duke was saying. Most of you will not be so fortunate. They'll tear into your flesh and tissue, feasting on your blood while you scream for the gods you've lost faith in. This is perhaps the least calming speech ever given after an attack, Hawk muttered under his breath. His comment jarred me out of my spiral of panic, the utter dryness of his words cutting the cord that connected me to the people. My senses reeled back, and it was like a door slamming shut, locking. I felt, I felt nothing but my pounding heart and the sheen of sweat on my forehead. 
What he had done did more than loosen the hold the public sphere had on me. It not only created a crack in its grip, it obliterated it. The feelings had vanished so quickly that I almost wondered if I had felt them at all. If it had just been my mind playing tricks on me as the faces before me became clear once more, a continuous onslaught of different shades of fear and panic. My gaze sharpened as I took another look at the crowd, focusing on the faces that showed no emotion. Unnerved by their blank features, a trickle of unease curled its way down my spine. I focused on one of the men. He was younger, blonde hair falling to his shoulders. He was too far away to make out his eye color, but he stared up at the Duke and Duchess, lips pressed firmly together jaw a hard, broad line, while those who stood around him exchanged looks of terror. I recognized him. He'd been at the city council. He'd had that same expression then. And that thing had happened. The weird flood of sensations I shouldn't be able to feel. Or I didn't know I could. I checked out the crowd once more, easily picking up on the ones like him. There were at least a dozen that I could see. My gaze slid back to the blonde man as I thought about what I'd felt when I'd been with Lauren. What I'd felt from her made sense now, given what had occurred. She'd been excited about the possibility of the dark one being nearby, as disturbing as that was. And she would have reason to fear that I would say something. This man may not show emotion in his features, but if he hadn't agreed with what was being done to the Tulis family, it would have come as no surprise that he'd feel anger now. Maybe it was all in my head. Perhaps something was happening to my gift. Was it possibly evolving so I could feel other emotions besides pain? I didn't know, and I needed to find out. But I had to say something now just in case. I turned my head to the right, toward Victor. Do you see him? I whispered, describing the blonde man. Yes, Victor stepped closer. There are others like him. I faced the audience. I see them, he said. Be alert, Hawk. There may be trouble. Hawk cut him off. I've been tracking the blonde for 20 minutes. He's slowly working his way to the front. Three more have also inched closer. My brows rose. He was so very observant. Are we safe? Tawny asked, keeping her attention focused on the crowd. Always, Hawk murmured. I nodded when her gaze briefly met mine, hoping she was reassured. My hand brushed my thigh. My dagger was sheathed under the white floor-length tunic. The feel of the bone handle helped to ease whatever panic lingered. The Duke was still mesmerizing the crowd with tales of gore and horror, while I kept my focus on the blonde man. He wore a dark cloak over his broad shoulders, and any number of weapons could be hidden underneath. I knew that from personal experience. But we have spoken to the gods on your behalf, the Duchess's voice rang out. We have told them that the people of Solis especially those who live in Macedonia, are worthy. They haven't given up on you. We made sure of that. Cheers rang out, the mood of the crowd shifting rapidly, but the blonde man still showed no reaction. And we will honor their faith in the people of Solus by not shielding those you suspect of supporting the Dark One, who seek nothing but destruction and death, she said. You will be rewarded greatly in this life and in the one beyond. That we can promise you. There was another round of cheers, and then someone yelled out, We will honor them during the rite. We will, the Duchess cried out, pushing back from the ledge. What better way to show the gods our gratitude? than to celebrate the rite. His and her grace stepped back from the balcony then, side by side, 
almost touching but not quite, as they both lifted their hands on opposite sides of the bodies and began to wave. Lies, a voice shouted from the crowd. It was the blonde man. Liars! Time seemed to stop. Everyone froze. You do nothing to protect us while you hide in your castles behind your guards. You do nothing but steal children in the name of false gods, he yelled. Where are the third and fourth sons and daughters? Where are they really? Then there was a sound, a sharp intake of breath that came from everywhere, both inside and outside of me. The blonde man's cloak parted as he yanked out his hand. There was a shout, a scream of warning from below. A guard astride a horse turned, but he wasn't fast enough. The blonde man cocked back his arm and seize him, shouted Commander Jansen. The man threw something. It wasn't a dagger or a rock. It was too oddly shaped for that, as it ripped through the air, headed straight toward the Duke of Macedonia. He moved incredibly fast, becoming almost nothing but a blur as Victor shouldered me back. Hawk's arm folded around my waist, and he hauled me against him as the object flew past us, smacking into the wall. It thumped off the ground, and my gaze lowered to where it came to rest. It was, it was a hand. Victor knelt, picking it up and rising, the line of his mouth tense. What in the name of the gods, he murmured. But it wasn't just any hand. It was the clawed, grayish hand of a craven. I looked at the blonde man. A royal guard had him on his knees, arms twisted behind his back. Blood smeared his mouth. From blood and ash, he yelled, even as the guard gripped the back of his head. We will rise from blood and ash. We will rise. Over and over he screamed the words as even the guards dragged him through the crowd. The duke turned back to the crowd and laughed, the sound cold and dry. And just like that, the gods have revealed at least one of you, haven't they? Chapter 19 Hawk quickly ushered Tawny and me back inside the castle, while Victor moved to talk to the commander. Where in the world did that man get a craven's hand? Tawny asked, the skin around her mouth tight as we walked past the great hall and under the banners. He could have been outside the rise and cut it off one of those who was killed last night. Hawk answered, that's... Tawny placed her hand to her chest. I really have no words for that. Neither did I. But the appendage might have been from a cursed who'd turned inside the rise. I kept that to myself as we passed several servants. I can't believe he said what he did about the children, the third and fourth sons and daughters. Neither can I, Tawny said. What a terrible thing to claim. Those children... Many who were adults by now were in the temples, serving the gods. While I didn't agree with there being no exceptions, insinuating that they were being stolen as if done for nefarious purposes was outrageous. There only needed to be a few words spoken for them to behave like an infection, tainting a person's mind. I didn't even want to imagine what the parents of those children were now thinking. I wouldn't be surprised if more people thought along those same lines, Hawk commented, and both Tawny and my heads swiveled in his direction. He walked beside me, only a step behind. He raised his brows. None of those children have been seen. They've been seen by the priests and priestesses and the ascended, Tawny corrected, but not by family. His gaze flickered over the statues as we headed toward the stairs. Perhaps, if people could see their children every so often, beliefs like that could easily be dismissed, fears allayed. He had a point, but 
No one should make claims like that without any evidence, I argued. All it does is cause unnecessary worry and panic. Panic that the dissenters have created and then will exploit. Agreed. He glanced down. Watch your step. Wouldn't want you to continue with your new habit, princess. Tripping once isn't a habit, I shot back. And if you agree, then why would you say you wouldn't be surprised if more felt the same way? Because agreeing doesn't mean I don't understand why some would think that, he answered, and I snapped my mouth shut. If the Ascended are truly concerned about those claims being believed, all they need to do is allow the children to be seen. I can't imagine that would interfere too badly with their servitude to the gods. No, I didn't think that would. Glancing at Tawny, I saw her staring at Hawk as we strode down the second floor hall, headed toward the older portion of the castle. What do you think? I asked. Tawny blinked as she looked over at me. I think you're both saying the same thing. A half grin formed on Hawk's face, and I didn't say anything as we climbed up the staircase. Hawk stopped us near Tawny's door. If you don't mind, I need to speak to Penelope in private for a moment. My brows lifted behind the veil while Tawny sent a poorly concealed glance between us as the corners of her lips tilted up. She then waited for me to signal whether it was fine or not. It's fine, I told her. Tawny nodded and then opened her door, stopping long enough to say, if you need me, knock. She paused. Princess, I groaned. Hawk chuckled. I really do like her. I'm sure she'd love to hear that. Would you love to hear that I really like you? He asked. My heart skipped a beat, but I ignored the stupid organ. Would you be sad if I said no? I'd be devastated. I snorted. I'm sure. We reached my door. What did you need to talk about? He motioned to the room, and figuring what he had to say was something he didn't want overheard, I went to open the door. I should enter first, princess. He easily sidestepped me. Why? I frowned at his back. Do you think someone could be waiting for me? If the dark one came for you once, he'll come for you again. A chill danced down my spine as Hawk entered the room. Two oil lamps had been left burning by the door and bed, and wood had been added to the fireplace, casting the room in a soft, warm glow. I didn't stare too long at the bed, which meant that I somehow ended up staring at Hawk's broad back as he scanned the room. The edges of his hair brushed the collar of his tunic, and those strands looked so soft. I hadn't touched them that night at the Red Pearl, and I wished I had. I needed help. Is it okay for me to enter? I asked, clasping my hands together. Or should I wait out here while you inspect under the bed for stray dust bunnies? Hawk looked over his shoulder. It's not dust bunnies I'm worried about. Steps, on the other hand, yes. Oh my gods. And the dark one will keep coming until he has what he wants, he said, looking away. I shivered. Your room should always be checked before you enter it. I folded my arms over my chest, chilled despite the fire. I watched as he circled back to the door, quietly closing it. Hawk faced me, one hand on the hilt of a short sword, and the flipping in my chest doubled. His face was so strikingly pieced together. From the wide set of his lips, the upward slant of his eyebrows, to the shadowy hollows under his high, broad cheekbones. He could have been the muse for the paintings that hung in the city's Anthenaeum. Are you all right? Hawk asked. Yes. Why do you ask? Something appeared to happen to you as the Duke addressed the people. I made a mental note to remember exactly how observant Hawk was. I was, I started to say that I'd been fine, but I knew he wouldn't believe that. I got a little dizzy, I guess I haven't eaten enough today. His intense gaze tracked over what he could see of my face, and even with the veil, I felt unbearably exposed when he looked at me like he did then. 
I hate this. Hate what? I asked, confused. Hawk didn't respond immediately. I hate talking to the veil. Oh, understanding rippled through me as I reached up and touched the length that hid my hair. I imagine most people don't enjoy it. I can't imagine you do. I don't, I admitted, and then glanced around the room as if I expected Priestess Analia to be hiding somewhere. I mean, I'd prefer if people were able to see me. He tilted his head to the side. What does it feel like? Air hitched in my throat. No one, no one had ever asked me that before. And while I had thought a lot of thoughts and feelings about the veil, I wasn't sure how to put them into words, even though I trusted Hawk. Some things, once spoken, were given a life of their own. I walked to one of the chairs and sat on the edge as I tried to figure out what to say. Suddenly my brain sort of spit out the only thing that came to mind. It feels suffocating. Hawk drew closer. Then why do you wear it? I didn't realize I had a choice. I looked up at him. You have a choice now. He knelt in front of me. It's just you and me, walls and a pathetically inadequate supply of furniture. My lips twitched. Do you wear your veil when you're with Tawny? He asked. I shook my head, no. Then why are you wearing it now? Because I'm allowed to be without my veil with her. I was told that you were supposed to be veiled at all times, even with those approved to see you. He was, of course, correct. Hawk arched a brow. I sighed. I don't wear my veil when I'm in my room, and I don't expect anyone to come in other than Tawny. And I don't wear it then because I feel more in control. I can make the choice not to wear it, he finished for me. Nodding, I was more than a little stunned that he'd nailed it. You have a choice now. I do. But it was hard to explain that the veil also served as a barrier. With it, I remembered what I was and the importance of that. Without it, well, it was easy to want, <laughs> to simply want. His gaze searched the veil, and a long moment passed. Then he nodded and rose slowly. I'll be outside if you need anything. A strange lump formed in my throat, making it impossible for me to speak. I remained where I was as he left the room, staring at the closed door once he was gone. I didn't move. I didn't remove the veil. Not for a long time. Not until I no longer wanted. The following evening, I stood outside the Duchess's receiving room on the second floor. It was at the opposite end of the hall from the Duke's, and I kept my back to his room. I didn't want to see it let alone think about it. Two royal guards stood outside Jacinda's room, while Victor waited beside me. I'd told him that morning what had really happened during the Duchess's and Duke's address to the people, and how I wasn't sure if I had actually felt something or not. He suggested that I speak with the Duchess, since the priestess was unlikely to give me any useful information, and the Duchess, depending on her mood, was more likely to speak openly. I just hoped she was in a talkative mood. Neither Victor nor I spoke in the presence of the other royal guards, but I knew he was concerned over what I shared, about what it could mean if my gift was evolving, or if it was my mind. It could just be the stress of everything that's happened, he'd said. It may be better to wait until you're sure it is your gift before alerting anyone. I knew Victor worried that if it was my mind, that it would somehow be held against me. But I didn't want to wait until it happened again. I'd rather know now if it was my gift or not, so I could react better. The door opened, and one of the royal guards stepped out. Her grace will see you now, 
Victor remained outside as planned, since knowledge of my gift was supposed to be limited to the Duke and Duchess and the Temple clergy. I broke so many rules. It was no wonder that Hawk had seemed surprised when I wouldn't remove my veil the night before. That's what I was thinking as I walked into the receiving room. I filed those thoughts away as I looked around. I'd always liked this room with its ivory walls and light gray furnishings. There was something peaceful about it, and it was also warm and inviting despite there being no windows. It had to be all the dazzling chandeliers. My gaze found the Duchess seated at a small circular table where she was drinking from a small cup. Garbed in a gown of the palest yellow, she reminded me of spring in the capital. She looked up, a slight smile on her ageless face. Come, have a seat. Walking forward, I took the chair across from her, noting the plate of pastries. All that was left were the items with nuts. The chocolate scones were probably the first to be devoured. The Duchess had the same weakness as Victor. You wished to speak with me? She placed the delicate flowery cup on its matching saucer. I nodded. Yes, I know you're very busy, but I was hoping you'd be able to help me with something. Her head inclined, sending soft russet colored waves tumbling over her shoulder. I must admit, you have me curious. I cannot remember the last time you came to me for assistance. I could. It was when I'd asked for my chambers to be moved to the older part of the castle, something I was sure she still didn't quite understand. I wanted to talk to you. I drew in a deep breath. I wanted to talk to you about my gift. There was a slight widening of her pitch black eyes. I was not expecting that to be a topic. Has someone discovered your gift? No, your grace. That's not at all what has happened. Picking up the napkin from her lap, she wiped her fingers. What then? Please do not keep me in suspense. I think something is happening with it, I told her. There have been a few situations where I, I believe I felt something other than pain. Slowly, she placed the napkin on the table. You were using your gift. You know the gods have forbidden you to do so. Not until you have been found worthy of such a gift are you to use it. I know, I haven't. I lied easily, probably a little too easily. But sometimes it just happens. When I'm in a large crowd, I have trouble controlling it. Has this been discussed with the priestess? Good gods, no. It doesn't happen often, I swear, and it has only happened recently. I will double my efforts to control it. But when it happened earlier, I think I, I think I felt something other than pain. The Duchess stared at me, unblinking for what felt like a small eternity. And then she rose from her seat. A little unnerved, I watched her go to the white cabinet against the wall. What? do you think you felt? Anger, I answered. During the city council and last night, I felt anger. I wouldn't speak of Lauren. I wouldn't do that to her. It was that man who, the dissenter. Yes, at least I think so, I amended. I think I was feeling anger from him. She poured a drink from a decanter. Have you felt anything else that seems abnormal to you? I, I think I've felt fear, too. When the Duke was speaking about the Craven attack. Terror is very similar to pain, but it feels different. And I thought that I might have felt something like, I don't know, excitement or anticipation? I frowned. Those two things are kind of the same thing, I suppose. In a way, it, do you feel anything now? She turned to me, a glass of what I thought might be sherry in her hand. I blinked from behind the veil. 
You want me to use my gift on you? She nodded. I thought, it doesn't matter what you thought, she interrupted, and I stiffened. I want you to use your gift now and tell me what, if anything, you feel. Despite finding her request more than strange, I did what she requested. I opened my senses, felt the cords stretch out between us, and, and connect with nothing but vast emptiness. A shiver danced over my skin. Do you feel anything, Penelope? Closing down the connection, I shook my head. I don't feel anything, Your Grace. The Duchess exhaled sharply through her nostrils. Then she downed her drink in one impressive gulp. My eyes widened as my mind rapidly processed her reaction. It was almost as if she expected me to feel something from her. But I'd never been able to. I didn't think I ever would be able to. Good, she breathed her skirts swishing around her ankles as she turned back to the cabinet, placing the glass down. I was wondering if I was truly feeling something or... I trailed off as she faced me. I believe your gift is maturing, she said, coming toward me. The bright light above her, glittering off the obsidian ring on her finger as she gripped the back of the chair. It would make sense that it would be happening as you're nearing your ascension. So this is normal. She clucked her tongue off the roof of her mouth. For a moment, it appeared as if she were about to say something, but then she changed her mind. Yes, I do believe so, but I, I would not speak to his grace about this. Tension crept into my shoulders at the thinly veiled warning. I was never sure if the Duchess knew about her husband's predilections. I couldn't imagine how she could be completely blind to them. But there was a part of me that hoped she was. Because if she knew and did nothing to stop him, did it make her any better? Or was I even being fair to her? Just because she was an ascended didn't mean she held power over her husband. It would remind him. Of the first maiden, she whispered. Shocked, I stared up at her. I had not been expecting her to bring up the first maiden, the one before me, the only other maiden I knew of. Did this happen with the previous maiden? It did. Her knuckles started to turn white, and I nodded. There had only been two maidens chosen by the gods. What do you know about the first maiden? Nothing, I admitted. I don't know her name or even when she lived. Or what happened to her upon her ascension. Or why it mattered whether or not my developing gift reminded the Duke of her. There is a reason for that. There was. Priestess Analia had never told me anything. She'd ignored any questions about her or my ascension. We do not speak of the first maiden, Penelope, she said. It's not that we simply choose not to. It is that we cannot. The gods forbade it, I suspected. She nodded as her stare seemed to penetrate my veil. I will break the rule just once and pray that the gods forgive me. But I will tell you this in hopes that your future does not end the same as the first maidens did. I had a really bad feeling about where this was going. We do not speak of her, ever. Her name is not worthy of our lips, nor the air we breathe. If it were possible, I'd have her name and her history scrubbed in its entirety. The chair cracked under Duchess Tierman's hand, startling me. My heart nearly stopped in my chest. Was she found unworthy by the gods? By some small miracle, she wasn't. 
but that doesn't mean she was worthy. If she hadn't been found unworthy, then why was she never spoken about? Surely she couldn't have been that bad if she hadn't been found unworthy. In the end, her worthiness didn't matter. Duchess Tierman lifted her fingers. The chair was warped, splintered. Her actions put her on a path that ended with her death. The Dark One killed her. Chapter 20 After years of destruction that had decimated entire cities, leaving countrysides and villages in ruins and ending hundreds of thousands of lives, the world was on the brink of chaos when, on the eve of the Battle of Broken Bones, Jalara Solis of Vodina Isles gathered his forces outside the city of Pompeii, the last Atlantean stronghold. I cleared my throat, wildly uncomfortable. Not only was that the longest sentence in the history of man, I always hated reading aloud, but especially when I had Hawk as an audience. I hadn't looked at him since I'd started reading. Still, I was almost positive that he was doing everything in his power to remain alert and not be bored into falling asleep while standing which sat at the foot of the Skotos Mountains. Skotos, Princess Analia interrupted. It's pronounced like Skotis. You know how it's pronounced, maiden. Do so correctly. My fingers tightened around the leather binding. The history of the War of Two Kings and the Kingdom of Solus was well over a thousand pages. And every week I was forced to read several chapters during my sessions with the priestess. I'd probably read the entire tome aloud over a dozen times. And I swore that each time the priestess changed the way Skotos was pronounced. I didn't say that. Instead, I took a deep, long breath and tried to ignore the almost overwhelming urge to throw the book at her face. It would do some damage probably break her nose. The image of her clasping her bloodied face brought forth a disturbing amount of glee. I smothered a yawn as I concentrated on the text. Having been up most of the night thinking about what the Duchess had told me, I'd gotten little sleep. And like I told Victor, I'd gotten few answers. But it had been a relief to learn that what was happening wasn't something that my mind was conjuring up. My abilities were maturing, whatever that meant. The Duchess hadn't wanted to discuss it further. So while I knew that what was happening was somewhat normal, I was also left with the knowledge that the First Maiden had done something that had put her on a path to interact with the Dark One, who'd killed her. That wasn't exactly reassuring. Neither was the knowledge that the First Maiden was somehow connected to the Duke. Was that why he treated me as he did? Perhaps it had nothing to do with my mother. I drew in a shallow breath, which sat at the foot of the Scotus Mountains. It's actually pronounced Scotos, came the interruption from the corner of the room. My eyes widened behind the veil as I looked over to Hawk. His face was all but devoid of expression. I glanced at the priestess, who sat across from me on an equally hard, cushionless wooden stool. I had no idea how old the priestess was. Her face was bare of makeup and smooth. But I thought that she might be at the end of her third decade of life. There were no gray strands in her brown hair that was sharply pulled back and held in a bun at the nape of her neck, causing her face to remind me of the hawks that I sometimes saw, perched up high in the queen's gardens. A shapeless red gown covered her from just under her neck, leaving only her hands visible. I'd never seen the woman smile, and she was definitely not smiling now as she looked over her shoulder at Hawk. And how would you know? Derision dripped from her tone like acid. My family originates from the farmlands, not too far from Pompeii. 
Before the area was destroyed and became the wastelands we know today, he explained. My family and others from that area have always pronounced the mountain range as the maiden first said. He paused. The language and accent of those from the far west can be difficult for some to master. The maiden, however, appears not to fall into that group. I was confident that my eyes were about to pop out of my face in response to the obvious insult. I bit down on my lip to stop myself from grinning. Priestess Analia's already stiff shoulders jerked back as she stared at Hawk. I could practically see the steam coming out of her ears. I did not realize I had asked for your thoughts. She spoke, tone as withering as her stare. My apologies. He bowed his head in submission, but it was the poorest attempt at it, because his amber eyes all but danced with amusement. She nodded. Apology? I just didn't want the maiden to sound uneducated if any discussion were to arise around the Skotos Mountains. He tacked on. Oh, my gods. But I will remain quiet from here on out, Hawk said. Please, continue, maiden. You have such a lovely reading voice that even I find myself enthralled with the history of Solus. I wanted to laugh. It was building in my throat threatening to burst free, but I couldn't let it. My grip loosened on the edges of the book, which sat at the foot of the Skotos Mountains. The gods had finally chosen a side. When the princess said nothing, I continued. Nyctos, the king of the gods, and his son Theon, the god of war, appeared before Jalara and his army. Having grown distrustful of the Atlantean people and their unnatural thirst for blood and power, they sought to aid in ending the cruelty and oppression that had reaped these lands under the rule of Atlantia. I took a breath. Jalara Solus and his army were brave, but Nyctos in his wisdom saw that they could not defeat the Atlanteans, who had risen to godlike strength through the bloodletting of innocence. They killed hundreds of thousands over the time of their reign. Bloodletting is a gentle description of what they actually did. They bit people, Princess Analia elaborated. And when I looked up at her, there was a strange gleam to her dark brown eyes. Drank their blood and became drunk with power, with strength and near immortality and those they didn't kill became the pestilence we now know as the craven. That is who our beloved king and queen bravely took a stance against and were prepared to die to overthrow. I nodded. Her fingers were turning pink from how tightly she'd balled her hands where they rested in her lap. Continue. I didn't dare look at Hawk. Unwilling to see the failure of Jalara of Vodina Isles, Nyctos gave the gods first blessing, sharing with Jalara and his army the blood of the gods. I shuddered. That was also another gentle term for drinking the blood of the gods. Emboldened with the strength and power, Jalara of Vodina Isles and his army were able to defeat the Atlanteans during the Battle of Broken Bones therefore ending the reign of the corrupt and wretched kingdom. I started to turn the page, knowing the next chapter dealt with the ascension of the queen and the building of the first rise. Why? the priestess demanded. Confused, I looked over at her. Why what? Why did you just shudder when you read the part about the blessing? I hadn't realized my action had been so noticeable. I, I didn't know what to say that wouldn't irritate the priestess and end with her running back to the duke. You seemed disturbed, she pointed out, her tone softening. I knew better than to trust that. What is it about the blessing that would affect you so? 
I'm not disturbed. The blessing is an honor. But you shuddered, she persisted. Unless you find the act of the blessing pleasurable, am I not to assume that it disturbs you? Pleasurable? My face flamed red hot, and I was grateful for the veil. It's just that the blessing seems to be similar to how the Atlanteans became so powerful. They drank the blood of the innocent, and the ascended drink the blood of the gods. How dare you compare the ascension to what the Atlanteans have done? The priestess moved quickly, leaning forward and gripping my chin between her fingers. It is not the same thing. Perhaps you've grown fond of the cane, and you purposely strive to disappoint not only me, but also the duke. The moment her skin touched mine, I locked down my senses. I didn't want to know if she felt pain or anything else. I didn't say that it was, I said, seeing Hawk step forward. I swallowed, just that it reminded me of the fact that you think of those two things in the same thought greatly concerns me, Maiden. The Atlanteans took what was not given. During the ascension, the blood is offered freely by the gods. Her grip tightened, bordering on painful, and my gift stretched against my skin, almost as if it wanted to be used. That is not something that I should have to explain to the future of the kingdom, to the legacy of the ascended. For as long as I could remember, everyone said that, even Victor, and it grated on my nerves and sat like a boulder on my shoulders. The future of the entire kingdom rests on me being given to the gods upon my 19th birthday? Her already thin lips became almost non-existent. What would happen if I didn't ascend? I demanded, thinking of the first maiden. It hadn't sounded like she'd ascended, and everyone was still here. How would that stop the others from ascending? Would the gods refuse to give their blood so freely? I sucked in a sharp gasp as the priestess cocked her hand back. It wouldn't be the first time she had smacked me, but this time the stinging blow didn't land. Hawk had moved so fast that I hadn't seen him leave the corner, but now he had the priestess's wrist in his grasp. Remove your fingers from the maiden's chin, now. Priestess Analia's eyes had grown wide as she stared up at Hawk. How dare you touch me? How dare you lay a single finger on the maiden? His jaw flexed as he glared down at the woman. Perhaps I was not clear enough for you. Remove your hand from the maiden, or I will act upon your attempt to harm her. And I can assure you, me touching you will be the least of your concerns. I might have stopped breathing as I watched them. No one had ever intervened during one of the priestess's tirades. Tawny couldn't. If she did, she would face worse. And I'd never expect nor want that. Rylan had often turned in the other direction, as did Hannes. Even Victor had never been so bold. He'd usually find a way to interrupt, to stop the situation from escalating but I'd been slapped on more than one occasion in front of him, and there was nothing he could do. But Hawk now stood between us, clearly prepared to follow through on his threat. And while I knew I would most likely pay for this later, as would he, I wanted to jump up and hug him. Not because he had protected me. I'd been slapped harder by stray branches while walking through Wisher's Grove. There was a far pettier reason. Seeing the priestess's usual smugness vanish under the weight of shock and witnessing the way her mouth hung open and how her cheeks mottled with red was almost as satisfying as throwing the book in her face. Vibrating with rage, she let go of my chin, and I leaned back. Hawk released her wrist, but he remained there. Her chest rose and fell under the gown as she placed both hands 
flat on her legs. She turned her head to me. The mere fact that you would even speak such a thing shows that you have no respect for the honor bestowed upon you. But when you go to the gods, you'll be treated with as much respect as you have shown today. What does that mean? I asked. This session is over, she answered instead, rising from her seat. I have too much to do with the right only two days away. I have no time to spend with someone as unworthy as you. I saw Hawk's eyes narrow, and I stood, placing the book on the stool as I spoke before Hawk could. I'm ready to return to my chambers, I said to him, and then nodded at the priestess. Good day. She didn't respond, and I started for the door, relieved when Hawk fell into step behind me. I waited until we were halfway across the banquet hall before speaking. You shouldn't have done that, I told him. I should have allowed her to hit you? In what world would that have been acceptable? In a world where you end up punished for something that wouldn't even have hurt. I don't care if she hits like a baby mouse. This world is fucked up if anyone finds that acceptable. Eyes widening, I stopped and looked at him. His eyes were like shards of amber, his jaw just as hard. Is it worth losing your position over and being ostracized for? He glared down at me. If you even have to ask that question, then you don't know me at all. I hardly know you at all, I whispered, irritated by the sting his words left behind. Well. Now you know that I will never stand by and watch someone hit you or any person for no reason other than they feel they can. He shot back. I started to tell him that he was being ridiculous and was missing the point. But he wasn't being ridiculous. This world we lived in was messed up, and the gods knew that it wasn't the first time I'd thought that. But it had never hit me with such clarity before. Silent. I turned from him and started walking. He was right beside me. Several moments passed. It's not like I'm okay with how she treats me. It took everything in me not to throw the book at her. I wish you had. I almost laughed. If I had, she would have reported me. She'll probably report you. To the Duke? Let her. He shrugged. I can't imagine that he's okay with her striking the maiden. I snorted. You don't know the Duke. What do you mean? He would probably applaud her, I said. They share a lack of control when it comes to their tempers. He's hit you, Hawk stated. Is that what she meant when she said that you'd grown fond of the cane? He grabbed my arm, turning me to face him. Has he used a cane on you? The disbelief and anger filling those golden eyes sent a wave of nausea through me. Oh, gods. Realizing what I'd basically just admitted, I felt the blood drain from my face and then rapidly flood back in. I pulled my arm and he let go. I didn't say that. He was staring straight ahead, his jaw flexing. What were you saying? Just, just that the Duke is more likely to punish you than he is the priestess. I have no idea what she meant by the cane, I continued in a rush. She sometimes says things that make no sense. Hawk glanced down at me, his lashes lowered. I must have misread what you said then. I nodded, relieved. Yes. I just don't want you to get into trouble. And what about you? I'll be fine, I was quick to say, as I started walking again, aware of the darting glances passing servants sent our way. The Duke will just give me a lecture and make it a lesson. But you would face, I'll face nothing, he said. And I wasn't so sure about that. Is she always like that? I sighed. Yes. 
The priestess seems like a... He paused, and I glanced over at him. His lips were pursed. A bitch. I don't say that often, but I say it now, proudly. Nearly choking on my laugh, I looked away. She, she is something, and she's always disappointed in my commitment to being the maiden. Exactly how are you supposed to prove you are, he asked. Better yet, what are you supposed to be committed to? I almost jumped on him in that moment and wrapped my arms around him. I didn't because it would be grossly inappropriate. Instead, I gave him a sedate nod. I'm not quite sure. It's not like I'm trying to run away or escape my ascension. Would you? Funny question, I muttered, my heart still thumping from what I'd almost exposed. It was a serious one. My heart lurched in my chest as I stopped in the narrow, short hall and approached one of the windows that faced the courtyard. I stared up at Hawk, and everything about him said that it was, in fact, a genuine inquiry. I can't believe you'd ask that. Why? He came to stand behind me. Because I couldn't do that, I told him. I wouldn't. It seems to me that this honor that has been bestowed upon you comes with very few benefits. You're not allowed to show your face or travel anywhere outside the castle grounds. You didn't even seem all that surprised when the priestess moved to strike you. That leads me to believe it's something fairly common, he said, his brows dark slashes above his eyes. You are not allowed to speak to most, and you are not to be spoken to. You are caged in your room most of the day, your freedom restricted. All the rights others have are privileges for you, rewards that seem impossible for you to earn. I opened my mouth, but I didn't know what to say. He'd pointed out all that I didn't have and made it so painfully clear. I looked away. So, I wouldn't be surprised if you did try to escape this honor, he finished. Would you stop me if I did? I asked. Would Victor? I frowned, not even sure I wanted to know why he'd asked that. But I answered honestly anyway. I know Victor cares about me. He's like, he's like I imagine my father would have been if he were still alive. And I'm like Victor's daughter, who never got to take a breath. But he would stop me. Hawk said nothing. So would you? I repeated. I think I would be too curious to find out exactly how you planned to escape, to stop you. I coughed out a short laugh. You know, I actually believe that. Will she report you to the Duke? He asked after a moment. Pressure settled on my chest as I looked at him. He was staring out the window. Why would you ask? Will she? He asked instead. Probably not, I said, lying all too easily. The priestess probably went straight to the duke. She's probably so busy with the right. Everyone is. As the duke would be. So I might get lucky and at least have a delay between now and when I would inevitably be summoned. Hopefully that meant that Hawk would also get lucky. If he were removed from his post, it was unlikely that I would ever see him again. The sadness that thought brought forth meant it was far past time to change the subject. I've never been to a right. And you've never snuck into one? I dipped my chin. I'm offended that you would even suggest such a thing. He chuckled. How bizarre that I could think that you, who has a history of misbehaving, would do such a thing. I grinned at that. You haven't missed much, to be honest. There's a lot of talking, a bunch of tears, and too much drinking. His gaze slid to mine. It's after the right when things can get interesting. You know how it is. I don't know, 
I reminded him, even though I had an idea of what he spoke of. Tawny had told me that once the ritual of the rite was completed, and the mistresses and stewards took the new ladies and lords in wait, and the priests left with the third daughters and sons, the celebration changed. It became more frantic and raw. Or at least that was what I'd interpreted from Tawny. But it seemed too bizarre to imagine the ascended being involved in anything like that. They were always so cold. But you know how easy it is to be yourself when you wear a mask. His voice was low as his gaze held mine. How anything you want becomes achievable when you can pretend that no one knows who you are. Warmth infused my cheeks. Yes, I did know that. And how kind of him to remind me. You shouldn't bring that up. His head tilted. No one is close enough to overhear. That doesn't matter. You, we shouldn't talk about that. Ever? I started to say yes, but something stopped me. I pulled my gaze from his. Outside the window, the violet-hued butterfly bushes stirred softly in the breeze. Hawk was quiet for several moments before asking. Would you like to go back to your room? He asked. I shook my head. Not particularly. Would you like to go out there instead? You think it would be safe? Between you and me? I would think so. The corners of my lips lifted. I liked that he'd included me, acknowledging that I could hold my own. I used to love the courtyard. It was the one place where, I don't know, my mind was quiet and I could just be. I didn't think or worry about anything. I found it so very peaceful. But not anymore. No, I whispered. Not anymore. It's strange how no one speaks of Rylan or Melissa. It's almost as if they never existed. Sometimes remembering those who died means facing your own mortality, he said. Do you think the Ascended are uncomfortable with the idea of death? Even them? He answered. They may be godlike, but they can be killed. They can die. Neither of us spoke for several minutes, as servants and others passed behind us. Several ladies in wait had stopped and pretended to take in the view of the garden while talking about the right. But I knew they were lingering near where we stood, not because of the stunning flowers and lush greenery, or because it was so rare for me to be seen, but because of the beautiful man who stood beside me. He seemed unaware of them, and even though I kept my gaze forward, I could feel his stare every couple of moments. Eventually, one of the mistresses came along, shooing the ladies away, and we were left alone once more. Are you excited about attending the rite? I'm curious, I admitted. The rite was only two days away. I'm curious to see you. My lips parted on a soft inhale. I didn't dare look at him. If I did, I feared I'd do something incredibly stupid. Something that the first maiden could have done that had made the duchess feel that she was unworthy. You'll be unveiled. Yes. I also wouldn't be expected to wear the color white. It would almost be like going to the red pearl, because I would be able to blend in, and no one would know who I was, what I was. But I will be masked. I prefer that version of you, he said. The masked version of myself? I asked, guessing that he was thinking of our time at the Red Pearl. Honest? His voice sounded closer, and when I took another deep breath, the scent of leather and pine surrounded me. I prefer the version of you that wears no mask or veil. I opened my mouth, but... As was becoming commonplace where Hawk was concerned, 
I didn't know what to say. It felt like I should discourage such statements. But those words wouldn't come to the surface either, just as they hadn't before. So I did the only thing I could think of. I changed the subject. I remember you said your father was a farmer. I cleared my throat. Do you have any other siblings? Any lords in wait in the family? A sister or... I rambled on. There's only Ian for me. I mean, I have only one brother. I'm excited to see him again. I miss him. Hawk was quiet for so long that I had to look to make sure he was still there. And still breathing. He was. He stared down at me, his amber eyes cool. I had a brother. Had? My senses stretched out, and I didn't even have a chance to control them. I opened myself up, and I locked my legs to stop myself from taking a step back. I didn't feel anything strange, but I felt Hawk's anguish. The bitterly cold pain that pelted my skin. It was sharper. This was where his pain stemmed from. He'd lost a brother. I reacted, without thought to what he would think, or to the fact that we were not alone. It was an uncontrollable urge, as if the gift itself had a hold of me. I touched just his hand with mine, and squeezed it, in hopes that it would be construed as a gesture of sympathy. I'm sorry, I said. And I thought of warm beaches and salty air. Those thoughts quickly changed to how I'd felt when Hawk had kissed me. The taut lines of Hawk's expression smoothed out as he stared out the window. He blinked, not once, but twice. Lifting my fingers from his, I clasped my hands together, hoping that he hadn't realized that I'd done something. He stood there, though, as if he'd been struck immobile. I lifted my brows. Are you okay? He blinked again. This time, he laughed softly. Yes, it's... I just had the strangest feeling. Is that so? I watched him closely. Hawk nodded as he rubbed the palm of his hand over his chest. I don't even know how to explain it. Now I was starting to worry that I'd somehow done something other than relieve his pain. What, I wasn't sure, but if my gifts were evolving, anything was possible. I reached out with my senses once more, and all I felt in return was warmth. Is it a bad feeling? Should we find a healer? No, not at all. Hawk's laugh was stronger then, less uncertain. His eyes, now a warm honey, met mine. My brother is not dead, by the way, so no need for sympathy. Now it was my turn to blink repeatedly. Oh, I just thought, I trailed off. Are you sure you wouldn't like to visit the garden? Thinking it was far past time for me to lock myself away before I did yet another reckless thing, I shook my head. I think I would like to go back to my room now. He hesitated for a moment, but then nodded. Neither of us spoke as we made our way. Apparently, Hawk was trying to figure out why he felt happier, lighter. And I was left wondering what exactly had happened to his brother to cause that kind of reaction, especially if his brother was still alive. Chapter 21 It took less than 24 hours for me to yet again do something utterly reckless. This time, however, I may end up regretting it. Of all the ways I'd thought I might die, it had never occurred to me that it could happen while borrowing a book from the Athenaeum. There were far more dangerous things I'd done in my 18 years of life, Times where I would have been more likely to die in the process. Utter heaps of examples where even I had been a bit surprised that I'd walked away with my limbs and life intact. But here I was, 
one wrong step away from plummeting to my death, clutching the supposed diary of one Miss Willa Collins, the book that Lauren and Daphina had been talking about. Obviously, the book would most definitely be the type of reading material Priestess Analia would expressly forbid. And if I were caught with it in my possession, it would be yet another reason for her to believe that I wasn't respectful of my duty as the maiden. So, of course, I had to read it. I'd been so very bored all day. I'd already read every book Tawny had snuck me at least three times. And I couldn't bring myself to read another too familiar page, even one more time. She had yet again been commandeered by the Duchess and the Mistress. And I knew I might not even see her the following morning. So I had another day of staring, uninterrupted except for my training with Victor, at four stone walls. And the longer I stayed in my room with nothing to occupy my mind, the more I thought about what Hawk had said about all the rights that had been stripped away from me. It wasn't like I didn't already know that. But it wasn't something that others appeared to even acknowledge. Maybe it was because they were with me constantly, and so everything had become the norm. But to Hawk, who was new, none of this was normal. And that was what led me to travel unaccompanied through Wisher's Grove to the Athenaeum while Hawk stood outside my chamber door, thinking I was inside. Victor was, well, I had no idea where he was. I had a feeling, based on how tired and sad his eyes had looked this morning, that he'd been called upon the night before to take care of one of the cursed, and hadn't invited me. I also had a feeling that he wasn't going to involve me going forward, which irritated me. Of course, I planned to discuss that with him the first chance I got. I wouldn't be cut out when I could help people, and he would just have to deal with it. But right now, I needed to focus on not dying, or worse yet, getting caught. Cold night air whipped around me as I stood plastered against the stone wall, praying to any god that the foot-wide ledge I stood on wouldn't cave under my weight. I doubted when it was built that they had taken into consideration that at some point, an entirely stupid maiden would find herself standing on it. How had this gone so terribly wrong? Sneaking into the Athenaeum hadn't been hard. With my shapeless black cloak, my trusty mask in place, and my face hidden under the hood, I doubted anyone on the streets of Macedonia had been able to tell if I was male or female, let alone the maiden as I hurried down the alley toward the back entrance of the library. Moving along the grid of narrow halls and staircases without being seen was easy, too. I knew how to be like a ghost when needed, quiet and still. The problem started when I found the leather-bound journal of Miss Collins. Instead of leaving and going back to the castle like I knew I should, I'd ducked inside an empty room. I just... I had been going stir-crazy in that room, and I dreaded going back. And the thickly cushioned settees called to me. The stocked liquor cabinet, something I found odd to discover in a library, confused me, however. But I'd sat by the large windows overlooking the city below and cracked open the worn book. My cheeks had been scalded by the end of the first page, having discovered what occurs when someone kisses one, not on the mouth or on the breast, like, like Hawk had done before he knew who I was, but someplace far more intimate. I couldn't stop reading, practically devouring the cream-hued pages. Miss Willa Collins lived a very interesting life with many, many other fascinating people. I had gotten to the part where she spoke of her brief fling with the king, which I could not even begin to picture, nor did I want to, when I heard voices outside the room, one in particular I'd never thought to hear in the Athenaeum, the Duke's. Hearing his voice meant that I'd been so caught up in the diary, I hadn't even realized the sun had set. I hadn't been summoned to meet with him the night before or today, 
With the preparations for the rite, I'd been given a temporary reprieve. And I also assumed Hawk had as well, since he was still my guard. But the reprieve would come to a swift end if the Duke discovered me. Which was why I was now perched on a ledge, outside what turned out to be the Duke's personal room in the Athenaeum. The only grace I'd been given was that the window I'd climbed out of wasn't the one facing the street, but rather one blocked by Wisher's Grove. Only the hawks could see me, or witness my fall. The sound of ice clinking against ice caused me to swallow a groan. He'd already been in the room for at least 30 minutes, and I was betting that he was on his second glass of whiskey. I had no idea what he was doing. With the right kicking off in just hours, I imagined he was busy meeting with the new ladies and lords in wait, and the parents who would be giving their third sons and daughters to the temples. But no, he was here, drinking whiskey by him. A knock on the door sounded. I closed my eyes, lightly banging the back of my head against the wall. Company? He was going to have visitors? Maybe the gods had been watching me this whole time, and this was yet another punishment. Come in, he called out, and I heard the door clicking shut a few moments later. You're late. Oh, dear. I recognized that cold, flat tone. The duke was not pleased. My apologies, your grace. I came as soon as I could, came the response. It was a male voice, one I didn't immediately recognize, which meant it could be any number of people. Ascended lords, stewards, merchants, guards. Not soon enough, the duke replied. And I cringed for whoever was surely on the receiving end of a very disapproving stare. I hope you have something for me. If so, that would go a long way to restoring my faith in you. I do, your grace. It took a while. As you know, the man was not talkative. No, they never are once you get them out of the public eye, where they can't cause a spectacle with their words, the Duke commented. I'm guessing you had to be extremely convincing to get him to talk. Yes. There was a rough laugh, and then, he's not an Atlantean. That has been confirmed. Shame, the Duke said. And I frowned. Why would that be bad news? I've learned his name. Lev Baron, the first son of Alexander and Maggie Baron. He had two brothers. The second died of an illness before his right. And the third was given to the temples three years ago. He was not a known person of interest. And his behavior at the assembly wasn't expected. They were talking about the dissenter the one who'd thrown the craven hand while the Duke and Duchess had spoken to the people after the attack. You've investigated his family? The Duke asked. Yes, the father is deceased. The mother lives alone in the lower ward. She was useful in getting him to talk. The Duke chuckled, and the sound turned my stomach. What else have you learned? I don't believe he was very connected within the community of dissenters. He claims that he has never met the Dark One, nor believes him to be within the city. A wealth of relief rose and spread through me, even as the wind lifted the edges of my cloak. And you believed him? The Duke asked. I gave him good reason not to lie. The man, who I assumed was one of the guards, answered. I thought about the man's mother. Had she been one of the reasons for him opening up? If so, the knowledge sat heavy in the pit of my stomach. Dissenters needed to be dealt with harshly. But I wasn't sure how I felt about family members being used to coerce information. And did he tell you anything about the claim he made? About the third sons and daughters? All he would say was that he knew the truth, that they weren't servicing the gods, and that everyone would soon learn that. He didn't say what he believed to be the truth. I turned my head toward the window, all but holding my breath. I would love to know what he thought was happening. 
No, your grace. The only additional information I could glean from him was how he came to be in possession of a craven's hand, he said. And that was, well, a good thing to know. Apparently, he took it off the body of one of the guards who had become infected and returned to the city. He helped the family put the guard down after he'd changed. Death with dignity, the duke scoffed, and my eyes widened. He, he knew about that? About us? These bleeding hearts will be the death of the entire city one of these days. That statement was a wee bit excessive, but I hadn't considered that there may be dissenters in the network. Did he happen to tell you who was involved with putting down the newly turned craven? He asked. No, he would not. That is also a shame. I would love to know who didn't contact us and why. The Duke sighed, as if that were the worst possible thing to remain unanswered. Do you have anything else to report? No, Your Grace. There wasn't an immediate response, but then the Duke said, Does the dissenter still breathe? For now. Good. It sounded like he'd stood, and I hoped that meant he was leaving. Please, gods, let that mean he's leaving. I think I will visit him myself. My brows lifted. Now that surprised me. As you wish. There was a beat of silence. Will there be a trial that we need to prepare for? I almost laughed. Dissenters weren't given an actual trial. They were put on public display while their charges were leveled against them. Execution quickly followed. There will be no need after my visit with him, the Duke said, and my mouth dropped open. The meaning was clear. If there was no trial, that meant there'd be no public execution, and the only reason that would occur would be if the dissenter was already dead. That had happened before while they'd been imprisoned. Normally, it was believed to have been by their own hands or by an overzealous guard. But could it be that the Duke was meeting out justice himself? The same ascended who I doubted had gotten a speck of blood on his hands since the War of Two Kings? I shouldn't be surprised by that. He had a cruel streak and viciousness within him a mile wide. But he always kept that well hidden under a mask of civility. I also shouldn't be bothered by the idea of the dissenter being killed without the farce of a trial. They supported the Dark One. And even if some of them hadn't engaged in the riots and bloodshed, their words alone had sown the seeds that had caused blood to spill on more than one occasion. But I, I was bothered by the idea of anyone being killed in a dark, dank cell at the hands of an ascended who was barely better than an Atlantean. Finally, the door opened and closed, and there was nothing but silence. I waited, straining to hear any sound. I heard nothing, wondering why the Duke had decided to have this meeting here, and surprised by how aware of the network he was. I inched along the ledge toward the window. Clutching the journal to my chest with numb fingers, I neared the window. There was a clicking sound from inside the room. I froze. Was that the door closing? Or was it locking? Oh, my gods. If it had been locked, I would have to burst through it. Wait, the door could only be locked from the inside. Had someone else come into the room? Was it the Duke? There was no way he knew that I was out here, unless he could suddenly see through walls. Who else? You still out there, princess? My lips parted as my eyes widened at the sound of his voice. Hawk, it was Hawk, in that room. I couldn't believe it. Or have you fallen to your death, he continued. I briefly debated the merits of jumping. I really hope that's not the case, since I'm pretty positive that would reflect poorly on me, 
since I assumed you were in your room. A pause. Behaving. And not on a ledge, several dozen feet in the air, for reasons I can't even begin to fathom, but I'm dying to learn. Damn it, I whispered, looking around, as if I could find another escape route, which was stupid. Unless I suddenly sprouted wings, the only exit point was through the window. A heartbeat later, Hawk stuck his head out and looked up at me. The soft glow of the lamp glanced off his cheekbones as he raised a brow. Hi, I squeaked. He stared at me a moment. Get inside. I didn't move. With a sigh so heavy it should have rattled the walls, he extended his hand toward me. Now. You could say please, I muttered. His eyes narrowed. There are a whole lot of things I could say to you that you should be grateful I'm keeping to myself. Whatever, I grumbled. Move back. He waited, but when I didn't take his hand, he disappeared back into the room, grousing under his breath. If you fool, you're going to be in so much trouble. If I fall, I'll be dead. So I'm not quite sure how I'd also be in trouble. Poppy. He snapped, and I couldn't help it. I grinned. Had that been the first time he'd called me that? I thought so, as I carefully inched across the ledge. Gripping the upper windowsill, I ducked down. Hawk was standing by the settee, but the moment he spotted me, he moved incredibly fast. Startled, I jerked back, but I didn't fall. He had an arm around my waist. A second later, I was inside the room my feet on solid ground, and the journal stuck between his chest and mine. There was still a lot of full body contact. My stomach and legs were pressed against his, and when I drew in a breath, I could practically taste his dark spice and pine scent on my tongue. Before I could say a word, he reached up and fisted the back of my hood. Don't, I started. Too late. He yanked it down. A mosque. This brings back old memories. His gaze roamed, flickering over the strands of hair that had escaped my braid and now fell against my cheeks. I flushed as I tried to pull away. He didn't let go. I understand you're probably upset. Probably, he laughed. All right, you're definitely upset, I amended. But I can explain. I sure hope so because I have so many questions, he said, golden eyes glimmering as he stared into mine. Starting with, how did you get out of your room? And ending with, why in the gods were you on the ledge? The last thing I wanted to tell him about was the old servant's entrance. I tried to put space between us. Y you can let me go. I can but I don't know if I should. You might do something even more reckless than climbing out onto a ledge that can't be more than a foot wide. My eyes narrowed. I didn't fall. As if that somehow makes this whole situation better. I didn't say that. I'm just pointing out that I had the situation completely under control. Hawk blinked, and then he laughed. He guffawed deeply and the sound rumbled through me, eliciting a sharp wave of hot, tight shivers. Thankfully, he seemed unaware of the reaction. You had the situation under control. I'd hate to see what happens when you don't. I said nothing to that because I doubted whatever I would or could say would do me any favors, and neither did our proximity. Like on the rise, the way he held me against him reminded me of our time at the Red Pearl, and that was something I didn't need help remembering. It was hard to think clearly when he held me this close. I wiggled, trying to slip free, but it resulted in our lower bodies being more in contact. Hawk's arm tightened around me, and his hold felt like it had changed. 
as if he were no longer keeping me in place, but, but holding me, embracing me. My stomach dipped as I slowly lifted my gaze to his. He stared down at me, the lines around his mouth taut as the silence stretched between us. I knew I should demand that he let me go. Better yet, I should make him. I knew how to escape a hold, but I, I didn't move. Not even when he lifted his other hand and placed his fingers just below the mask. Standing here, allowing this, was possibly the sweetest torture I'd ever put myself through. He hesitated, and I wondered if he was waiting to see what I'd do, what I would say. When I still did nothing, his eyes shifted to a fierce burning amber. His fingers drifted from the mask and slowly traced the curve of my cheekbone. My skin hummed as his stare followed the path that his fingertips took. He glided them down my face and over my parted lips. I sucked in a sharp breath, my chest suddenly feeling too tight. His chin dipped and my breath caught as he lowered his head. Every muscle in my body seemed to tense with a heady mix of panic and anticipation. There was intent in the way his lashes lowered and how he leaned in. He was going to kiss me. My heartbeat danced as his lips glided across my cheek, leaving a trail of fire in their wake. I knew what I should do, but I didn't. Maybe Hawk had been right when he'd said how I could have anything I wanted when, with a mask, I could pretend that no one knew who I was. He had to be, because my eyes closed and I didn't move. Hawk had been my first kiss. But if he kissed me now, like this, this would be our real first kiss. He knew who I was now. He'd seen me unveiled. He knew. And I wanted this. Wanted him.